Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will call on the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures Number 2, Bill 2020, consideration and committee oh, of the whole of a message. statement relating to the current arrangements on the temporary order relating to general business notices of motion. Um, I'm going to say, Senator Lambie, I didn't see you then. I was. I, I had already called the clerk on. I'm going to ask him to continue, and then I'll, I'll ask you to seek leave. Then, it, I did, if, I, if you did it earlier, I didn't see you. My apologies. I was following the script. Yeah. So we will need to deal with the item we've commenced in committee first before you can seek leave. So I will call the clerk to continue and the deputy president to take government the business order of the day number one treasury laws amendment 2020 measures number two bill 2020 consideration in committee of the whole of message number 228 from the house of representatives senator corman uh, thank oh, you beg your pardon senator corman i've got a script sorry the committee is considering message number 228 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures Number 2 Bill. Um, and Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. I move that the committee uh, does not further insist on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. Senator Patrick. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, this is, of course, the amendment related to the large, grandfathered large proprietary companies uh, that uh, don't have to make reports to uh, ASIC, annual reports to ASIC. So the amendment that uh, I'm asking the Senate to insist upon seeks to eliminate a per per perverse provision in the Corps Act which exempts 1,119 large proprietary companies from having to lodge uh, financial tax returns to ASIC. Now, there's two reasons why this uh, archaic provision needs to be eliminated from the statutes. The first is that it creates an elite status uh, for particular companies that is inconsistent with Australian values. We must eliminate a privilege uh, that is not uh, to, to very large and wealthy people that is not afforded to regular Australians. That's inappropriate. The second thing uh, that uh, this amendment seeks to do in eliminating this provision is that it, uh, the provision itself provides or encourages aggressive, provides for or encourages aggressive tax minimisation through a lack of transparency. It's a loophole that has been in existence since 1995. It was supposed to be a temporary measure. Now, if I, uh, when I talk about aggressive tax behaviour. That's not something that I've dreamt up. That was something that ASIC put to an economics committee uh, back in 15-16. Uh, um, I'll just read, uh, uh, read. The Senate Economics Reference Committee conducted an inquiry into multinational tax avoidance across both the 44th and 45th parliament. Uh, one of the submissions received, number 32, was from ASIC, who raised the concerns about these exempted companies. That led the Senate Economics Committee to ultimately recommend, and I quote, 
that the government requires all companies, trusts and other financial entities with income above a certain amount to lodge general purpose financial statements with the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. And what my amendment does is seek to implement that particular recommendation. Uh, it, uh, in practical terms, uh, my amendment removes that special status for these exempt companies. Again, we have 1,119 companies that, uh, that uh, don't have to lodge uh, these uh, returns, and they're owned by companies that are familiar uh, by people who are familiar names to the Liberal Party. People like uh, uh, like Kerry Stokes, for example, Anthony Pratt, and so forth. Uh, Lindsay Fox. Companies owned by wealthy people. I don't mind people having wealth. That's fine. That's good, good on them if they can get ahead in this world. Uh, that's what we like to see. But they shouldn't have a privileged status where they are exempt from doing what every other company in Australia does uh, uh, that hits the, uh, the, the, the threshold of, and that is uh, lodging financial returns. So uh, that's what I'm seeking to do. Uh, now I note that this, uh, this amendment has done a bit of ping pong, uh, as described in one of the Senate briefings. Uh, between the House and the, and the Senate on a number of occasions, and look, it's my understanding that uh, Senator Hanson this time around will not support the insistence, and for that reason, uh, I won't call a division, but will record my uh, uh, my, my, my insisting upon the amendment. I'd ask that that be recorded. Uh, but I'll also just let the coalition know. Michael West, who does a lot of journalism around tax avoidance and uh, around uh, companies, is running a very extensive investigation into this. So you've got a little bit of time before all of the warts come out into the open as to who you are trying to protect, who you are trying to, to uh, allow this pri privilege to continue to. So yeah, I would ask the government. Uh, I would ask the government on the voices to indicate uh, that, uh, uh, or that that perhaps they've changed their mind after listening to me. Uh, I do have a couple of questions for the minister. If uh, the first of those is, uh, uh, and this relates to uh, conversations my, uh, back back uh, when this amendment was dealt with last time around. Uh, basically. The government hasn't yet responded to the 2015 Senate report, and so my, uh, that, that w into multi, uh, multinational tax avoidance. So I would ask the uh, the minister, uh, and I'll just identify the report. The corporate tax avoidance part three, much heat, little like so far report, has not been responded to. Can the government please advise when it will be responding to that report of uh, two parliaments ago? Uh, Minister. Thank you. Oh, well, I, the, um, Senator Patrick asked a question, so I've responded. The Minister's Sorry. responded to that. Sorry, question. I'll just. Um, I, I was listening to most of it, and just the last 20 seconds or so, I didn't quite catch. So I'll just get Senator Patrick to just repeat it. If you could. Sure, Senator Patrick. No problems, Minister. Just there, there was a report by the second, the Senate Economics Committee, into multinational tax avoidance. So there was a committee inquiry. The government has still not responded to that 2015-16 report. I'm asking uh, when the government intends to respond to that report. Minister Seselja. Thank you. Um, and we dealt with this in part last time. But Senator Patrick, uh, in the, this government uh, has taken and implemented some of the strongest uh, multinational tax avoidance measures uh, in the world. Uh, and we stand by our record in relation to multinational tax avoidance. But when it comes to the specifics of when that will be responded to, I'll take that on notice. Thank you, Senator Patrick. And just uh, again for the for the uh, chamber, I know that uh, Senator Wish Wilson asked this question last time. The minister was unable to respond, but I'll give an opportunity again to do so. What is the policy basis for permitting 1,119 large proprietary companies? From for not having to lodge uh, uh, their financial reports to ASIC. What's the policy basis? Minister. 
Minister Cecilia. Thank you, so, um, Senator Patrick. We've got nothing. To, I've got nothing to add in relation to uh, the last time uh, we debated this. Uh, we've put forward in relation to our record on multinational tax avoidance. I uh, put forward the government's position uh, in relation to considering uh, other matters. Uh, but we don't believe that these, this legislation should be uh, should be uh, held up uh, as a result of this particular point that you are trying to make. Uh, we've made our views known and, and, in fact, we stand by our record on multinational tax avoidance. Uh, but in terms of uh, those, those other questions, in terms of further responses uh, as to what will be coming from government, uh, we've put that on record and I've got nothing to add in terms of uh, from the last time we debated this in the Senate. Senator Patrick. To be clear, a lot of these companies are not multinationals. They're Australian companies, but they just have a privileged elitist status in that they're not permitted or they're not required to do what everyone else does, and that is to lodge uh, company uh, returns, financial returns, to ASIC. Again, uh, noting you might have been confused about the multinational uh, aspects of this, what is the policy basis? What is the policy basis for rejecting this amendment? Senator McKim. Um, uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, given uh, it appears as if the minister is just going to sit there and uh, not answer Senator Patrick's question, I I'd draw to your attention that I believe that Senator Wish Wilson would uh, also like to make a contribution. I've this been stage. watching, and uh, thank you. no one on the screen has indicated they want in the call. I think Senator McAllister wants the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I do seek the call. Um, I want to place on record Labor's position. We do believe the Senate should insist on its amendments, and we do support uh, the amendment that is the subject of discussion today. Of course, these companies should observe the same level of transparency as all of the other country, uh, companies. There is, as has been made abundantly clear by the minister responsible for this debate, absolutely no public policy reason for these companies to continue to enjoy an exemption which was established in 1995 and was only ever intended to be temporary. I'm not at all surprised that this is the government's position. This is a government that is allergic to transparency. It's a government that won't respond properly to questions in this chamber. It's a government that won't respond properly to freedom of information requests. It's a government that drags its heels on providing uh, documents when they are ordered to be produced in this chamber. This is a government that is allergic to transparency for them and all their friends. And there is absolutely no reason why ordinary Australians should continue to tolerate the circumstances where a small group of people are exempt from a set of rules that apply to everybody else. There is no public policy reason for it, and it is incredible to me that the government continues to insist on their position when it cannot be justified and they are unwilling to even attempt a justification in this place. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I, I apologise. I was clicking my raise hand icon on the screen, but I, I now realise I had to do it physically as well. Um, I think Senator Sazelja's description of the word debate last time this came before the Senate is a very liberal interpretation of what was discussed in the chamber. Um, there was no debate about the removal of this uh, exemption, this 25-year loophole that has protected some of the richest Australians and biggest private companies from providing any uh, tax transparency data. There is no policy basis for this. I would like to get on record today, Deputy President, that the Greens would have supported a vote had it gone to division. We would have supported Senator Patrick's amendment. I'd also like to place on record that the Senate inquiry, and I'd like to use the words groundbreaking Senate inquiry that was initiated in 2015, was indeed initiated by the Greens. My previous colleague, uh, Christine Milne, uh, initiated that inquiry. I participated in all those inquiries, and we have seen significant legislation before this Senate. That is true. I will give that, uh, acknowledge that, that Senator Seselja added to the contribution earlier. However, it makes it a considerable anomaly that we have actually acted on various aspects of multinational tax avoidance, but not this. This stands out like a sore thumb. 
I think I used a different analogy last time that may have been reported in the media. Uh, but at the end of the day, the government has not provided any explanation to this chamber, this August House of Review, as to why this loophole exists to protect the richest Australians. The only conclusion we can draw from this is that many of these people are indeed donors to the Liberal Party. And there's a reason that there's some kind of cosy arrangement in place as to why this exemption hasn't been removed. So this is something that we have worked on for many years. Indeed, I moved very similar amendments to what we have before the Senate today uh, on, on numerous occasions, including two to three years ago when we had other debates around tax transparency. So I would urge the government and Senator Seselja uh, to remove this exemption. I understand Senator Patrick won't be giving up after today's amendment. We will see future amendments tacked onto a number of Treasury bills. And uh, I would also urge the government to respond to that 2015 Senate inquiry and the very numerous recommendations that it made. Uh, we have made progress, but we've got a hell of a long way to go before we can be confident that we've done everything we possibly can as a chamber and as a parliament to crack down on multinational tax avoidance and improve tax transparency. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. And just before I call you, Senator Lambie, if our senators participating on the screen could just raise their hand so I'm very clear that you're seeking the call. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm just making it clear that Jack and Lambie Network will not be moving off this either until you remove those exemptions uh, for your mates or your political donors. Uh, we're going to go to and from to and from one house to the other, and you're not going to go anywhere. And you might as well give up on this bill because that's where we're at. So stop wasting people's time. It's absolutely shameful where you are right now. Is that you have put your political donors and let them influence you once again over what is best for this country. Now this is enough. So unless you want this to go to and fro, or you want, an, or you want uh, a win on the board, Minister, I would suggest that um, there will be no exemption for your mates or your political donors. It's as simple as that. So until we get to that point, it's not going anywhere. You might as well put it back on the bench so it collects the dust it's been collecting dust in the meantime. Senator Patrick. Yeah, I just very quickly wanted to put on the record uh, that um, Senator McAllister was correct. Uh, oh, sorry, it might have been uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, that uh, I do intend to uh, in, uh, continue uh, moving this amendment on Treasury bills as we move forward. Thank you, Senator Patrick. So um, the question is that the motion, as moved by Minister Cormann, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And I understand, uh, Senator Patrick, you wish to record your um, disagreement. That, uh, that's correct. I think uh, Labor did during its. Uh, Labor did, uh, and, yeah. and I'm assuming the Greens did. Thank you. And, Thank you, and Jack, Minister. Can you want to stand up? Thank you. I move that the resolution be reported. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Just a moment. The committee has considered message number 228 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 measures number 2 bill 2020 and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And Senator Lambie, you were seeking the call before? I was, Madam President. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to make a five minute sta statement relating to current arrangements on the temporary order relating to general business notices of motion. Uh, yes, uh, you've been given two minutes, Senator Lambie. <coughs> well, can I have five minutes? Otherwise, we're just going well, to go um, to the, contingent the notice of motion number two. The agreement is two minutes. I, it's not within my power can to I change that. Are you not continuing or you are continuing? 
No, um, I'd just like to, in accordance with contingent notice of motion number two, then I move that such that so much of the standing orders be suspended as to allow me to make a short statement of five minutes on the temporary order relating to general business notices of motion. Uh, I believe that uh, the, uh, the, if you seek leave again for five minutes, that will be agreed to. Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to make a five-minute statement relating to the current arrangements on the temporary order relating to general businesses, no, business notices of motion. I believe leave is granted, Senator Lambie, for five minutes. Thank you, Deputy Madam President. The government and the Labor Party have gagged the crossbench. They finally got what they want and they've done it by stealth, without any warning and without any consultation. The Liberals have finally steamrolled us and the AAP, ALP have let them do it. It's the decision of the Labor Party to deny me the ability to force the government to cough up documents it doesn't want the public to see. It's the decision of the Labor Party to say that I can't bring forward issues to the Senate that matter to the people who elected me. You guys may not realise this, but not everybody votes Labor. The voters who don't deserve just as much of a look in as anybody else. You know how two weeks ago Teddy Sheen got a Victoria Cross? The review found that he deserved deserved one came about because of the work I did as an independent senator. Then the explanation from the government as to why Teddy didn't deserve one came out because of the work I did as an independent in the Senate. It's a decision of the Labor Party to strip me of the ability to do what I did to keep the attention of the Senate on Teddy Sheen. It's Labor saying that I should not be able to do that anymore, that rather I sat down and shut up. They want the people who support me to wait their turn before I represent them. They want, me to, they want to drip feed me the chance to do my job. I'm just one senator asking the Labor Party if it's okay if I do my job every now and then. This is where we're at in this chamber. I don't really understand it, to be honest. I get why the government doesn't want me being able to compel the production of documents, because that's usually embarrassing enough to them. But why is Labor working with the Liberals to weaken the Senate's ability to actually do oversight? What are you here for? You're stopping me from doing my job as a senator for the people of Tasmania, and that's the situation that we're currently in. And it was the Coalition and the Labor Party who landed us here. It was a half-baked plan from the start. Now that we're two days into trying to live, live within it, it's clear how much of a mess we're already in. I'm already banging my head up against a wall. I only get one opportunity each week to move a formal motion. If I miss my turn, I'll most likely have to wait until the next sitting week to get another go. This week I'll seek, I'll seek formality on a motion to tidy up the Liberal and Labor's dodgy new system. Ironically, I've been hamstring, hamstring by the existing temporary order. First, there was confusion about the word count. I had to strip back, to the, back the text of my motion significantly to get it under 200 words. It took time to do that without changing the meaning of what I wanted to propose. That meant I was a few minutes late getting it in. No worries, right? I can always ask for, ask for leave on the floor to hand it in later. Well, the AOP, ALP yesterday nearly prevented me from getting leave to put it in. Why should they be the gatekeepers who actually gave you that job of whether I get to use my one motion this week? And now I've since found out I actually didn't have to worry about the word limit. The whole thing is just ridiculous. That is where we're at and we're on day two. I understand that we've had problems with some senators abusing formal motions in the past. I want to work with the major parties to find a fair solution to that problem. And that's why, with Senator Patrick, I have proposed, or we have proposed, a sensible, sens a sensible compromise. And still, we are waiting for, for someone to get back to us to tell us whether or not they believe that's a sensible compromise or just tell us the truth and saying, you know what, don't bother. What's been said in cement stays that way. This is the way we're going, you are going to be treated from here on in. And that's not give, letting me be a fair representative as a senator for the state of Tasmania. As a matter of fact, I need to call it bloody unconstitutional. You're telling me what motions I can nearly put in and when I can put them in? Is this where this chamber has got to? We're not a democracy anymore, we're now a dictatorship. Because quite frankly, the people of Tasmania are outraged. I may be only one, but that doesn't mean they're, they're, they should have a set time when their voice should be heard in this parliament. This is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I would encourage you all to come back to the table and work with all of us on the crossbench and have a good look at what we have proposed. 
Because if you are not going to do that, then I can tell you now, we're on day two, we are going to run into problems, and we haven't even got through the trial two weeks. So let's use some common sense here. Let's use some democracy and give us a fair go. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Patrick. Thank you. I, I just rise in support of Senator Lambie uh, and urge the government to, and indeed the opposition, to uh, consider uh, uh, certain aspects of the motion that was passed in the last sitting. It was uh, a motion that was uh, generated uh, by only major parties uh, sitting together in the room. Uh, didn't have the right perspective uh, across the chamber. Uh, so uh, I would encourage, as uh, Senator Lambie has, for there to be some uh, consideration as to, the, as to the changes in the way um, the uh, current uh, motions resolution uh, is, is operating. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement in response to Senator Lambie. Is leave granted? One, one, uh, one minute. minute. Yep. Yes, leave is granted for one minute, Senator McKim. All right. Um, thank you, President. Well, I, I rise um, to observe that uh, the collusion between the government and the opposition uh, is in fact designed to stitch up the crossbench, and the Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics are uh, at it again. Motions provide the capacity for all senators to bring incredibly important issues for their communities into this place to have decisions made by this place and to require parties to put their positions in regards to those issues on the record. I urge the government and the opposition to work collaboratively with the crossbench to find a way through this issue. And, uh, I, uh, I want to say to Senator Lambie we are still taking advice on uh, the effect of the motion that she uh, has on the books at the moment, and we reserve our position on that motion. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, Senator McAllister. I seek leave to make a short statement also. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank uh, you, Senator McAllister. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I thank the chamber. And I note the observations made by Senator Lambie and others on the crossbench about the importance of a continuing discussion about the workability of these provisions. Uh, I understand that these the operation of the, the current temporary order is under review by the Procedure Committee. One thing the Chamber may wish to consider is referring the matters raised by Senator Lambie into that review. There is an, a, a review at the moment uh, to look at how well this works. It seems to me that this is a matter that might sensibly can be considered in that process. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Uh, I think that concludes that. I'll call the clerk. Government business ordered the day number two. Treasury laws amendment, your superannuation, your choice, Bill 2019. Further consideration in committee of the whole. So someone is seeking the call. We're in committee. Otherwise, I'm going to move to put the bill. Hi, Deborah. Okay, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Um, I am moving uh, amendments one and two on sheet 8971 um, by leave uh, together. And as previously discussed, and as people would probably be aware, this is an amendment that would remove the $450 threshold below which uh, so, Sorry, uh, Senator Waters, to... Senator Waters, could I just interrupt momentarily? I'm sorry, we cannot <laughs> hear you uh, very well. Uh, Volume-wise, um, can we increase Senator Waters' volume? Always. I'm not in charge of that. I'm at 100 per cent. So I, I, found uh, I, 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 I wasn't, ask, I wasn't asking you to shout, Senator Waters. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We try that. Try that now. Oh, sorry, Senator McAllister. Uh, point of order, Chair. I'm, I wonder if you just might clarify with Senator Waters whether she is presently speaking to. Uh, the Australian Greens motion on sheet 8981, which no. has previously been moved by no. Senator Wish Wilson. I'm just no, going to answer 8971. I can speak to that if, if people are able to hear me. I'm moving 8971 
Pizza's has been done, 8981 has been done and negative. Okay, we do have some amendments before the chair. That's amendments one to three on sheet 8981, moved by Senator Wish Wilson. So they are currently before the chair. So we do need to deal oh. with those before we move on. Okay, so I'm going to put those amendments. So the question is that the amendments that amendments one to three on sheet eight nine eight one, everyone is aware where we're up to. Uh, moved by Senator Wish Wilson will be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. That with you. Which, which amendment is it? So, so these ones. Stop the bells. 
So the question is that uh, amendment number one to three on sheet 8981 moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 23 ayes and 25 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Minister. I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Are you seeking? Can you leave? I'm tabling a supplementary oh, tabling. memorandum. Yep. Thank you, Minister. And uh, I uh, am seek leaving to move amendments one zero. What was the number? One zero. Thank you. Sorry, forgive me. It's um, the government amendment on sheet UD one th one three. Um, and I'm moving amendments one and two together, please. So uh, you will okay. need leave to move those together. There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Uh, I, am, am I moving the amendments? I'm moving the amendments. Thank you. So the question is that the amendments on uh, amendments one and two on sheets UD one one three be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Waters, did you wish to move the amendments that you started off with? Yes, thank you. And hopefully the audio issues have been resolved. Can I just check that you can hear me okay yes, there we in can. the camera? Thank you, Senator Great. Waters. All right, thank you to the, um, the wizards in the APH box that have fixed that up. Um, so I move uh, Australian Greens amendments one and two on sheet 8971 um, uh, by leave together. There being no objection, leave is granted. Go ahead, Senator Waters. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, um, as I was saying before, the purpose of these amendments is to remove the $450 threshold below which workers don't get paid superannuation. Um, so, people might recall that uh, back in, I think it was uh, 1992, uh, this threshold was inserted 
And essentially, if you're a worker who is earning less than that each month, you don't get paid superannuation by your employer. Now, the reason that um, we have long thought that this was uh, inequitable and needs to be removed, which is what the amendment would do, is that it has a disproportionate effect on a number of workers. Um, and in particular, it has a disproportionate effect on women workers. Uh, now, we already know, sadly, and from many Senate inquiries and, and many studies, that women retire on average with approximately half the superannuation of uh, their male counterparts. And one of the contributing factors to this enormous discrepancy in uh, superannuation balance is this $450 threshold rule. Um, now, there was a purpose to it originally, and it was to align it with what was the then tax-free threshold, but that's since increased, as is appropriate. Um, and we've also got the low-income um, super tax offset or listo um, which also uh, obviates the need for this threshold to continue. So, uh, in short, um, this threshold disproportionately affects women and it disproportionately affects casual workers and it disproportionately affects workers that have multiple jobs because the threshold applies per employer. So, if, for example, you're a young person who in this economy is um, lucky to have a job and if you've got one, perhaps you've got several uh, and you're earning less than $450 a month from each of those employers, none of them have to pay you superannuation. Um, so this is part of the reason why this is an inequitable rule. Um, Senator Waters, we might have to just ask you to pause again. Your, your connection to us is breaking up. I'm not sure if there's anything we can do about that. Minister, you have the call to respond to so much of Senator Waters' uh, points as you wish to. We will try and re-establish that connection in the meantime. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, the government will be opposing this amendment that removes the $450 rule. Uh, Senator Waters is right. The $450 rule has been included in the superannuation system. Uh, when the, the compulsory superannuation began in 1992, and I agree. I think that looking at the $450 threshold rule does merit some consideration. However, now is not the time. When it was first established, um, it was established for two reasons. One, because there was a, fel a, a feeling that uh, those that earned below the tax-free threshold should not necessarily have to participate in this compulsory superannuation. Uh, scheme, and the other was that it was an administrative burden for businesses. Um, those issues have changed, but there are still many issues to consider around moving that threshold. There are implications for small businesses, uh, but without the implementation of a policy to ensure that members are only defaulted once into superannuation products, removing this threshold may in fact result in more uh, duplicate and low balance accounts. The government has agreed uh, to implement the recommendations of the Financial Services Royal Commission and that a person should only have one default superannuation account. Thank you, Minister. Now, I'll just try and go back to Senator Waters, if she can hear us. I can now, Chair. I think um, I'm not sure at what point I cut out. Uh, I don't know what pearls of wisdom to give you all again. Uh, the, the, the minister did respond. I'm not sure if you heard the minister's response. No, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I wasn't able to hear that. I've only just been able to, to dial back in. I, I suspect the minister and I don't agree on this issue, just uh, taking a wild guess. I, I, I suspect you're possibly right, Senator Waters. So, did you wish Could to? Could I just get a stick from the chair as to roughly at what point I cut out? Oh. There were just a couple of facts and figures I was hoping to get on the record. And I, this is not a test. No, I know you look, don't... Honestly, honestly, I couldn't say precisely. It, it faded out uh, gradually. So, I would, okay. I would take the opportunity to get those things you want to get on the record on the record, Senator okay. Waters. Thank you, Chair. I will, I will do that now with your indulgence. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, okay, so as I was saying, having the $450 threshold 
below which employers don't have to contribute to superannuation for their workers, disproportionately. All right. I think we might go to Senator McAllister. Were you seeking the call? I am seeking the call. And I think we will just see if we can get those technical issues ironed out before we go back to Senator Waters. But Senator McAllister, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, Labor, of course, is extremely concerned about the retirement income gender gap. It was. Labor senators who championed the inquiry, which resulted in the report, A Husband is Not a Retirement Plan, that uh, I think proved a very important inquiry conducted by senators uh, from both all parts of this chamber that resulted in a unanimous report with many recommendations to improve uh, retirement outcomes for women. Um, I listened carefully to Senator Hume's response. I note Senator Hume does not intend to support this Greens motion, and Labor does not intend to support it either. Uh, we will consider a wide range of policy options before the next election to tackle the impact, uh, to tackle the challenges faced by women in retirement and to improve their economic security. Uh, but this is not the bill where we will make that decision. We will make that decision as part of our considerations in the lead up to an election. However, I did listen carefully to Senator Hume's response, and I'd make this observation. The government can point to very few things that it has practically done to support women's outcomes in retirement. The government likes to come into this chamber and say that this is a priority, to provide comforting words to women that they, the government is concerned about their economic security in retirement. But it is difficult to identify a single measure in the last seven years that has actually gone to the issues that were canvassed in the report and that are routinely raised by women when you speak to them. The only measure that the government ever points to that in any way goes to these issues uh, is a capacity for people to contribute uh, above, the, um, above the cap in terms of voluntary superannuation contributions. Well, the truth is that most women are not in a position to make contributions above the cap. Most women do not have tens of thousands of dollars lying around, and most women are not, therefore, advantaged by a system that allows large volumes of cash to be popped in as a one-off into a super account. That doesn't help, but it's the only measure that Liberal senators ever point to when these concerns are raised in this place. And I say to the government, it is not good enough. You have been here for a long time. You are in your eighth year of government. Government provides marvellous opportunities to actually make real change in the lives of Australian people. And in this instance, you have the opportunity, have had the opportunity to make real change for the lives of Australian women. And it is immensely disappointing that there has been no progress in the seven years you've been in power. Senator McKim. Uh, well, well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Obviously, um, we're unable to hear um, from Senator Waters at the moment due to um, some unknown technical issues. So, so my suggestion is it is unfortunate that that's the case, but I don't believe that the Senate can um, sit around and wait uh, indefinitely until the technical issue is sorted. So uh, if I need to, I will now um, put um, Senator Waters Amendments, uh, or suggest um, that you that you put Senator Waters' amendments I, I, to the I, chamber. I will, if there are no further contributions. I will. Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Yeah, sorry for the uh, late arrival, uh, Minister. Can you just uh, you, you, you say that uh, the government is considering this? Um, what what's the time frame? What's the time frame in which you are going to come to this chamber with legislation that deals with this uh, with this threshold? Thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister, sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Senator Patrick, for that question. I can't give you a time frame. What I can say is that this issue was specifically um, uh, recognised as part of the terms of reference in the retirement income review, and that review has reported to the Treasurer, and that report is with the Treasurer right now. Senator Patrick. So, uh, just going back to Senator McAllister's point, this has been a long time. Uh, in place, 
uh, it's been talked about for a long time and indeed we've been dealing with this piece of legislation for some period of time. Uh, are you not in a position to make a firm commitment to the Senate as to a time frame for introducing uh, a, an amendment, uh, amendments that deal with this issue? Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, Senator Patrick, I can't give you a time frame on dealing with that specific issue, but as you know, uh, this government has um, initiated and indeed implemented a series of reforms in superannuation over its last seven years in, uh, in government, and it will continue to do so until the, the system is efficient and high functioning, as it should be, to serve all Australians. All right. The question before the chair is that amendments one and two on sheet 8971, as moved by Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bell. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory and call again or ask your operator for assistance. Just trying to ring my mom. This is a recording. <laughs> Thank you. 
stop the bells. Uh, the question is that amendments one and two on sheets eight, nine, seven, one be agreed to. Uh, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Green, teller for the noes. There being six ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just give people a moment to resume their seats. I'll ask senators to quietly exit the chamber. Oh, Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, um, sorry, when committee stage, sorry, um, Mr. Chair, um, I uh, move Amendment Eight Nine Two Six, uh, sorry, Amendment One on Sheet Eight Nine Two Six revised. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair, this is uh, an amendment which requires the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority to conduct a review uh, into this legislation. Uh, and really, the purpose of it is uh, is a bit of a safety net. It uh, requires the review to look at any unintended consequences of this legislation, and if indeed any unintended consequences are found, and I note that it requires consultation with stakeholders to to whether to form that particular view, uh, then uh, to make recommendations to the minister as to how to rectify uh, those unintended consequences. The review must be undertaken uh, within 30 months or completed within 30 months of this uh, legislation uh, coming into effect. Uh, the report must be written, provided to the minister, and the minister must then table the report uh, within 15 days of, uh, of it being given to the minister. Minister. Thank you, Acting 
Deb Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I keep getting that wrong because you're sitting in the wrong spot. Thank you, Senator Patrick, too. Oh, I, I, uh, I'm sitting in the right spot. <laughs> the government will support uh, this amendment. The government notes that managing the composition of their membership is an unavoidable operational consideration for any defined benefit scheme and doesn't believe that a change to the proposed bill is required at this time. However, as identified by the Senate Committee's final report on this bill, new evidence may well emerge over time and the government will be agreeing to Senator Patrick's amendment to require APRA to review the status of defined benefit schemes within 30 months to ascertain if there have been any unintended negative consequences. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wish to indicate that Labor also will support um, the amendment. Um, the committee did hear evidence from a range of stakeholders who were in a position to know that the scheme proposed by the government would hurt defined benefit schemes. And the small number of witnesses who were in a position to tell us about that were unequivocal that that was the case. We believe there will be detrimental effects to defined benefit schemes. We support a review, but the fear is, of course, that it will be too little too late, that, in fact, the damage will have been done by this needlessly partisan intervention into a perfectly functioning super scheme. Nonetheless, we support the amendment proposed by Senator Patrick. The amendment before the uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I simply rise to indicate the Australian Greens' support for this amendment. Thank you, Senator McKim. There being no further contributions, the question is that Amendment 1 on sheet uh, 8871. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, amendment 1 on sheet 8926 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Chair. I seek to, uh, leave to move items 1 to 3 on sheet 1000 uh, together. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, this amendment seeks to establish arrangements that will allow workers to retain the choice to bargain for a single fund or set of funds where it is determined by the Fair Work Commission that it is in their interest to do so. This is about protecting choice. This is about protecting the choices made by workers in the context of their workplace, along with their colleagues in the context of their union. Their choice to collectively determine what is in their best interests. And the amendments we are considering will ensure that if an enterprise agreement includes a restriction on the choice of superannuation fund or funds available to employees, it will go before the Fair Work Commission. And the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that the restriction is in the interests of the employees who will be covered by the agreement. And what this will allow, as was made clear by witnesses who appeared before the Senate inquiry into this legislation, is consideration of key factors that are essential to the proper functioning of our superannuation system. It will allow the safeguarding against underpayment and it will allow features which are specific to certain workplaces or industries that are attached to certain superannuation funds to be retained. I commend the amendments to the Senate. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, the government will be opposing the, this uh, amendment on sheet 1000. The government can't support an amendment where employees' ability to choose the fund that receives their superannuation contributions will continue to be restricted. Allowing choice to be restricted in circumstances approved by the Fair Work Commission fails to acknowledge that each employee has individual financial circumstances which impact on which superannuation fund is most appropriate for them. The key is that employees should have the power to make this decision. Employees should have the power to make this decision, not the employer and not the superannuation industry and not the government. Individuals should not have to bear the consequences of holding multiple accounts, including facing multiple fees and multiple insurance premiums. So we should be clear about what this amendment is actually about. In the committee and, uh, and, and previously, the opposition have said that this is about insurance risk, but the ACTU has advised my office during just the last sitting period that the reforms um, 
uh, that, that these reform that this reform actually makes very little difference to insurance arrangements. That it's really about providing assistance to individual funds, which are, let's face it, now multi-billion-dollar companies um, that uh, Labor sees to fit to prop up and shield them essentially from competition by removing an employee's right to choose their fund. You can't imagine a circumstance in any other part of the superannuation in the financial services industry. Imagine if any other financial services company unaffiliated with the Labor movement approached Labor and begged them to be propped up by locking in customers and denying them choice. Or if a, a, you know, a telecommunications company or an energy company came begging, please prevent a, comp a, you know, a customer from switching to another provider, they'd be laughed out of the room and rightly pilloried in the media for doing so too. But the fact that Labor thinks that it's okay for superannuation funds to do so, I think, is telling indeed. And it speaks volumes of what is wrong with this industry, this complacency and entitlement. Now, make no mistake, this amendment is all about the funds, and it's not at all about the members. Furthermore, the operation of this amendment is ambiguous. It's not at all clear whether the choice of fund restrictions would apply to employers with compliance concerns or for employers that failed the, who meet their SG ob obligations. If they did impose restrictions in these circumstances, the result is that employees would be stripped of their right to choose because of their employer's non-compliance. In other words, Labor's amendment would be punishing employees because their employers have failed to pay their superannuation. In any case, the amendment doesn't address the SG non-compliance. The government takes SG obligations very seriously and believes that non-compliance is best dealt with through our targeted reforms to improve the overall integrity of the superannuation guarantee. Are there any further speakers to this amendment? That okay, so question is that the amendments be agreed to. That's amendments one to three on sheet 1000. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The one voice either side, the noes have it. Division required, ring the bells.
stop the bells. So the question is that opposition amendments one to three on sheet 1000 be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Point Senator McCarthy, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the noes. Order. There being 22 ayes and 27 noes, uh, the amendment is not agreed. I believe the opposition has one more amendment. Senator Senator Waters, were you uh, seeking the call? I believe you were interrupted by technology in making a contribution previously. Yes, um, with your indulgence, Chair, I, I um, seek the leave of the Chamber just to speak for a few minutes on the substance of the amendment. I, I acknowledge that it's already been voted on, but unfortunately the link crashed, um, so I didn't get to, to give the justification for the amendment, nor was I aware that it was being voted on until after the link was restored. So, Senator, Senator Water has sought leave to make uh, a few minutes of the contribution that she was uh, unable to make due to technology. Is leave granted? Uh, in that case, Senator Waters, you have the call. Lovely. Thank you very much. And I thank folk there in the chamber for your indulgence. Um, as I was saying earlier, the amendment that I moved uh, would abolish the $450 superannuation threshold, um, the threshold at which uh, nobody gets paid super if they get paid less than $450 a month. Now, this disproportionately affects women um, who are 60 per cent of the people that earn less than $450 a month, and it disproportionately affects young people who often hold multiple jobs, and it disproportionately affects uh, people in casual work. So for all of these reasons, um, we think it's a very out, outdated and discriminatory uh, threshold. Um, sadly, we know that women retire with, on average, half the superannuation of men, um, and this is one of the reasons for that. There are so many, but this is one of them. Um, this is an easily fixable situation. Um, I, I acknowledge that uh, the vote has sadly um, already gone down on this amendment, but I am, I am informed that uh, the government indicated that they are considering this issue as part of uh, the Treasurer's response to the uh, retirement income review, um, and certainly uh, we would love to see some movement on this. And I, I'm informed that uh, the Labor Party indicated they would also consider this issue in the lead-up to the next election. So there's perhaps some cause for hope uh, that the two big parties are taking this issue on. There's no longer a justification for um, uh, making that superannuation retirement gap 
worse for low income earners who are disproportionately women. Um, and on that point, um, and, I'll, and I'll finish up on this one, Chair, I note that um, in the context of the COVID crisis that has beset us all this year and the um, uh, somewhat unfortunate decision by government to allow people to access their super, um, I've got some statistics here that I would like on the record. Um, I understand that whilst there have been, uh, this is a gendered element as well, whilst there have been more men that have accessed their super through the early release scheme, um, women are taking out a higher proportion of their savings from super. And that's probably also as a result of the fact that their account balances are lower and therefore the amount they can withdraw is a, is a larger proportion. Um, long story short, the existing super inequities have been exacerbated by uh, the early release scheme and they have been exacerbated for the last few decades by this threshold of a $450 contribution. Um, women in super estimates that there's 220,000 women and 145,000 men who are missing out on about $125 million of superannuation each year because they're uh, not meeting that $450 threshold. Um, so I thank the members of the crossbench that supported us on this amendment to remove that threshold, uh, disappointed that the big parties didn't vote for it, but acknowledged that they've made some statements that indicate that perhaps this issue was under review, and we really hope to see some progress on it um, in the coming uh, months. So thank you very much for your indulgence, Chair. Thank you. Before I call Senator McAllister, can I just ask any senators who are not participating in this debate, if you wish to hold conversations, could you kindly leave the chamber and go to the alcoves or elsewhere, or uh, do your colleagues the courtesy of listening in silence? Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I seek to move the amendment on sheet 1001. Um, underpayment of superannuation is an enormous problem. And the problem that has not been dealt with by the government is that there is basically very limited mechanisms for individuals who find themselves being underpaid. And the amendment that we propose would change the law to include a right to superannuation within the national employment standards. And that would give every employee the right to pursue their unpaid superannuation in their own right. Because the problem is this. Currently, unpaid or underpaid employer superannuation contributions are a debt that is owed to the Australian Tax Office rather than to the individual worker. And unless there is a specific clause in their award or their agreement, and I observe that the government does everything in its power to make it difficult for such agreements to be formed, workers can't chase this money. Because the money is not technically owed to them, it's technically owed to the ATO. By placing superannuation within the National Employment Standards in the Fair Work Act, all employees would be empowered to recoup unpaid super from employers through the Fair Work Commission or through the Federal Court. Individuals would be empowered to chase their own unpaid super instead of waiting for the ATO to do it for them. And again, the Senate, uh, the Senate Economics Committee has previously heard evidence about the problems the administrative problems, the delays and difficulties encountered by people who try and get the ATO to act on their behalf in relation to these matters. What's before the chamber now is a significantly more practical proposal than the government's pathetic response to this issue. Because what did the government decide to do? Its only response to this issue has been to allow an amnesty in place for employers who can actually go back and claim an amnesty back as far as 1992. You can have been not paying your super since 1992 and get a tick from the government. I mean, the amnesty is coming to an end, but it is indicative of the pathetic attempt, the pathetic and inadequate attempts by this government to grapple with these problems. They come into this chamber and cry crocodile tears about various aspects of the superannuation, various problems with individuals. If they had the courage of their convictions, they would support this simple amendment, because it is an amendment that will allow individuals, give individuals the power to chase the money that is owed to them. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The government opposes this amendment. The amendment, as outlined by Senator McAllister, proposes to insert the superannuation guarantee into the national employment standards, which would mean, yes, workers would be able to pursue their employers through the Fair Work Commission on super issues. In addition, in addition to the existing regulatory oversight 
by the ATO. Now, the amendment that is proposed is identical to an amendment that was defeated in this chamber on 24 February this year relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment Recovering Unpaid Superannuation Bill 2019. And I, as I advised the chamber at that time, on 24 February, I have committed to the crossbenchers that the Treasury will examine this proposal in good faith in good faith, and will brief the crossbench on the outcomes of that examination. Now, that work is currently underway. Um, and I am more than happy to offer any crossbench senators a briefing if they wish. Um, as agreed in my discussions with Senator Patrick um, and, uh, and also followed up with the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, the time frame for that work uh, has been extended by six months to February next year, 2021. And the reason for that was because the relevant Treasury resources were deployed or redeployed, I suppose, on, to work on the coronavirus response. The amendment, though, contains a number of very complex issues that require some quite careful examination and aren't appropriate to be debated on the floor of the chamber right now and today. They include things like the potential, potential duplication by the Fair Work Commission of the regulatory work that is already undertaken by the ATO. And this would create considerable uncertainty both for small businesses and also for individuals, with small business owners potentially facing duplicate penalties and with the presence of multiple regulators potentially causing confusion for workers and for employees. And that is why the proper examination of this policy and its consequences is required. And that examination is what I have instructed Treasury to undertake. Are there any further speakers to this amendment? Um, Senator Patrick was actually on his feet first. Senator Patrick. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Mr Chair. <coughs> I, uh, just rise to make a, a short contribution here. I actually uh, do accept the propositions put forward by Senator McAllister, but I also accept that there are some issues that need to be resolved in relation to this, that it could create, uh, it could create issues. Uh, so uh, I've, um, I'm taking on good faith the commitment that has been made by the minister to uh, have a review completed by February. And very shortly after, I'm anticipating that we will have legislation before the parliament that will uh, uh, re remedy the very things that Senator McAllister is talking about. And uh, uh, so I, I, I won't be supporting the, the amendment today, but uh, certainly if we get to a point some reasonable time after February and the government has enacted, I will, uh, uh, I will change that position. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks for the update, Minister. I note the blowout again of another six months in acting on this issue that is so important for so many people who are being underpaid by their employers. Uh, I asked on the last occasion whether a briefing could be provided to the opposition. It strikes me as odd that some parts of the chamber could be briefed on this question and this issue, but the opposition could not be. Uh, have you given any further consideration to that request? Minister. Thank you, Senator McAllister. I think the last time that this issue came up, I said, well, if you agreed, as Senator Patrick had, to not support your own amendment, then we would be quite happy to provide you the same briefings that we would provide the crossbenchers that were supporting us in not supporting your amendment. Senator McAllister. I will make the observation that uh, on occasion, just every now and then, we expect the government to rise to the task of actually trying to deliver for the Australian people instead of playing political games and trying to get petty wins in this place. Now, that may prove to be optimistic. Some would say the triumph of hope over experience. But I had thought on this occasion the minister might be willing to engage with the chamber on a matter that appears to be of interest to the whole chamber. I have, in fact, brought this amendment forward in this debate in good faith. And I bring it forward because I know that there are many, many, many people out there who are looking for an answer, who are looking for a solution, who don't want to be exploited any further and want a remedy. That's actually what acting in good faith on behalf of your community looks like. And I don't understand why the people who look to the opposition to be represented couldn't expect some kind of dialogue with the minister responsible for this issue. Are any further contributions? In that case, the question is that Opposition Amendment 1 on Sheet 1001 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Only heard one voice. Thank you. 
Uh, division required. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. So the question is that Opposition Amendment 1 on Sheet 1001 be agreed to. I call Senator McCarthy teller for the ayes, Senator Davey teller for the noes.
order. There being 22 ayes and 26 noes, the amendment is not agreed to. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I ask that the, the Greens' vote of no be recorded in the Hansard, please. It will so be recorded. Uh, Senator McAllister. I might make the same request for the opposition, please. So the opposition wishes that its vote of no be recorded in Hansard to uh, prevent the need for an actual division. We appreciate that. The question now is that the bill be reported. Sorry, Senator Lambie. Can I? Opposition um, notice take a note as well, please. Senator Enhance Lambie our... opposing the Thank uh, you. adoption. Thank you. Any further contributions before we move on? Thank you very much. In that case, the question now is that the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. So the committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment, your, summary, your superannuation, your choice bill of 2019, and has agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the uh, motion be agreed to those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. I appoint Senator Davey, tell her for the eyes. Senator McCarthy, tell her for the nose. Order. There have been 26 ayes and 22 noes. The report of the committee is adopted. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that this bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is that the uh, report be read, the bill be read a third time. I appoint Senator McGrath, teller for the ayes, and uh, Senator McCarthy, teller for the noes. Well, there being 26 ayes and 22 noes, the bill is agreed with Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act 1992 and for related purposes. Government Business Orders of the Day, number three, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment, Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019, Resumption of second reading debate. Senators Cazodes, of you who are not uh, participating in this debate, please resume your seats in silence or leave the chamber. And I give the call to Senator Hughes. President, once again, I am proud to be part of the Morrison government and pleased to speak on more unapologetically tough legislation. This time, we're tackling cheats that exploit vulnerable students while undermining the integrity of Australia's high-quality degrees. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment, prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019, targets criminals who previously have escaped detention for crimes which target young, naive and vulnerable students. Cheating services are a blight on our education system. The individuals behind the so-called contract cheating services should never prosper from this behaviour. It now includes those who advertise via websites to complete assignments or sit exams for students willing to pay. It's just not fair to the students who put in the work and keep showing up. Under the Morrison government, if you sell a cheating service to an Australian student, you will face two years imprisonment or a fine of up to $100,000. Importantly, this bill is aimed at commercial cheating services, not the students who use them. Students who cheat will still be subject to their institution's own academic integrity policies and sanctions, including any consequences that flow from those. And after consulting with the sector, we've clarified the legislation to ensure that parents and friends who might edit their child's essay or provide suggestions on how to improve an assignment will not be impacted. However, the national regulator will be given new powers to investigate and recommend the prosecution of cheating service providers. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, or TEXA, will also be empowered to seek court injunctions which will enforce internet service providers and search engines to block cheating websites. The bill amends the TEXA Act to make it an offence to provide, arrange or advertise academic cheating services to students studying within Australian higher education providers. It applies whether student, the service is provided from within Australia or overseas. Criminal and civil penalties of up to two years jail and fines of up to 500 penalty units or around $100,000 
will apply where the cheating service or advertising is for a commercial purpose. Civil penalties are up to 500 penalty units will apply where the cheating service is provided without remuneration. Strict liability will apply to the criminal offence of providing an academic cheating service in order to undermine services of disingenuous disclaimers regarding the purpose and use of their products. TEXA will be appointed to enforce the new law with its powers to include monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigation and prosecution of identified offenders. TEXA will have additional power to collect and disseminate information about cheating websites and their users to help institutions combat cheating activity on campus, but with safeguards to protect the unwarranted sharing of personal information about those who purchase cheating materials. The bill is based on the advice of the Higher Education Standards Panel that legislation was required to deter third-party academic cheating services. The panel found that the array of state, territory and Commonwealth laws relevant to cheating offences made it difficult to pursue legal cases against cheating service providers. The advice was that additional legislative backing was needed to more effectively deal with such risks. It was recommended that legislation be aimed at those who provide cheating services and not at the students who might use such services. This year, the government took into account some 47 submissions regarding the legislation, which were generally supportive but pointed at ways to improve aspects of the bill. We listened and we modified the bill accordingly. So why is the bill necessary? Australian and international university students are under more pressure than ever before to succeed. The pandemic and the fast-evolving digital business world means that it's more competitive than ever when applying for a job. Qualifications could mean the difference between winning a role or not. And recently, our government has moved to ensure that first-year students who fail more than half their subjects could lose their taxpayer-funded HECS support. This is a sensible move because it requires students to achieve goals as they progress. Ultimately, it will save the taxpayer millions and ensure that students that drop out of courses don't incur massive debts. And while it's a sensible move that protects both students and taxpayer, it does increase the pressure on students to achieve academic passes in their first year. Cheating services know this, and they exploit both local and international students with this information. The bill is more proof that the Morrison government wants higher education to be accessible and sustainable for all Australians. We continue to look for ways to protect this important sector. In 2020, our government invested $18.2 billion in higher education. Next financial year, the investment will be $18.8 billion, and by 2022, higher education will receive more than $19 billion. From 2009 to 2017, the Commonwealth Grant Scheme funding increased by 71 per cent significantly faster growth than the economy experienced. This year, around $15.2 billion will be provided specifically for higher education teaching and learning. $64 billion will be provided over the next four years for teaching and learning, including $30 billion for the Commonwealth Grant Scheme, $29 billion for the Higher Education Loan Program and $4 billion for other teaching. In 2019-20, around $9.6 billion in Commonwealth funding is being provided for research and development across all portfolios. This $12.4 billion will be invested over the next four years through the education portfolio alone, including $8 billion through block grants, $3.3 billion in funding provided through the Australian Research Council, and $1.1 billion through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy as part of the total NCRIS investment of $2.2 billion through to 2028-29. Our government hasn't turned its back on higher education during the pandemic either. The Higher Education Relief Package guarantees Commonwealth grant scheme payments for providers. It offers regulatory relief and cost recovery fee relief with around $7.4 million in future and already collected tax fees. The outcome of our investment means that education providers can offer discounted six-month online courses in fields of national priority. And as at 10 August, there are 392 courses across 55 providers in eight fields, including health, education and IT. 
The result of all of this investment in higher education is that our Australian universities are still in good shape. In 2018, universities reported total revenue of $33.7 billion, with a net result after expenses of nearly $1.5 billion. They have net assets of $59.1 billion, including cash reserves of $4.4 billion and total cash and investments of $20.3 billion. In 2018, total Australian government funding amounted to $17.6 billion, or 52 per cent of total revenue. International student fees contributed a further $8.8 billion, or 26 per cent of revenue. Our government has worked hard to minimise university job losses. Universities are eligible for JobKeeper if they meet the required decline in revenue, in line with the criteria for other businesses. However, a six-month revenue test is applied to universities to ensure a fair comparison between semester-based revenue periods. The Morrison government has invested heavily in this sector, both financially and with new legislation that protects students and our universities from the scourge of cheaters. I'm proud once again to be speaking on groundbreaking legislation that targets those lawbreakers that will no longer have free reign to exploit our universities and their students. Senator Scar. I rise to make a few short comments, uh, which I expect will take us up to question time, in relation to the bill before the Senate. And I just wanted to provide in my contribution a bit more analysis with respect to the core issue which this legislation is seeking to address, and that is the corrosive nature of cheating. And I want to talk about it from the perspective of five different stakeholders. Firstly, the student themselves. The provision of these contract cheating services, the tempting of students to engage and procure these contract cheating services, leads them potentially on a road, a slippery road, which involves the corrosion of character. It is absolutely crucial that all of our institutions across all parts of our society support integrity and ensuring integrity of our processes and procedures. The student who cheats in an assignment today is potentially the, the professional or the worker of the future who is going to cut corners and compromise on issues to the detriment of their community. And it also actually deprives the student themselves of that great opportunity to look at a subject which they're having trouble uh, handling. Maybe it wasn't their specialist subject. But it deprives them of the opportunity to work hard on that subject, to take the hard road, the hard road, the more difficult road of, of becoming talented in that subject and becoming able to pass that subject with proficiency. It actually deprives the student of that opportunity. It also deprives fellow students who don't engage in cheating with respect to the opportunity to get full recognition of their achievement. The students who choose not to involve, or not to take advantage of contract cheating services. It imputes the integrity of their result if their fellow students engage those services. It also attacks the integrity of academia, including tutors who invest so much substantial effort, who become mentors to many of us who are serving in the Senate today. It detracts from their efforts. It undermines the reputation of the universities themselves, their standing in society and on the international stage, and that is a bad thing. But more than anything else, cheating, be it in universities, be it in high schools, be it in sport, be it in any other endeavour, cheating is a corrosive behaviour which undermines the entirety of a society. In my earlier life, working for a mining company that worked in Southeast Asia and many other parts of the world, we had to grapple with the issue of corruption. And one of the lessons we always remembered was it didn't matter. It didn't matter how high the, uh, the stake involved. It didn't matter whether or not it was a policeman seeking uh, a 50 baht or something uh, bribe to let you go through a roadblock, or if it was a senior government official. It didn't matter. It was cheating. It was corruption. And you could not tolerate it for a second, because once you in any way compromise with respect to those principles, it had a corrosion impact 
a corrosive impact, a corrosive impact on the organisation itself, a corrosive impact on the institutions in the uh, institutions in the country, a corrosive impact on the community. If they're doing it, why shouldn't I do it? The corrosive impact of cheating is addressed by this legislation, and I uh, am happy to support this legislation in the House, uh, in the Senate, and I commend it to you. Thank you, Senator Scar. It being right on 2 p.m., I'll call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we are in a relatively good position. What percentage of all COVID-19 deaths in Australia relate to people in residential aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the proportion of, um, de rel of deaths in, uh, in aged care as a proportion of the, the total deaths sits at about 70 per cent in Australia. At about 70 per cent. That's not the exact number, uh, but it's about 70 per cent. Uh, and, Mr. President, um, if you can, you, if you compare that, um, it, and that's about 0.17 per cent of the aged care beds uh, in Australia. Uh, and the reason that I made the the relativity comment, and I and I answered in the question yesterday, was that in the UK that number is um, the relativity of of the number of deaths in residential aged care compared to the population is 5.3 per cent, which is over 30 times as bad as Australia. It's worse, it's worse than, than Australia by a, a factor of, almost, of over 30 times. Mr President, I don't say that to downplay any of the deaths that have occurred Order. in Australia in residential aged care. And in fact, uh, Mr President, the interjections are quite offensive. Uh, I'm not trying Order. to uh, to do anything but to, to, but to state some actual facts with respect to this. Uh, and the Labor Party might like to play politics with this. They might like to talk Australia's effort down. That's fine. That's fine, Order. Mr. President. Order. But can I say the public health response in Australia? Senator Watt. The public health response Senator Watt, in Australia. Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Senator Watt, remember my rule about counting to ten after your name has been called. Senator uh, interjections are always disorderly, and I believe they're even more disorderly in the current uh, environment where we are seeking to maintain a COVID-safe workplace. Order. Order. I, I, when there's silence, I'll call Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Well, we, 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 we are on the point of order. I would respond to the Leader of the Government and the Senate by saying uh, this is about the Minister's accountability and his accountability for his incompetence in the portfolio, order. which has caused Senator Wong, deaths. Senator Wong, that's not an appropriate way to address a point of order. Um, I don't believe it's unparliamentary. It was completely out of order to use a point of order for that. Um, it is not up to me to rule which interjections are disorderly or not. They are always disorderly. Um, interjections are not a method of holding a minister accountable. Questions and answers are. I ask senators to respect that um, and hear the minister in silence. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and uh, Senator Walsh asks about the, the comparability. In Australia, we've had outbreaks in 200 residential aged care facilities, unfortunately, very unfortunately. That's 7.7 per cent of the 2,706 residential aged care facilities in Australia. In the, new, in the UK, of the 9,081 care homes, 56 uh, per cent have had an outbreak, Mr President. Um, in Order. Six Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Order. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. Does the minister accept the evidence to the Aged Care Royal Commission that the percentage of deaths in Australia that relate to people in residential aged care, and I quote, makes Australia the country with one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19? Yes or no? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, what I don't do, Mr President, is accept it as a reasonable measure. It is a, it is a fact. 
uh, as it was order. It, it, it was actually, I mean, and I'll take the interjection, Mr. President. It was actually evidence given to the Royal Commission. It wasn't the Royal Commission saying Order, that. Senator Watt. And, and so, Mr. President, uh, as, as I said, as a proportion of uh, the, the fatalities, as a proportion of the Senator aged care Pratt. beds in Australia, amounts to about 0.1 per cent, 0.17 per cent of the aged care beds in this country. In the UK, it's 5.3, which is over 30 times worse than Australia. And while every single death is a tragedy in this pandemic, and in, and, in, and in seven out of eight states, we don't have a case in residential aged care. And unfortunately, in Victoria, where we Order. have uncontrolled community spread, uh, it, the virus has inevitably got into residential aged care. That is what happens. Order, Senator it Colbeck. Has, time for the answer happens. has Despite expired. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. It is one of your colleagues waiting. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. A woman who sadly lost her father from COVID-19 at St Basil's described the moment she learnt her father had died as the worst call of my life. Yesterday, the minister said we had been, and I quote again, in a very good position. Does the minister expect this woman and her grieving family to agree? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Mr President, and thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Actually, no, I don't, because this family has been tragically impacted by the deadly nature of COVID-19. Uh, and, and, I, and I give her and her family my heartfelt condolences. I've spoken to many of these families myself, Mr President. Uh, I've spent time talking to them on community meetings, but I've also spoken to a number of them individually when they've wanted to have a conversation about what's occurred. Uh, we've, uh, we've set up an investigation into what happened at St Basil's, I think appropriately, so that we can understand the epidemiology of that event. We can understand what happened with respect to the delays in us in the Commonwealth being notified of the event, what impact that delay in notification had. And so, Mr President, I understand perfectly that this family would be completely and utterly devastated by the loss of their loved ones. Order, local. Senator Colbeck. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Border travel restrictions imposed by state and territory governments have negatively impacted the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of regional Australians who live and work in and across border communities. Can the minister please outline what steps the National Cabinet is taking to secure a national approach from state and territory governments to issues of quarantine, essential movement across borders and the identification of hotspots to ensure that regional and rural Australians' access to health care, education and employment is not limited unnecessarily. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McKenzie for that question. Mr President, the government is committed to keeping Australia as open as possible in a way that is COVID safe. Uh, in the wake of this pandemic, we must always be focused on protecting both people's lives and people's livelihoods. We are working with state and territory governments to put in place practical, common sense solutions to a whole series of problems that have arisen as a result of hard state border closures, which are affecting access to services and our economic recovery. For example, we need to ensure that relevant exemptions are in place and applied consistently and efficiently so that disruptions to critical services for border residents are minimised as much as possible. National Cabinet has previously codified the freight protocol, ensuring freight can keep moving efficiently and safely during this pandemic. Last Friday, National Cabinet noted some recent changes by states and territories to make it easier for people to cross borders subject to appropriate arrangements to access essential services and activities. Since Monday, farmers and critical agricultural workers who reside outside the border zone in Victoria now have a new pathway to enter New South Wales and move outside the border bubble for work. For people living in the border zone, a permit can be obtained for travel within the border zone for the purpose of work if they cannot work from home and to obtain medical care or access to health supplies. Victorian residents can obtain a permit to enter New South Wales for the purpose of receiving non-emergency medical or hospital services with no permit required in emergency situations. 
On Friday, the National Cabinet also asked the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee to develop a common understanding of a hotspot uh, of a hotspot across jurisdictions and consider movement restrictions for affected residents in that context. This further work will provide people who are living in those areas, particularly in rural and regional border communities, with clear guidance on where and when they can access health and other services or where restrictions order, may Senator mean they have Coleman, to find alternative time for the arrangements. Has expired. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. The Victorian Labor government has imposed strict restrictions on regions not impacted by COVID-19 and just announced that these may continue for a further 12 months, whilst failing to stop Melburnians heading out to the regions. Can the minister please advise what impact preemptive border restrictions may have on health edu and education access, employment and people in need of compassionate consideration? Senator Cormann. No, thank you very much, Mr President. We have seen widely reported examples of hardship for residents in rural and regional border, border communities. Such impacts should, of course, be minimised wherever possible, and they can be minimised in a way that is COVID-safe. Throughout this pandemic, when it comes to restrictions on people's freedoms, we have been guided by the medical advice. Decisions on border restrictions must continue to be informed by public health advice. Ultimately, these are matters for the states and territories. However, it is up to the states Order. and territories to set out clearly the medical advice informing their decisions and to ensure that there is a genuine public health upside in return for the restrictions and costs imposed on individual Australians and on our communities, in particular rural and regional communities across Australia. There is no rule book on how best to deal with this crisis, but it is critical that decisions are made on the basis of advice from the medical experts and not based on political considerations. Indeed, that is why the National Cabinet has asked the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee to develop a consistent order, approach Senator to Coleman. hotspot management Time and the needs of border residents. Expired. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Border restrictions are severely impacting our agricultural industry and food supply chains due to creating significant workforce limitations. Can the minister please provide an update to the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is taking steps to address these concerns? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, the Leader of the Nationals for that question. National Cabinet agreed on 21 August to the development of an agricultural workers' code which would set out nationally consistent measures to support the movement of workers critical to the agricultural sector across state borders. The code would help to support individuals and occupations that help ensure the continuity of the agricultural sector. Without these workers, agriculture in Australia comes to a halt, with all of the consequences of that, including for people in the city. Very important for all of us to remember. This includes not just on-farm workers, such as shearers, grain harvesters and fruit pickers, but also those who provide agricultural businesses with critical services such as vets and agricultural mechanics. Sheep still need shearing, crops still need harvesting, and animals still need to be attended to by vets. Uh, there have been recent encouraging changes to exemptions in Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia, but there is more work to be done Order. with the New South Senator Wales Victorian Coleman. border in particular. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Citizen, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we have been extremely fortunate. Does the minister really believe the 100 families who have lost loved ones in the last seven days to accept that we have been extremely fortunate? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. Thank Senator you, Mr. Colbert. President. Uh, I don't think that the families who have lost loved ones would be feeling anything other than grief, Mr. President, and I understand that. Uh, they've, they've suffered tragic losses, uh, uh, all 342 of them now. They've all suffered a really tragic loss, and again, my condolences and the government's condolences to them. But, Mr President, um, in a comparative sense, the Australian government's management of the COVID-19 outbreak has been relatively good. In fact, I would rather be here in Australia than I would be anywhere in the world right now. I would rather be in Australia than anywhere else in the world. And that is also reflected, that is also reflected Order. in the figures that we have Order. with respect to the numbers of, of, uh, of contractions of the virus in our residential aged care system. Uh, while the Labor Party might like to hang on 
uh, calculations that place Australia in a bad light. Australia, uh, on my left. In, in a, in a, if you're looking at the aged care stats on an international basis, uh, we are doing relatively well. And, and the government takes no the, the, the government takes no pleasure in the fact that these families have suffered this tragic loss because it is a tragic loss. And I don't expect any of those families, Mr. President, to, to feel anything but the loss that they've felt. It is, but it, but in, if you look at our situation in a global sense, Mr. President, the Australian circumstance in a global sense, and our management of COVID-19 compared to the rest of the world, I'd rather be here in Australia than I would be almost any other country in the world. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The minister just said he would rather be in Australia than any other country in the world, and that the government has done reasonably well. The day before uh, this man uh, died in St Basil's, a resident received a call telling them their father was comfortably sitting in his room, isolated from a major coronavirus outbreak gripping the facility, when in reality their father was gravely unwell at the Northern Hospital. Minister, why should this man and his grieving family accept that the government has done reasonably well? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Keneally, for the question. Um, it is disappointing that the opposition seeks to reinterpret what I'm saying in one context and apply it to another context. I've done, I, have, I have done nothing, Mr. President. Order. I have done nothing Order. but express Order. my sympathies Order. and the Senators government's sympathies. Senators on my left. Order. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Order on my left. If I can't hear the minister, I won't be able to deal with inevitable points of order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it is disappointing that the opposition t tries to take my comments out of context and apply them in a different circumstance, because that's not what I've said on any, on any occasion. I have done nothing but express my sympathies for every family, every family who's suffered a loss because they are all suffering a family tragedy. And so I take offence at the fact that Senator Keneally tries to use my words in a way that I have never uttered them. It is, it is in fact quite outrageous Order, that she Senator seeks to Colbeck, do that. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Order. Order. Senator Faruqi, on a, I, oh, no, you're next, I think. I've got Senator Keneally for a final supplementary question. Yeah. A diabetic 75-year-old woman with COVID-19 was forced to go without breakfast, was left for hours in a urine-soaked bed due to a lack of staff. Does the, does the minister really believe that the government has done reasonably well in addressing this aged care crisis and the COVID-19 outbreak in age, residential aged care homes? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, Senator Keneally deliberately misquotes and verbals me with respect to the words I've, I've used uh, and the context within which I've used them. And Mr President, I and the government have acknowledged that in some circumstances, but particularly at St Basil's, where we had 24 hours to restaff the entire facility, including management, that things didn't go as we thought they should have done. Order. We, that things didn't go Order. as we thought they should have done. And we've acknowledged it and we've apologised for it, Mr. President. So, and, and Mr. President, so um, the, the families of these residents Order. Um, have Order, suffered. Senator the Pratt. families have suffered a, an absolute tragedy, Mr. President. Uh, but I will not take Senator Keneally misusing what I've said and placing it completely out of context because it's completely unreasonable. Order, for Senator that. Colbeck. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education. Minister, at least 16 members of the government, including the Prime Minister, went to uni while it was free. But your latest cruel, hypocritical plan will hurt students by hiking fees and cuts up to $900 million from teaching funding, including from STEM and nursing. The experts agree it's an unfixable mess. It won't create enough new places. It punishes struggling students. Your own department admitted it won't change student choices, and it in incentivizes unis to enroll students in high-fee courses instead of STEM. 
The whole thing relies on useless job market predictions and bad data to punish students without saving uni jobs or fixing the research crisis. Youth wage growth is the flattest in history and unemployment is skyrocketing. How can you justify condemning students to decades of debt? Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question, uh, much of which uh, I disagree with uh, the information uh, that she, uh, she presents as, uh, as fact in that question. But I do think there are a couple of granules within, uh, within all of that, that there are too many uh, graduates coming out of universities at, uh, at present uh, who are not necessarily securing a job, a well-paying job, a job particularly in the field of their studies. And our reforms that, uh, that we are presenting in relation to higher education seek to address some of those problems, to ensure that the way in which, uh, the way in which uh, students uh, are encouraged into university and supported through university does result in the optimal chances of them securing a job uh, and indeed a job in the field of their training, study and ideally desires. Contrary to what Senator Faruqi says, there are no cuts in terms of Commonwealth funding or support. Indeed, funding for the Commonwealth Grants Scheme uh, will continue to increase uh, by CPI, uh, and overall university funding will increase from $18 billion in 2020 to $19 billion by 2022. Uh, that will be some 10 per cent uh, growth relative to the 2018 uh, position. Uh, Ms. Tian published the draft legislation of our Job Ready Graduates Package for consultation uh, and indeed uh, has now worked through that consultation phase uh, and has presented a plan that will create more places for more students to attend university, an additional 39,000 places by 2023, an additional 100,000 places by 2030. No existing student is going to see changes in relation uh, to their fees, but universities will see their record funding continuing to grow whilst we create the right incentives to encourage students uh, to study in areas that optimise the chances of them securing a job Order. and meeting our economic Senator needs of the future. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, you are actually forcing universities to enrol students, more students, thousands more, while cutting funding, and that is true for their education by an average of 15 per cent. This means fewer teachers and bigger classes, a poorer quality of education across the board, and particularly in regional unis where the cost of delivery is higher. Minister, will you acknowledge that your plan is going to hurt the quality of uni education? And if you were still education minister, would you have brought forward this cruel plan? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, I do congratulate Minister Tian on, uh, on the reforms that he's proposing. You know, reforms that will see, for example, students who choose to study teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English or languages paying some 40 per cent less for their degrees in terms of the contribution that they make. I would have thought Senator Faruqi might welcome that. I would have thought there might be some acknowledgement uh, of that. Uh, students who study architecture or maths will pay around 60 per cent less in terms of the student contribution for their degree. Students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, environmental science, Senator Faruqi, uh, IT or engineering will pay around 20 per cent less in terms of contribution for their degree. This is about making sure that we equip Australia and young Australians for the future with skills that will help them to get a job and our economy to grow and recover in the post-COVID era. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, your government has stood by while thousands of university workers have lost their jobs. The likes of Crown Casino have received more than $100 million in JobKeeper, but you have changed the rules three times to maliciously lock universities out. Now you are intent on cutting funding, hiking fees and punishing struggling students. Minister, what do you have against universities? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this is a quintessential problem that exists with the Australian Greens. You can say whatever you want in terms of outlining the facts, and they are just completely ignored. I outline the growth in funding. I outline the Green might be a shared problem with the Labor Party. That's why they're all on that side of the chamber, Senator Cormann. You outline the fact that funding continues to grow. 
right into the future, and Senator Faruqi still stands up and talks about cuts in funding to Australian universities. She tries to draw an analogy to private sector businesses who have seen their revenue collapse in terms of their business operations, whereas what the Australian government has done for universities is provide guaranteed ongoing funding to those universities during this COVID-19 crisis. So there's guaranteed funding that the Australian government continues to provide on behalf of taxpayers and students to universities. There's growing funding in Order, the future, Senator and Birmingham there are better incentives the answer for has students. Expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccine strategy? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. Uh, Mr. President, we know that uh, the search for the vaccine is one upon which the world is focused. Without a vaccine, as we know, we won't be able to return fully to the life. Uh, that we have known prior to COVID-19, and you only have to look at the changes that we've had to make here in the parliament as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Australian government is taking targeted action to ensure that Australians have access to safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines if and when they become available. Mr President, our strategy is fourfold. The first is research. We've allocated over $358 million towards research in relation to vaccines, preventions, treatment and respiratory medicines. Most significantly, there has been an investment of $5 million in the University of Queensland molecular clamp. Another vaccine funding round is opened, and the government expects to receive the peer-reviewed recommendations shortly. The second is direct procurement with leading international vaccine candidates. We have already announced our agreement with AstraZeneca and negotiations are advanced with multiple other candidates. The third is participation in the International COVAX facility, which is an international consortium to give participants, participant nations access to a variety of potential vaccine candidates. It acts as a common platform for investment in return for common participation in whichever vaccine is successful. And the fourth is onshore manufacturing capacity for a vaccine in Australia, either directly or under a licence, including through CSL. Mr President, we're confident that these investments and actions will secure early and sufficient access to a safe and effective vaccine. Senator Bragg, a Thank supplementary you. question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government's agreement with AstraZeneca will ensure Australia gets access to this important vaccine if it is successful? Order on my left. Order, order. I'm going. Order on my left. I'll call the senator to continue when there's quiet. Senator Bragg. I'm going to read it again. I've got most of it, sure. Senator Bragg. Keep, Can the minister? Keep, keep, keep. <laughs> We're wasting time. The opposition tends to find valuable. Senator Watt. Can the minister senator advise the Senate how the government's agreement with AstraZeneca? Will ensure Australia gets access to this important vaccine if it is successful. Order, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have stated last week, the government signed a letter of intent with the UK-based drug company AstraZeneca that would mean Australians get access to the University of Oxford COVID-19 vaccine for free, should trials prove successful, safe, and effective. The government and AstraZeneca Order. have committed to working together so that all Australians will get access to such a vaccine. Of the 160 different vaccine projects in the world, the Oxford vaccine is one of the most advanced and promising. Crucially, the letter of intent between the government and AstraZeneca covers all of the steps that are needed to bring a new vaccine to market. It covers vaccine development, production and distribution. Senator Watt. Mr President, the government will continue discussions with many, many of these developers while at the same time backing Australian researchers. We will continue to take advice from our best medical, scientific and manufacturing experts. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, Order. as we await the development of a vaccine, why is it important to maintain social distancing and practical health steps to minimise the risk of transmitting the virus? 
so we can reopen and grow our COVID-safe economy. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the entire world watches and waits for a vaccine, uh, it has never been more important to observe appropriate health precautions. And indeed, the second wave that the state of Victoria uh, is now experiencing has made it abundantly clear in terms of how vigilant we need to be in observing practices like social distancing. In June and July of this year, we saw positive signs of economic recovery in the states that have suppressed the virus. As we minimise the transmission and the risk of transmission, we minimise the risk of harming the economy. Mr. President, we must all exercise an abundance of caution and continue to follow the medical advice on the practical steps that will keep us all safe. And again, stay 1.5 metres away from other people whenever and wherever we can. Maintain good hand washing and coughing and sneezing hygiene. Stay at home if you're unwell and get tested if we have respiratory symptoms or a fever. And of course, download the COVID Safe app so that we Order. can find Senator the virus Cash. more quickly. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. When did the minister first learn he had been cut out of decision making? in the aged care emergency response. Was the minister ever consulted on the decision to exclude him? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the reality is that there's been no change in the decision-making process with respect to the establishment of a, an aged care Order. response centre in any state. Uh, Mr President, uh, I think the interjection from behind me is correct. Don't always believe what you read in the newspaper, Mr. President. Uh, the, the decisions around the establishment Order. of an aged care response centre uh, are, be, are made through the AHPPC. Uh, that is the decision-making process under the auspices of the National Cabinet. It's been discussed at National Cabinet now on two occasions, uh, last Friday and a fortnight before. Uh, and, uh, Mr. President, the AHPPC has uh, and does report to the health minister. So, in that context, as a, a, an organisation that reports to the health minister in implementing our national COVID-19 health response, uh, that's the decision-making line. So, nothing has changed, Mr. President. It's always as it was. Uh, and, but I and uh, my department. Uh, play an important operational role in the oversight of the, all of those facilities, uh, as I do in Victoria. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has the minister been sidelined because he failed to produce a COVID-19 plan specifically for the aged care sector, or because he failed to learn the tragic lessons of Newmarch House, or because he forgot the number of deaths in residential aged care on Friday? or because he couldn't get the number of deaths right again yesterday? Or was it because of the first, second or the 328th tragic and avoidable death of an older Australian in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I just reject the com completely reject the premise of the question. I completely reject the Senator, premise of the Senator question. Watt. Mr President, uh, don't believe everything that you read in the paper. Don't believe everything that you read in the newspaper. I've just, I've just explained the process for the establishment of these Props centres. Mr President, I was consulted in the process for the formation of these centres across Australia before the documentation went to National Cabinet last week, so I was well aware of all of the processes last week before any decisions were made with respect to the formation of, of a re recovery centre in any other state, uh, because I played a part firstly in the formation of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre and also in the process for the decision-making of those that might be required subsequently. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. If the minister is being cut out of decision-making in his own portfolio, can he tell Australian taxpayers exactly what he is being paid for? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Watt demonstrates what happens when you just read the pre-written supplementary that you've been given before question time, rather than listening to the answer that's just been given. Mr. President, I've just explained the process uh, that's uh, been involved with the design of recovery and response centres for aged care in all of the states. I've explained my involvement in it, and I've explained the process by which they're approved. And I stand by my answer. 
Senator Rennick. Order. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. How is the Morrison government growing a COVID-safe economy by supporting Australian exporters and helping to keep Australians who rely on the exporting sector in jobs through the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Rennick for his question. Uh, a known champion of Australian business and, uh, and Australian jobs, and particularly those from Queensland. Mr President, right across the globe, far too many businesses, far too many jobs have been tragically disrupted by COVID-19. Some of those disruptions, including here in Australia, have been unavoidable as a result of necessary shutdowns and restrictions across economies. Uh, others have been consequential disruptions, and indeed, uh, for many of our exporting businesses, uh, they have been a victim of the consequences uh, of different restrictions, particularly for those exporting premium produce to the world, they have been victims of the shutdown of international aviation. An estimated 80 even 90 per cent of international air freight out of Australia is traditionally carried in the bellies of passenger aircraft, which of course are no longer flying. That's why our government has injected more than $350 million into the international freight assistance mechanism. It's targeted, it's temporary, and it's providing emergency support to make sure that exporters, while still having to pay a premium to get their goods to market, can at least still get it to market. Indeed, we've sent and supported Western Australian pork getting to Singapore, Tasmanian salmon to Taiwan, Cairns coral trout to Hong Kong, New South Wales tuna to Japan, South Australian kingfish to Europe, and Victorian lamb to the UAE. IFAM is providing also important support for medical imports coming back into the country, critical, essential imports in our national interest. To date, uh, IFAM has supported an estimated 4,376 flights that would otherwise probably not have occurred, from nine domestic departure points to over 65 international destinations, carrying 94,500 tonnes representing more than $1.1 billion in export value to our nation, ensuring those Order, exports Senator Birmingham. still flow Time for the and income and jobs has expired. for Australia. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister advise what feedback he has received from Australian business and Australian exporters about the International Freight Assistance Mechanism package? Senator Birmingham. While farmers and our exporters work incredibly hard to secure export contracts around the globe, and the last thing we want to see is them lose that reputation for reliability and lose those contracts simply because they can't get their goods to market. And so businesses across the country, exporters across the country, have welcomed uh, the work of IFAM, indeed in Senator Rennick's home state of Queensland. Uh, the Australian Reef Fish Trading Company in Cairns has said that without IFAM we would be in survival mode. But instead, in the last two months, they've put on two new people and increased their administration officer from part-time to full-time. The availability and reliability of flights has allowed them to commit to buying fish from the boats. That's kept them in business and their crews in jobs with flow-on impact to fuel supplies, mechanical workshops, bait and wholesalers. Indeed, Sunpork in Kingaroy says the IFAM initiative was an extremely useful stimulus when passenger transport came to an abrupt halt and our normal freight avenues were cut off. While Prime Fish from the Gold Coast acknowledges that because of IFAM Order. we've been able to get Senator produce Birmingham. to where Time it needs the to answer go. Has expired. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. In comparison to other countries, can the Minister update the Senate on how the Australian goods export sector is faring during, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, like all aspects of the economy, there are impacts because of the disruptions, not just to air freight, but disruptions in a whole range of other ways. And in the first six months of this year, uh, Australia, Australian goods exports have been down 3.7 per cent on the same period in 2019. But they're still worth in excess of $183 billion. And if we compare that 3.7 per cent decline for Australia with elsewhere around the world, we can see that preliminary OECD data shows an average goods export decline across OECD nations in excess of 15 per cent. It's 3.7 per cent decline for Australia, but more than 15 per cent for the OECD on average. Across the G7, it's estimated to have been a decline in excess of 17 per cent. In the US, a decline in excess of 16 per cent. In Canada, in excess of 18 per cent. In Japan, in excess of 14 per cent. 
That demonstrates that Australia's exporters continue to navigate the complexities of this time, Order, generating Birmingham, export income time, and jobs for Australia. The answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister Reynolds. On 5 February 2020, the Prime Minister announced that the Australian Government would establish a new National Commissioner for Defence and Veterans Suicide Prevention to inquire into suicides of serving and former ADF members. Part of this announcement was the appointment of an interim commissioner to commence a review of known and current former defence personnel suicides dating back to 2001. My question to the minister is, who is the interim commissioner? The minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her, her question. Uh, I can confirm for Senator Lambie in the Senate that legislation will shortly be introduced by the Attorney General to set up the uh, office of, uh, of the um, commissioner, of the permanent commissioner. As I said, the interim commissioner will be appointed uh, shortly uh, to implement, uh, implement that work. So, Senator Lambie, if, oh, oh, would you like me to finish? Sure. Thank you. So what I can confirm is, once appointed by the Attorney General, the National Commissioner will work to identify and undertake the factors and the systemic issues that may contribute uh, to suicide risk amongst serving and former members. Uh, they will have all of the powers of a Royal Commissioner. The government has been acting on this, and as I said, the Attorney General will be introducing legislation shortly to set up this position. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As part of the February 5th announcement, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, and yourself all said that an interim commissioner would immediately, immediately commence a review of historical suicides and report within 12 months. Did that review commence immediately as promised? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said, we've got the legislation underway for the permanent commissioner and to set that up this week. As part of that process, we will still be appointing an interim commissioner, and the Attorney General is in the process at the moment of uh, going through a short list for the interim commissioner to undertake the work as discussed. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. If you say something is ready to go immediately, your words, not mine, how can it possibly be delayed? It's either ready to go or it isn't. Was it ready to go in February? And if not, why did you claim it was? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I announced in February, we did say that we, we would bring forward uh, this office of the Commissioner uh, that would have the powers of the Royal Commission and we would establish an interim commissioner, which, as I've said, the Attorney General currently has a short list of applicants uh, for, that process, for that interim process. Uh, but I would also note that we did say that we would appoint a family veterans advocate, and in fact we have done so with an outstanding uh, person who has been appointed by the Governor General, Ms Gwen Churn, as a veterans family advocate. So we have actually uh, implemented that, and we will shortly be announcing the interim, the interim commissioner. So we are delivering on exactly what we promised to deliver. We've got the legislation in train, uh, we've got in train the appointment of the interim commissioner, and we have appointed an outstanding family veteran advocate. So this government is delivering exactly Order. what we said we would do, Senator Lambie. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, when asked on Friday whether you'd brief the Cabinet between the 10th of July and the 5th of August, the Minister said, and I quote, I don't believe that I attended a Cabinet meeting in that period. I'll check the record for you. Given the Minister has had four days to check the record, did he brief the Cabinet on the growing crisis in aged care in that period? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for the question. Uh, I didn't brief the cabinet in that period of time, but, but Mr. President, um, I have been participating on a daily call with the Prime Minister, uh, senior colleagues, the Health Minister, uh, and, and so effectively a subcommittee of the cabinet every day, every day, all through uh, uh, this, the, particularly the Victorian circumstance, uh, and sometimes twice a day. So, Mr. President, this is not uh, what, as the Labor Party might try and play it, uh, some sort of frivolous process. We have been working 
very closely on a daily basis to address the circumstance, particularly in Victoria. Um, and so I've been working with the PM, with the Finance Minister, uh, Senator Rustin, the Treasurer, the Health Minister, uh, and, and a number of other colleagues and senior departmental officials across agencies every day to bring the resources to bear that we require to manage what was a, a growing outbreak in Victoria. Uh, and we needed to inje in, inject significant resources to assist both the Victorian government and the aged care sector in Victoria to deal with what was a growing situation. Uh, and we continue to do that. We continue to meet on a regular basis. And I have a, a separate meeting every day with the Victorian Aged Care Recovery Centre to get a situation update on the circumstance that's going on in, the, in, the, in Victoria, in particular, given the continuing situation that is there. So the government uh, is not, as is attempted to be portrayed by the opposition, doing anything other than putting its full attention full attention to this at the at at the highest levels on Order, a daily Senator Colbeck, time twice for the daily answer basis. has expired Senator Gallagher a supplementary question uh, thank you uh, mr president as minister for aged care in this government when did you first brief the cabinet about the outbreak in residential aged care in victoria senator colbeck mr president i have spoken to the Prime Minister and senior cabinet <laughs> colleagues on a daily basis with risk to Order. Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Order, uh, direct relevance. It was a direct question about when he briefed, first briefed the cabinet, not when he had a chat with the Prime Minister. That's not the question we asked. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Senator Corbeck is directly relevant to the question asked. Uh, he's explaining uh, that he uh, has had daily conversations with the leader of the cabinet, the leader of the cabinet, and indeed with all of the ministers that are part of the key uh, cabinet subcommittee, the expenditure review committee, and uh, and others as appropriate. And that is in the, in a moment of crisis. That is, of course, what Australians would expect their Minister for Aged Care to do, and the Minister is being directly order. relevant to the Senator question. Senator Wong, I'll take Senator Wong on the point of order, and then I'll rule. Thank you, Mr President. The, uh, question, the, the point of order is direct relevance. The Minister has been asked and answered a question about the Cabinet briefing. He's now seeking to avoid answering another question about Cabinet briefing in relation to an unprecedented crisis in aged care which has caused the deaths of many Australians. We would ask the minister to be directly relevant to the question, which is when did he first brief the cabinet about this unprecedented crisis? First, I will say the minister has been speaking for eight seconds, so it is difficult to make a strict judgment on direct relevance at that point in a one minute answer. Secondly, um, I'm not willing to rule that a minister who is strictly talking about his conversations or discussions with the Prime Minister is not directly relevant to a question regarding whether he briefed a cabinet, given that the cap Prime Minister is the head of cabinet. However, the, ma answer must be na the answer must be narrow in its scope to that. It is not up to me to instruct a minister how to. It is. It, it, it's not up to me how to. In to instruct a minister how to answer a question, it is up to others to judge or debate after question time. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. As, as I have said, I am not going to allow the Labor Party to try and attempt any suggestion that this government has not been putting its full focus on the management of this entire COVID-19 outbreak, and I have been present at the subcommittee of cabinet meetings since March to discuss on each of the occasions that it has convened, and since July it would be daily or sometimes twice daily to manage the circumstance in Victoria. The outbreak in Victoria has had the full attention of me, my fellow ministers that are involved in that subcommittee of cabinet, and the Prime Minister. On a daily basis. Order, Senator Colbeck. Since the time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final So I presume the question. answer to that question was you never ever have. Um, 
Minister, in light of the unprecedented crisis in residential aged care in Victoria, with the loss, sadly, of more than 328 lives, how can you possibly justify not briefing the federal cabinet about this unprecedented crisis in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, the Labor Party tries to make this something that, that it's not. And as I've said, I am focusing, I am focusing on my job with the ARC, ERC, with the Prime Minister on a daily basis, with the Finance Minister, with the Treasurer, with the Minister for Social Security uh, and anyone else who is seconded to the committee, with the Minister for Health, on a daily basis. Any suggestion that the Labor Party tries to make that this pandemic has not received my full attention, the Prime Minister's full attention and the government's full attention is just not so, Mr President. We have been there every single day to make sure that the resources that need to be brought to bear can be brought to bear and are brought to bear. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government ensuring people with disability and their carers have access to appropriate and accessible information during the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator Chandler for this really important question. You know, clearly, the coronavirus is going to impact disproportionately on certain groups in our community. Um, these groups are more likely to be at risk uh, of contracting the virus and more likely to have poorer health outcomes, and none so more so than many of our people who live with disability. So making sure that people with disability, their families and their carers uh, can access information about such things as preventative measures, good hygiene and where to get the appropriate supports that they might need to get them through the pandemic have never been more important. Uh, and that's why the government has provided additional funding for a disability information hotline specifically directed in providing advice around the COVID-19 pandemic. This free 1800 uh, number is available 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Monday to Friday, and it provides information, it provides referrals, it provides support and emotional support and counselling uh, to people who are impacted uh, by either living with disability or supporting somebody who does live with disability. We've made sure that our staff are highly trained so that they can understand what the person needs and making sure that they can provide them with the information and the support that they may need and making sure that they're directing them to things uh, such as knowing where to get PPE, knowing if they need food relief, where to get that, and just making sure that there's a friendly voice on the end of the phone if these people want someone to talk to. Since April, we're delighted to say that a number of people living with disability, their carers and supporters, have used the services of the hotline. Um, over 2,700 calls have been received. Um, many of them are telephone-based, but also online. And more than 1,700 uh, of these calls have been able to be referred to appropriate services to support these people in the particular areas that they need. And we wanted to make sure that through this process that people who live with disability were able to get the flexibility and choice around the services Order, they needed. Senator Rustin. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the minister for her response. What is the government doing, Minister, to support the mental health and wellbeing of people, including people with disability and their carers, in response to COVID-19? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the government absolutely recognises the significant effect that, that this COVID pandemic is having on the mental health of all Australians. And people who live with disability um, are also um, significantly impacted by this, whether it be through isolation, um, meaning that, uh, that they are they're cut away from or kept away from people that might be supporting them or their loved ones, um, whether it be social distancing um, or a number of other restrictions that are placed on Australians. That's why we have provided additional support to all Australians, but particularly in recent times, an additional $12 million has been made available to make sure that people in Victoria have access. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, to health services. This might be things like Lifeline, it might be Headspace, it might be Kids Helpline, because we want to make sure that the services, for, so that people can seek support and get the counselling they need. This is part of a $500 million mental health package that's been put in place by this government to support mental health during this pandemic. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Minister, into the future, how will the government ensure best practice support for people with disability who have experienced complex trauma? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, clearly positive positive experiences with support workers and carers and, and advocates for people with disability is absolutely critical in reducing or minimising uh, harm and trauma, and it helps to foster a trauma-informed recovery and healing process. Um, we as the government are funding a development of a best practice guide to make sure support for people with disability is appropriately targeted to their experiences to make sure that it is trauma-informed. The government is fund providing funding to Blue Knot, a well-known supporter um, of counselling services, um, to develop this guide. Blue Knot actually has already developed guides, uh, similar types of guides. Uh, in fact, they've published the Practical Guide for Clinical Treatment of Complex Trauma. Uh, the guide will help to build better capacity of organisations and practitioners to help them better understand complex trauma and make sure that the response, particularly to people with disability, is informed by that information. Uh, this work Order. part Senator of— Order. Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Waters online. Thank you very much, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In response to allegations aired earlier this year about branch stacking and misuse of public funds by members of the Victorian Labor Party, the Prime Minister said the issue raised many questions the Leader of the Opposition had to answer. And yet, when allegations of branch stacking and misuse of taxpayer funds by Assistant Treasurer uh, uh, Mr Suka and a senior federal Liberal member were aired this week, the Prime Minister said it was an issue for the Victorian Liberal Party and not his responsibility. Why the double standard on integrity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I can confirm uh, that uh, the matters that were raised earlier this week indeed are appropriately a matter for the Victorian Liberal Party organisation, which I understand has taken uh, appropriate uh, steps uh, in relation to uh, an, an individual that, uh, unlike uh, what was the case with the alternative proposal, it's interesting to see how the Greens are in here pitching for the Labour Party. The Greens are in here pitching for the Labour Party. That's, that's, that's uh, interesting to say. But of course, uh, the, the relevant uh, individuals uh, concerned, as I best remember it. I'm not really all that focused on internal uh, party matters like this. I'm focused on the job that the Australian people want us to do, which is to protect people's health and to protect people's livelihoods through this pandemic. That's what we're focused on. But I can confirm uh, for uh, the good senator uh, that uh, you know, the uh, issues that were raised in relation to internal party matters are indeed matters for the Liberal Party organisation. Uh, to the extent that there were issues raised, uh, about the alleged uh, misuse of taxpayer-funded uh, parliamentary resources. Well, these are matters that uh, both uh, the relevant uh, federal members concerned have referred uh, for independent uh, inquiry uh, by uh, the, uh, the Department of Finance, which is the usual process, which is applied uh, indiscriminately on an entirely non-partisan basis whenever these issues arise, as I'm sure members and senators uh, from all around uh, this and the other chamber will be well aware. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Scandal after scandal in this term of government has shown that the Prime Minister is reluctant to enforce his own prime ministerial, ministerial standards, uh, to lift those standards of behaviour. Will the Prime Minister investigate whether Assistant Treasurer Mr Sukar's actions have breached the ministerial standards? And will he stand Mr Sukar down while doing so? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, no attempt at uh, the Greens trialling their code for, the, uh, for a future coalition with the Labour Party, mm. where no doubt they'll uh, come out and try and harm uh, the economy and jobs again, uh, will uh, distract us from our job, which is to support Australians, uh, to support uh, to protect people's uh, health, to protect people's livelihood through this pandemic and to ensure that we put in place the plan for the strongest possible uh, economic and jobs recovery uh, on the other side. That is, that is what we are uh, focused on. You can order. Sorry, po um, I was reading something. The clerk passed me. Apologies, Senator McKim, on a, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, President. The point of order is relevance. We're now two-thirds of the way through 
the minister's uh, time provided to answer this question. The question uh, was very clear. It was about uh, prime ministerial standards, ministerial standards, and whether Mr. Sukar would be stood down while the prime minister made that assessment. Uh, minister Cormann has gone nowhere near Thank the question you, Senator in Senator his McKim. answer. And I ask Senator you that you remind him of the question. Senator McKim, you reminded the minister of the second part of the question. It did have a preamble. Um, the minister is allowed some discretion in direct, being directly relevant to the preamble as well, but I'll let you remind him of the point of the question. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, it is uh, you know, clearly a, a, a partisan a political a question in relation to party organisational matters. It's interesting that in the middle of a pandemic, a, a senator for Queensland is interested in uh, internal party matters in the state of Victoria. I mean, I let the people of Queensland judge that at the next election. Uh, no doubt that is why the vote for the Greens is particularly weak Order, uh, in senator, that particular state. <laughs> senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, President. Perhaps I'll get an answer to this one. A strong, independent integrity commission is essential if we're going to st uh, stamp out the ongoing scandals that beset this place. How much longer sorry, can the government sorry, delay? I'm, I'm going to ask, because we're past three o'clock, we won't impact the time. I'll ask the minister, um, Senator Waters to start again, um, because the volume in the chamber wasn't as loud as it could be. Senator oh, okay. Waters, could you speak up, if you could, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, President. A strong independent integrity commission is essential if we are to stamp out ongoing scandals in this place. How much longer can the government delay bringing on legislation for a federal corruption watchdog, whether that's my bill, which passed the chamber uh, almost a year ago, or your own bill, which was described as imminent 18 months ago? What more does this government have to hide? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Australia has one of the proudest and best records in the world when it comes to uh, providing open and transparent and accountable government. And I can see Senator McKim uh, sneer at that, but that is a fact. And of course, we are we are committed to pursue further reforms uh, in this in this regard uh, to even further strengthen an already strong uh, position. What I would say, I think the Australian people well understand why uh, over the last six months we have prioritised our crisis response uh, to protect people's lives, to suppress the spread of the virus, to slow down the spread of the virus, to ensure that our hospitals could handle uh, the inflow of patients into the health system, to ensure that we provided the necessary supports. Uh, to Australian businesses, Australian workers and those Australians who lost their jobs. I think Australians understand that there has been a pandemic going on and that uh, clearly it was quite appropriate that in this context we prioritise the uh, many measures that had to be taken as part of a crisis response. I will, and I thank uh, the Senate and uh, ask that further questions thank be placed you. on the notice paper. Senator, Senator Faruqi. Mr President, pursuant to, order, to standing order 164.3, I ask the Minister representing the Minister for Education for an explanation as to why an order for the production of documents agreed to on 16 June 2020 concerning support for international students has not been complied with. On this particular issue, um, oh, sorry, I'm just taking some advice from the clerk. Senator Birmingham on a point of order, I understand. Okay. Thank th th thanks, Mr President. On a point of order. Uh, relating to, uh, to Standing Order 164 Part 3. Uh, it, is, uh, it is, of course, uh, open to a senator to, at the conclusion of question time, ask a question in relation to non-compliance in relation to an order for the production of documents. But I do note that, uh, that Part 3 uh, of Standing Order 164 is very clear that it is, uh, if a minister does not comply, with an order for the production of documents directed to the minister within 30 days after the date specified for compliance of the order. I'd invite you, Mr President, uh, to uh, look at this particular matter uh, in that uh, the question and the order for the production of documents that Senator Faruqi raises indeed has had a response provided to the Senate. Uh, it's a response that identifies that no such documents exist in relation to the order uh, moved by Senator Faruqi and carried by the Senate. Uh, now, Mr President, that is compliance with the order uh, and the standing order that Senator Faruqi raises this matter under requires non-compliance uh, for, uh, for the questioning to be valid. I'm not sure how uh, a minister is meant to provide for compliance uh, where no such documents exist other than to inform the Senate of such.
So, are you speaking on to the point of order, Senator Faruqi, on the point of order? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I contend that the order was not complied with. The order was for any documents created, sent or received by relevant department and ministerial offices relating to a national hardship fund or similar program payment or initiative to support international students during COVID-19. This does not imply that a fund had to be established or in operation. Indeed, the Senate order was intentionally drafted widely to capture any initiative the government may have been working on but did not eventuate. I know for a fact that there are documents that relate to a national hardship fund that fall within the scope of this order because I submitted a freedom of information request to the Department of Education worded similarly to the order relating to the exact same time period which identified about 200 pages of material relevant to the request. Thank, thank you. Um, Sen oh, are you speaking on the point of order? Oh, so I'll just on, can I rule on the point of order? I have to take the opportunity to have some advice. Um, Standing Order 1643 provides opportunities for senators after question time to seek an explanation from a minister if a minister does not comply with an order for documents within a specified period and does not in that time provide to the Senate quote, an explanation of why the order has not been complied with, which the Senate resolves is satisfactory. Although that provision was inserted with the standing orders in 2005, it has only been used on a handful of occasions and its interpretation has not been the subject of any previous rulings. The provisions are, however, analogous to the provisions of Standing Order 74.5, which allow senators to seek explanations for unanswered questions on notice and estimates questions. Early rulings on that standing order established that it ceases to be available once an answer has been provided. Standing Order 1643, in my view, operates in the same way. If a minister has complied with an order for documents, the process set out in the standing order is no longer available, and a senator may not seek an explanation under the order. Now, as I understand it, and I appreciate Senator Faruqi's contribution there, the government's responses to the order are unequivocal in stating that no documents exist that meet the terms of the order. Absent any motion being moved in the Senate to contradict the government's response, I consider it reasonable in my position to accept the government's responses and to conclude that the order has been complied with. I'm not in a position to determine contested claims. If there is a disagreement over the interpretation of an order, as seems to be the case here, from what I've just heard and from the advice I have received, the standing order does not provide a means for determining that disagreement. There are, however, other procedures in the Senate that a senator can use to further pursue the matter. I thank senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Thanks. Senator Gallagher. Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Labor senators uh, today. And uh, thank you. Um, when he, uh, in question time today, the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, admitted that the Morrison government's cabinet has not been briefed or was not briefed about the Victorian outbreak until the 5th of August. That is more than six weeks after initial cases were identified. And on that day, there was already 1,435 COVID positive cases linked to aged care outbreaks. There was nearly 100 facilities impacted. And sadly, on that day, the day the cabinet was first briefed, another 10 Australians died. I would like to extend my condolences to everyone who's been touched by this crisis in aged care through losing loved ones, to those in hospitals, to those battling the virus and to those who've been sick with worry and who haven't been able to see their loved ones. Let's be clear. The Morrison government has responsibility for aged care in Australia and they have failed to protect aged care residents from this virus. This failure hasn't happened overnight. It has been years in the making. The Morrison government has failed by not having the aged care portfolio in the cabinet. It has failed by having review after review but then doing nothing to act on them. It's failed by not dealing with the serious and escalating workforce issues which have been known and which reviews have gathered dust on their desk for years and years. It has failed by cutting billions of dollars in funding over several budgets and then using weasel words to pretend they never did. Well, budget papers don't lie. 
The Morrison government has cut money that was meant to go to the aged care sector. The Prime Minister, as the Treasurer, was the architect of these cuts, and those cuts have taken a fragile system and they have broken it. They have broken it. it there is clearly no redundancy left. The real life experience in Victoria that we have seen play out in heartbreaking scenes where aged care facilities have had no capacity to deal with a virus like COVID-19 when it came into their home. We have seen images of elderly Australians being evacuated from their homes, malnourished, dehydrated, missing medication, soiled, distressed and alone. So don't stand here and tell us how fortunate we have been. Don't say how well we have done. Don't try and shirk responsibility and blame others. People in aged care in Australia today don't need spin and a rewriting of a, or a convenient interpretation of what has happened in Victoria. The facts speak to themselves. From mid-June, when positive cases in Victoria started to rise, what did this government do to protect residents of aged care? They knew they were vulnerable. They knew from what had happened in the Northern Hemisphere when community transmission rates increase, the risk for people in residential aged care increases exponentially. They already knew that. From a handful of cases in early July to 1,000 cases by the end of that month alone, more than 125 facilities with outbreaks, more than 335 deaths and more than 2,000 cases linked to aged care. No matter which way the government tries to spin the crisis in aged care, these facts tell a story of failure. Failure to protect vulnerable citizens from COVID-19 getting into their homes and then failure to stop the spread. The result of a system that remains hidden from public view, housing vulnerable people, the quietest of all Australians, who, after doing their best for this country, have been abandoned by a Prime Minister who is quick to point the finger at others but who clearly didn't do enough quick enough, by a minister clearly without authority or influence, and by a system that has been fractured by neglect, underfunding and the indifference of this government over seven long years. The Royal Commission heard compelling evidence that the system for older Australians is woefully inadequate. That is a quote from a, a report titled Neglect that was given to this government in November last year. You would think it's, the title speaks volumes. And the Royal Commission itself has put in writing that the system is woefully inadequate. They knew this in November. The Royal Commissioners go on to say, many people receiving aged care have had their basic human rights denied. Their dignity is not respected and their identity is ignored. It is most certainly is not a full life. It's a shocking tale of neglect. Well, we say old Australians deserve better than this. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Deputy President, older Australians most certainly do deserve better than this. What we've seen here today is an absolute disgrace and outrage. Absolutely. From the Labor Party coming in here, speaking of cases, uh, people's lives that have, you know, and families that have been devastated, to come in here and make political points off the back of those very, very sad uh, situations and stories is an absolute disgrace, and I am quite set back by this, I've got to say. There have been 335 deaths in our aged care facilities. Now That's a number, but it actually represents individuals. It represents communities and, importantly, it represents families. Families that over the last few months have had a significant amount of grief, significant amount of grief. And they're dealing with that. And to have Labor come in here and drag out these stories and make a political point, conflating two different versions of stories together to make a, uh, a political point against a minister that is, that is uh, actually done uh, a significant amount to ensure that this pandemic— I mean, it is a crisis. It is a crisis that we're dealing with. And to deal with it has been the number one priority of this government. In fact, the Prime Minister has said that this is his number one focus 
right now. It has the focus of this government in ensuring that we can deal with this crisis and this pandemic. In everywhere across the world, when there has been an outbreak, like what we've seen in Victoria, there have always been cases in aged care facilities. And it's the ability to deal with those cases and those outbreaks and deal with them in such a way that you minimise the impact and, importantly, the impact on lives that is important. And if this side were actually serious about what's going on, then they'd actually be asking questions about what we're doing and how we could actually uh, mitigate further the risk that has been caused by the outbreak that's occurred under a Labor government down there in Victoria. The Prime Minister is absolutely committed to ensuring that we are able to deal with this, that the communities that are responsible, that the, the families that are involved are getting the best possible support. All services with an active case of COVID-19 are receiving support from the Australian government, including a single case manager and access to PPE, testing in residential aged care facilities and access to sur a surge workforce and supplementation. We heard the minister explain that in one particular facility they had to replace an entire workforce across that facility in 24 hours. An outbreak occurred that of course went through the workplace. And I want to right now I want to I want to pay tribute to those that are in uh, the healthcare sector and particularly in aged care. My sister works in an aged care facility and I know she turns up to work not knowing what would happen. But bravely fronts up to work knowing that, that, that you know, what's protecting them is a mask or, or a face shield. And they are brave Australians that are doing this. And that support for them is absolutely critical. And we saw in that one facility there in Victoria an entire workforce substituted within 24 hours. We heard before from Senator Gallagher who spoke about so-called cuts that have been made into uh, made in the in the health care, uh, in the aged care sector. Well, it's only it's only Labor that could actually call a billion dollars worth of increases a cut. I mean, Labor's claim has actually been debunked by ABC's fact check. And despite Labor's plans for 387 billion dollars in higher taxes, there was nothing in their plan leading up to the last election that showed any sort of commitment to increasing and supporting the aged care sector like what this government has done. Nothing. And so they've got the goal to be calling these things when they actually have no plan. They've not put forward anything that would suggest that they have a commitment like what this government has got. Labor's hypocrisy is evident, is obvious, obvious at this time with this sort of nonsense that we see coming into this place. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety Interim Report said it was difficult not to be critical of successive governments' failures to fix the aged care system. But this government is committed to working with the Thank sector— Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Minister Colbeck has staked out today that he's simply under political attack and the opposition's uh, questions of him and continual questioning of him is somehow unjustified. Well, this question time we've seen more and more simple facts come out that highlight the incompetence now not only of Minister Colbeck but indeed of the entire government in failing to take account of the grievous situation confronting uh, aged care, particularly in Victoria. We've seen more than 350 deaths, and yet we have done, seen nothing from this government than talk up purported relativities of how well they're doing uh, compared to the rest of the world or, or other parts of, parts of the globe. The simple fact is these deaths were preventable. They were absolutely preventable. They were preventable by this government if they had put in place proper response to what had happened at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and indeed at Newmarch House. And indeed, the Aged Care Royal Commission 
and other incidents that happened in aged care some 12 months ago and before that all highlight how ill-prepared aged care is for these pandemic-type situations. We have a government who has not put in place the measures that would have prevented this. It's all very well for the government to blame uh, Victoria, but the simple fact is this situation is not occurring in all aged care settings. It is occurring in settings where it's got in and where there has been uh, uh, poor control uh, of uh, uh, transmission of the virus. There is a lack of PPE in some of these, these places. There is a lack of training in some of these places. And indeed, what is, I think, most telling of all is the appalling rates of pay that aged care workers doing intimate care support, feeding people, putting to them to bed, changing their clothes, that do not have adequate personal protective equipment, showering them, taking them to the toilet, managing people with dementia in all their daily intimate activities, who do not have adequate personal protective equipment. Now, these are things that should have been a top priority right from the outset in response to Dorothy Henderson Lodge, in response to Newmarch House. The simple fact is, and uh, Senator O'Sullivan should know, should know uh, these issues, that in fact the minimum wage of uh, uh, the, the aged care wage, which is close to the minimum wage, if you uh, currently, earn, uh, currently take home job seeker because you're not earning enough hours and you take on uh, some part-time hours in aged care, then currently you could lose your eligibility for JobSeeker, so there is no incentive to work. And this is indeed another driving force behind uh, the lack of aged care staff in some settings. And the, the government fiddled around with settings uh, within our social security system without actually fixing some of the problems that confront people when it comes to disincentives to work. People are expected to work for some uh, uh, ten dollars an hour after you consider those disincentives to work. This is an appalling state of affairs that this government has failed to take accountability for. We've heard that the Minister for Aged Care has failed to brief the Cabinet. He's briefed the Prime Minister. Well, the Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for the mess in aged care. And, and there are hundreds of grieving families around this nation, not just from those that have died from COVID, but all those who've been locked out uh, of aged care settings in being able to spend uh, the dying days uh, with their loved ones. This is an appalling state of affairs, and the government must show some respect and accountability. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And can I start by saying that the behaviour of the Labor Party in response to aged care deaths has been tawdry, to say the least. Instead of taking the high ground and seeking to find a solution, Labor has taken the well-worn path it always takes and grandstands on other people's misfortunes. Does Labor really think that if it had been in government it could have handled the pandemic any, any better? Of course not. They're not interested in finding solutions. They're only interested in point scoring. And you can take the words of Deputy Chief Medical Officer Nick Coatsworth the, in the, to the Royal Commission. The assertion that there is an attitude of futility towards death in residential aged care in Australia is frankly insulting to the entire Australian community who locked down to prevent deaths amongst our most vulnerable. There are many words used in the Royal Commission witness statements today that perhaps don't reflect the totality of the government's response, both at the federal and state level, to prevent deaths in aged care. The fact is coronavirus is a highly contagious retrovirus with elevated case fatality rates in the elderly and those with comorbidities. The vast majority will get it mildly and get over it, and some may not even realise they had it at all. The containment measures put in place by the Morrison government 
has, some, has been some of the best in the world and have gone a long way to reducing the prevalence of the virus and surge impacts on our hospitals. Not that you would know it if you listened to Labor. Their attacks on Senator Colbeck has been frankly despicable. No one has worked harder than our Prime Minister and our Health Minister the, and, and Richard Senator Colbeck, sorry, in trying to keep Australians safe. And to quote our chief medical, who was our chief medical officer, Brendan Murphy, Australia's overall COVID death rate, as a proportion of cases, is around 1.5%, compared to 15% in the UK and 5% in the USA. Our death rate in aged care across Australia, as a proportion of total aged care residents, is 0.1%. One in a thousand, compared to five per cent in the UK, where really nearly 20,000 deaths have been seen, seen. He also said that no matter how prepared and resourced the aged care sector is, this outbreak will, unfortunately, only finally come under control with the suppression of community transmission. The best way to protect older people is to suppress community transmission. And Labor needs to remember that no one is doing be a better job than that than the Coalition's Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales, who, despite having received over 50 per cent of cases in quarantine from international arrivals, has kept a lid on community transmission. Compare that to Labor's, Labor's Daniel Andrews, whose mismanagement is the root of the com community transmission in Victoria. Do we hear a word out of Labor about that? Of course not. Complete and utter silence. And did Daniel Andrews consult anyone before he pulled out over 100 staff out of St Basil's before provisions were made to find replacement staff? Of course not. It was left to the federal government to come along and clean up the mess left by uh, Daniel Andrews. And I should point out to Senator Gallagher that while we might be responsible for aged care, we're not responsible for health. And if the, uh, Sen, uh, Daniel Andrews has actually consulted the federal government, we might have been able to step in and help out the aged care centre before leaving those people in a more vulnerable state. But that's Daniel Andrews for you. He's the Frank, Frank Sinatra of Australian politics. It's always his way or the highway. Never consults with anyone. Typical Labor. All command and control, no consultation, no consultation, I'll just do it my way. And can I say, as a Queenslander, I want to apologise to other Australians, especially those in northern New South Wales, who have not been able to get access to proper health because of the selfish actions of the Queensland Premier, Anna Palaszczuk, in shutting down the borders. There have been young children in New northern New South Wales who have not been able to access medical uh, resources in Brisbane. I have never, never felt so ashamed to be a Queenslander. What kind of a person puts her own self-interests in front of the health of young Australians? I say it's absolutely shameful. And it's worth pointing out that the Australian government in January. Thank you, Senator okay. Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, sometimes uh, I think the Senate would serve to have a few more minutes from Senator Rennick because the longer he goes, the worse it gets. The worse it gets. Order. By the end of five minutes, he's back on to blaming someone else, the Morrison government's MO. Blaming somebody else for what is a Morrison government responsibility, aged care. That is what we are talking about today. Firstly, can I begin by doing something that Senator Rennick didn't and acknowledging, acknowledging how awful it must be for those families who are grieving, the 328 families who have lost loved ones, to see this debate turn into a blame game from people opposite. I also want to acknowledge the essential workers who are day in, day out working in aged care, and I thank them for taking the time 
spending the time to speak to people like me and other senators and other members of parliament to explain to us exactly what is going on. Because if you didn't listen to those workers directly and you listened to those opposite, you'd think everything is fine. But when you speak to these workers directly, they will tell you that this has been coming for a long time, that things are very desperate, and they are at their absolute wit's end because they love the jobs they do. They love the residents that they care for, but they are not being given the appropriate resources, and they haven't been given the appropriate resources for an incredibly long time from this government. We know that the 328 families who are grieving deserve answers from this minister, from Minister Colbeck and from the Prime Minister. So no, Labor's not going to apologise for asking questions about the deaths of 328 Australians. That is not disgraceful or despicable. Those, answers, those questions need to be asked and they need to be answered. But when we ask these questions, the minister isn't able to answer them. He doesn't have the figures, he doesn't have the detail, or he reje rejects the premise of the question. That is not good enough for these families. We know that the government didn't have a plan for aged care, yet there were many warning signs and opportunities which would have alerted this minister to the very serious consequences of his inaction. We know that Peter Rosen, QC, revealed in the Royal Commission neither the Commonwealth Department of, of Health nor the aged care regulator developed COVID-19 plans specifically for the aged care. The very first case of COVID-19 at Newmarch House was reported on April 11, and the government failed to act for weeks after more than 60 cases of COVID were reported among staff and residents and 16 lives were lost. In April, in April, they had the warning sign that they needed, that this would be devastating if it ever infected an aged care facility. And yet, after that, they still did not develop a plan. The lack of urgency is staggering. The Morrison government is responsible for aged care, but they failed to protect aged care residents, not only when it comes to this crisis, but before this crisis started. And on the minister's performance today, can I just say this? The minister and those opposite refuse to accept the premise of questions that we're asking or even that we're asking those questions in the first place. Somehow, even asking those questions is too much for this minister to take. This minister says that we are very fortunate. We are in a much better position than other countries. That the minister said that I would rather be in Australia than anywhere else when it comes to aged care. Well, ask the families of these 328 people who have died in aged care. Ask these workers if they would rather be somewhere else. That is a question you, that Senator this Green, minister your needs time to answer. Has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Six months ago, the Prime Minister. Senator Lambie, you need to indicate to the Senate what you're doing. Oh, sorry. So I move to take note of of the answers. Thank you. Answers, answers from who? To my question. Sorry. To I'm sorry. Who answers to take no, uh, note? To who? Which, which minister? Uh, minister Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Off Six months ago, the Prime Minister announced he was going to give us something bigger and better than a royal commission into veteran suicides. But it wasn't ready to go yet, he said. So he said, while we wait, let's start with an interim commissioner instead. Someone who would start immediately, somebody who would report within 12 months. Now today, 200 days later, nobody has started. There's no report six months away. There is no interim commissioner at all. 
Two things are possible. Either the interim commissioner was ready to go immediately or they weren't. Imagine you're running late for work. Your boss calls you asking, where are you? You apologise. Sorry, sorry, mate. I'm on my way. You say to your boss, I'm leaving immediately, right away. Six months later, your boss calls you asking where you are. You say to your boss, guess what? I haven't left yet, mate, but I'm getting ready to go. I'll be there soon. You reckon you'd still have a job? I can't turn up to work 200 days late and expect there'll be a job for you when you finally arrive. Not only has our interim commissioner not turned up, we don't even know who, who it's supposed to be and who, is, who should have turned up and who hasn't. If a person goes missing for six months, you'd assume that they're long dead and buried. The interim commissioner has been missing for six months and nobody has noticed. You want to know why? Because this isn't a job anybody got asked to fill in the first place. That's reality. Instead of doing what hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Australians have begged for it to do, the Morrison government has gone and done something completely different. Not just something different, something worse. Are we surprised? He leads the same Liberal Party that's been waiting over a year to respond to the Productivity Commission's scathing criticism of the Department of Veterans Affairs because he cares so much about veterans. That's a report that said the Department of Veterans Affairs was so unfit for purpose that we should just tear it down and start again. And I can assure you nothing has changed. It's the same Liberal Party that sat on independent review saying Teddy Sheehan deserved Victoria Cross for nearly a year, denying a hero the honour he deserves because they didn't think it was a priority. We've got a government that doesn't have a national commissioner, doesn't have an interim commissioner, doesn't have a terms of reference, doesn't have a starting date, doesn't have a final reporting date. But what it does have is an absolute certainty that whatever they're going to do, no matter what, will be bigger and better than a Royal Commission. Six months we've been waiting for the, Royal, for the interim commissioner to start immediately. When the government claimed it was ready to go immediately, it wasn't even ready to pick someone who's ready to go. It had nobody lined up. It had no terms of reference lined up. It had absolutely nothing. No work, no substance, no nothing. The National Commissioner doesn't have the power, flexibility, independence or authority of a Royal Commission. It's a Commissioner who's been granted the stamp of approval from the Australian Defence Force and the Department of Veterans Affairs, the very institutions that an independent Royal Commission would examine. You don't give witnesses the ability to choose the questions they're asked. You don't give the Department of Veterans Affairs or the Australian Defence Force the ability to choose the questions they're asked either. The fact we've done that is reason enough to oppose it. Since February, we've been, we've been waiting for the, for the interim commissioner. But what's more disturbing is that you'll get a commission, you'll get commission that's a hack job instead of a royal commission that's the real deal and that should have been given to the veterans in the first place. I've got to put the question by Senator Lambie. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, I rise to take note of Minister Birmingham's answer representing the Minister for Education. Yes, which hypocrites got free uni education and are now trying to double the cost of degrees? At least 16 members of the government, including the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Health Minister, the Skills Minister and the Communications Minister. Every one of them was at uni while it was free. But they're planning to hike fees, condemn students to decades of debt cut up to $900 million from teaching and learning and punish struggling students, all while youth wage growth is the flattest in history and unemployment is skyrocketing. The hypocrisy is gobsmacking, but the problems don't stop there. It won't create nearly enough new student places to match population growth and meet new demand due to recession. The billions in student debt will disproportionately hit women. For regional universities, it's not just billions in extra debt for students, it's billions not being spent in those communities. The government's own officials admit the plan won't even encourage students to study the courses that they claim they care about. But it will encourage unis to enroll students in high-fee courses instead of STEM. Finally, it does nothing whatsoever to save uni jobs or fix the research crisis. The good news is that the Senate can block this unfixable mess. I urge my colleagues on the crossbench to do just that. The Greens will be voting against this bill with all our might. And you can help by calling and emailing crossbench senators right now. Question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.
We will now go to notices of motion to be given for another day. Are there any notices of motion, Senator Hanson Young? Uh, it was a withdrawal. Oh. That I thought that was. This is a good time. I'm the clerk has said, said to me, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. It's just the disallowance that I gave notice of uh, yesterday that was being withdrawn. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Are there any other notices? There being none, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on 18 July 2020 of Colin Victor James Mason, a senator for the state of New South Wales from 1978 to 1987. I call the leader of the government in the Senate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of uh, Senator Colin Victor James Mason. Leave is granted, Senator Corman. I thank the Senate. Uh, I move that the Senate records uh, its sorrow at the death on 18 July 2020 of Colin Victor James Mason, former Senator for New South Wales, places on record its appreciation for his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Colin Mason uh, lived a long and remarkable life. <coughs> he was a <coughs> respected journalist, author, politician <coughs> and family man. Colin was the ABC's first foreign correspondent to Asia and one of the first Australian Democrats elected to the Australian Senate. His life was full of uh, accomplishments stretching from New Zealand to Australia and Southeast Asia through the halls of Parliament House and uh, into this chamber. Colin was born in Auckland on 28 October 1926. He studied journalism at the University of New Zealand Victoria College in Wellington. Upon graduating, he started his career as a journalist where he very best in his future endeavours. Senator Mackenzie. Much, Mr President, and I rise with some short remarks from the National Party uh, on the retirement of Senator Di Natale and associate ourselves, obviously, um, with the comments from um, the government leader, Senator Cormann. Um, it might seem a little odd, Senator Di Natale, that the Nationals um, wish you all the very best in your retirement, um, but we really do. Um, Senator Di Natale and I arrived here in the same batch of senators representing the same fabulous state um, and sharing a passion for the great code uh, being AFL, which I know he's looking forward um, to getting the boots on with the boys uh, after today. And it's a great privilege to serve um, uh, the, the great state of Victoria from what is often seen, and to be fair, other than probably two instances in our entire career, um, that we're at polar opposites um, politically. <laughs> but I think it's a great testament to this institution, to the people that are called to serve here, irrespective of their political persuasion, that at a time of a new senator's arrival uh, and a senator's deciding to retire that we come together as an institution and respect their contribution because we recognise a cohort of Australian people sent them to this place to represent that set of values. And as uh, violently opposed to most of your values, uh, <laughs> Richard, um, the Nationals have been, and I know Senator Canavan recalls um, a time he offered his Star Adani T-shirt uh, as a jersey swap with your Stop Adani uh, T-shirt after a Q&A appearance. Um, so there is some friendly banter, etc. But we are here to do a serious things and to stand up for our values. But to be able to do that respectfully, uh, and to acknowledge that we each bring um, a sense of purpose and a sense of um, drivenness knowing that we're representing the needs and interests of people that have sent us here. So yes, we've disagreed on the role of coal and the mining industry in the Australian economy. Uh, we've disagreed on firearm regulation. We've disagreed on whether a sugar tax is the best way to combat um, the obesity epidemic. Um, but we have agreed that a pluralist, pluralist democracy is um, the best place to raise our children uh, and to do our very, very best 
in, in uh, seeing out our service to our state. Um, I would like to thank uh, the former leader of the Greens, Senator De Dina Tali, for um, sensibly assisting Australian agriculture um, get the workforce it needed and also getting a cool 100 mil out of Senator Cormann for a great program being Landcare, uh, which is a great pragmatic um, way to support conservation programs in rural and regional communities, with community partnering with farmers uh, to get great environmental outcomes. I recall that Senator Di Natale at the time said um, around seasonal workforce uh, in that debate that if we do not remain competitive in this area, then Australian agricultural businesses are going to lose out. So thank you, because that was a real point of crisis for rural and regional um, communities. Um, I wish he'd support other regional job providing industries out in the regions. And, um, mining obviously is a key part of that and is something that we as a party uh, pursue uh, ad nauseum uh, and with good cause. But Senator Di Natale is also a great advocate of the role of sport in um, the broader Australian community um, as an integral part of the national character. Uh, and I loved his quote that AFL, in my home state of Victoria, the AFL occupies a space somewhere between sport and religion, and he's right. Um, and I hope he gets to enjoy a lot more of that in his time off. Um, so thank you for your service. Senator Dean Tully, I hope you enjoy some time with your family out in rural and regional Victoria, the South, great southwest. I'll send you a membership form, a bit of time on the land out in the community. You might uh, appreciate the National Party's contribution here, but um, thank you for your service. The battle of ideas is so important, um, and we on our side and in our party absolutely value diversity of ideas, of which you've been a key contributor. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters has requested to go next, and I'm going to go to Senator Waters. I appreciate there are some time pressures. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. Um, and I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens with um, a real sadness to farewell a dear friend of ours, Senator Richard Di Natale. We're sad to lose him from our party room, but we are so happy to see the spring in his step and the ease with which a smile comes to his face these days. Um, and after 10 years in this place and five of them as the leader of a political party, it's no mean feat to retain your humanity, uh, your sense of humour, um, your sense of perspective and your compassion uh, for the world and for others. Um, Richard is a truly remarkable human being and I think I speak for many people, certainly I speak for everyone in our party room in saying that we're going to miss him dearly. He's a dear friend to all of us, and I think he has made an enormous improvement to the culture of the parliament and to this chamber. Um, I was really honoured to serve as his deputy leader, and I'm really sorry about the Section 44 thing, Richard, <laughs> um, for all of the stress that that caused you in what was a torrid time, um, but another situation that you handled with grace and with just an impeccable calmness and kindness. Um, Richard's gone through some of the amazing achievements that he has been proud to, um, to deliver in his time as leader of the Greens. I'm conscious that Richard has to leave um, in, in about 15 minutes, so I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief because I know many of our other um, Greens team want to say their farewells as well. Um, but indulge me, the first time I met Richard was in 2007 um, when we were both candidates to become senators. We both missed out that time around, but we bonded um, actually over some um, terrible media that we both had at the time on a dodgy website. But perhaps I don't need to go into the detail of that. Um, but we then uh, entered the Senate in the class of 2010 together. Um, and have, I've continued to make wonderful um, memories of my parliamentary work with Richard, including eating Italian in Paris when we both went to the climate conference in 2015. Of course, we were eating Italian in Paris. It was Richard. Um, and then both, of course, meeting um, David Attenborough at that same visit and, and both being completely starstruck and, and tripping over our tongues. Um, getting to see his farm and to just watch the, the ease and the loveliness of, of he and his family 
uh, together, getting to see a terribly bleached Great Barrier Reef um, on a trip that we both took after, I think it was the first bleaching event. There was then a subsequent one the following season um, and just sharing the grief of um, the starkness of that completely destroyed coral reef um, is another experience that I won't forget. Look, Richard's just an all round decent bloke and I, and I couldn't make a final contribution without acknowledging that I think everybody's mum is in love with him. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's not just my mum, Richard. So, the, you know, the Hansard has to reflect that. He really has a warmth um, and a good sense that I think encouraged people to uh, really consider what the Greens stand for and to, and to give us um, a chance and to trust us with their vote. Um, his, his achievements have been impressive. He's listed many of them, um, championing marriage equality, uh, working for Medivac legislation, um, fighting for uh, an independent federal anti-corruption uh, watchdog, that money for land care, uh, leading our party to our second highest vote um, at an election in our history. Uh, the list could go on, but fundamentally, Richard is an incredibly decent human being. He is um, he's a really good person and we will miss his contribution um, and his, his considered uh, wisdom in our party room. I do also have a message from our uh, new leader, the wonderful Adam Bant, to convey to you and on the hand side, Richard. Um, Adam says, thanks for your amazing service to our movement over so many years. We're so lucky to have had you as a Greens warrior. You leave a great legacy behind and I'm sure there's much more to come. We can't wait to see what you do next, but hopefully it involves a bit more surfing, a bit more time with the family and a lot fewer late night phone hookups. We will miss you. Indeed, we will miss you, but we look forward to a lot more catch ups outside this crazy life. Um, lots more pizza and probably um, some beer, but I'm bidding for Nonna's Arancini balls because they're delicious. Can I sign off by saying um, thank you so, so much to Lucy and to Luca and Benji, your family, for, um, for sharing you with the nation for the last 10 years. We know what a sacrifice that is and we're deeply grateful for it. We're sorry to miss you and lose you, Richard, but we're so happy that your family's got you back. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, thanks President. I, I, given the time pressure, Senator Patrick, I'm going to allow his party colleagues to contribute. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, President. Well, Richard, a cracking speech, mate, right up there uh, with some of your best work. And there have been um, some absolute beauties. My favourite was the uh, hang your heads in shame speech, uh, otherwise known as the you should all be ashamed of yourselves speech, uh, otherwise known as you're all a disgrace um, speech. And Richard is um, far too modest to quote his own speeches, so I'm just going to quickly uh, regard the Senate with a snippet of, um, of his uh, probably most famous speech in a place. The context was the Liberals were um, uh, embroiled in uh, a leadership challenge which uh, ultimately saw the demise of uh, former Prime Minister Turnbull. And this is what Richard had to say at that time. It's a disgrace. It's utterly shameful. We haven't had a stable government in this country for a decade now. I've got a 10-year-old boy. He's seen half a dozen different prime ministers. We have politicians in this joint who are more concerned about themselves, about their own self-interest, than they are with governing the country. Just think, while the Liberal Party has been tearing themselves apart, we've got 100 per cent of New South Wales that's in drought right now. We've got the Great Barrier Reef on the brink of collapse. We've got a 12-year-old girl who's setting herself alight in Nauru. We've got kids who are in a catatonic state because they've given up hope, locked away in those offshore hellholes. What's the Liberal Party doing? Focusing on vengeance, on payback focusing on themselves. We've got people who can't afford to pay their medical bills. We've got young people being priced out of an education. There are 100,000 homeless people in Australia. There are women who fear going home tonight because one woman a week is killed at the hands of a violent partner. And what have we got? We've got this spectacle, this disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourselves. And boy, you did tee off there, Richard, and you really spoke on behalf of the millions of Australians. Who, uh, who supported uh, all of those things that you mentioned uh, and were ashamed at the spectacle that was going on in this place.
Now, Richard would never forgive me if I didn't rebut uh, Senator Wong's political comments in her response to Richard's uh, speech and, in fact, her revisionist history. Uh, let's face it, the CPRS, the Continue Polluting Regardless Scheme, was uh, not a better scheme than the clean energy package. It was a much, much worse and browner scheme. If the clean energy package was still in place, Australia would be emitting far, far less than we currently are, whereas if the Continue Polluting Regardless scheme was still in place, Australia would be emitting far, far more than we are now, having not had a price on carbon for so many years, thanks to the Liberal and National parties. But Richard, I want to say uh, you have been an awesome senator, a fantastic and inspirational leader, and you always, always did what was in the best interests of the Greens and the millions of people who voted for us during your time in this place, and you did so even at significant personal cost. But more importantly, than that is your legacy as a truly beautiful human being who never lost your humanity, you never lost your humility, you didn't fall for the ego traps that get so many in this place, and you displayed always loyalty and consideration for others, and above all else, you are a truly honourable person. So, mate, it's time for you to get a few more waves down around the Bells region. Uh, your dodgy knee permitting, and I hope it's continuing to heal up. But more importantly, I'm sure you'll agree to spend much more time now with your beautiful family, who you love so much. So go well, all the best, and uh, I'll see you for a few beers soon. I might take Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. Richard. Over the last few weeks, I've seen you on Zoom, and I've seen a few videos of yours on Facebook. And I must say, you look happier, more relaxed, and carefree than I have seen you look in the last few years. And it's made it very clear to me that the decision you made to step out of parliamentary politics was absolutely the right one at this time. And you deserve to be relaxed and carefree after dedicating a decade of your life to our party in the broader progressive movement as a Green Senator, and not to mention years of service before that to the party. And you have my utmost respect for your passion and your humanity. I will never forget the very warm welcome that you and your team gave me when I joined the Senate two years ago. And it was your encouragement and your warmth that made me very quickly a part of our team. I've always found it very easy and very easy to be open with you as well. Because that's such an important quality in a high pressure, high stress environment that we all work in. We've had our many agreements and we also had our disagreements. But you know what? We've never swept issues under the carpet and we've always come out stronger the other end. And I thank you for always listening to the other's point of view. The 2019 election, I must say, um, was a highlight for me, the campaign. The hard work of campaigning was done with real co collaboration, with real friendship, and with a lot of fun along the way as well. And I'm so proud that together we really pushed the boundaries on social justice and on environmental justice. And you should be very proud of your leadership during that campaign that won us so many hearts and minds um, and all our senators back here. But one of the things that I will always remember you and thank you for from the bottom of my heart is speaking so unashamedly about tackling racism. You were never shy of calling out xenophobia, Islamophobia and racism. As a Muslim migrant woman of color, who regularly experiences the searing heat of open racism, the dog whistling against migrants, and the damaging impacts of hate speech. I know speaking out is never easy, but you have done it with gusto, knowing you always had my back, and the back of other communities of color was both reassuring and very encouraging. 
and our party is now well set to continue to unapologetically demand racial justice. I'm sure that once you've had a break, Richard, we'll see some more wild and wonderful things from you, and I look forward to it. In the meantime, enjoy some very well-deserved downtime with your family. Thank you, Richard, and Khuda Hafiz, till I see you again. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to um, associate myself with the comments of, made by my colleagues in relation to Richard's departure uh, today. Um, I'm sad that Richard's not here to be able to um, experience it in person and to be able to give his valedictory um, in this place. Um, having said that, of course, um, Richard's always been um, uh, somebody who hasn't let his technophobia get in the way of being able to do his job. And I think this uh, particular um, uh, contribution and his valedictory um, is testimony to that. Um, Richard, I first uh, met you, of course, in the 2007 election campaign, and um, we don't have to go into all the gory details, but I was a brand new mum with a, um, a baby on, uh, in my arms who was um, five weeks old, and we were in Tasmania uh, at a um, kind of crash course on uh, Senate election uh, campaigning, and you were very helpful. Um, it was one of those things that, you know, travelling around this country with kids is really difficult. And that was my first experience, five weeks on, as a new mum, um, having to manage that. And you were right there, um, helping all the way. And I think that is testimony to how you have approached uh, you, all of your time uh, in this place, uh, serving not just um, your community, but uh, serving us as a party. And I know the contribution that you made to the Australian Greens beyond uh, the official leadership um, requirements has been enormous and very, very long-standing. Of course, Richard first ran for the seat of Melbourne um, long before he ran for the Senate. And uh, so there's kind of this, uh, he, he ran election after election until he got there. He was determined uh, to get to this place. Um, he missed out in 2007 in the Senate race uh, by a whisper. He knows what it's like to get very close, to work very hard and not um, get the prize at the end of it. But once he was here in 2010, one of the proudest moments I know, um, experiencing um, the passage of that clean energy legislation, I remember how ecstatic Richard was, we all were, that we were finally getting climate action um, delivered in this place. And uh, it's, to, it's the testimony of the fact that we did very well in that election campaign, that we were in um, uh, that uh, position to uh, share um, in some of those decisions of uh, the Gillard government, that we were actually able to make um, those changes. And um, Richard's always remained committed to that. That if you come to this place, if you work really hard as a political party to get yourself elected, you've got to be able to be practical and you've got to be able to look for the right outcomes. The balance with all of that, of course, is maintaining your principles and maintaining your commitment uh, to uh, the people who put you there. And I think Richard has always spoken very well about the need to be pragmatic, the need to get outcomes, but also uh, that uh, you don't undermine. Uh, or forget about why you're here and the real core reason um, of uh, the change that you want to make. Um, Richard, thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership. Um, it's been um, an absolute hoot at times. It's been intense at others. Um, but your um, ability just to go with it and to keep going until the job was done, I think, um, is testimony to the type of character and man that you are. Um, just briefly, uh, before you go, I've got to say, sorry the AFL Grand Final won't be held in Melbourne this year. Uh, you know, let's bring it, let's bring it to Adelaide and the Adelaide Oval. And I'm happy, I'm happy for you to have a spare, uh, to, to sleep in the spare room at the house if you're desperate to go into quarantine just to watch it. Um, it's been a, a wonderful journey uh, working alongside you, uh, with your leadership. And um, sorry you're not here for us to celebrate. Uh, now with a couple of drinks. Thanks. Senator Seward. I'll keep my um, words short because I know there's a number of people that want to speak and I have already expe expressed to Richard uh, my deep respect 
um, and appreciation for the leadership that he has shown over the years. One of the, issue, one of the areas that I haven't mentioned previously and that hasn't really been mentioned here, although people have, are, have articulated that, Richard, you uh, have worked in Aboriginal health for a long time, and, and it's one of our shared passions is ensuring that we are addressing Aboriginal health in this country. And I know that you spent a, lo a lot of your early uh, years in medicine working in Aboriginal communities, and I've had the pleasure of visiting some of those communities with you. I've seen the way that people responded um, to your deep commitment your passion and your care for the issue and your care for people. And it's been a pleasure to work with you on those issues. There's so many issues that you have uh, covered and that you have worked on. Um, I really appreciate the privilege of having worked with you of your, the leadership that you have shown. You are unfailingly supportive. Um, you always responded in a calm manner, manner whenever any crisis was uh, running, uh, other than in football. Um, watching the football with Richard <laughs> is uh, a, an experience. Um, Richard is absolutely passionate about Richmond. Uh, I'm a Dockers supporter, so there's at least one thing that we have never seen eye to eye on. You will now be able to watch um, a lot more football, because I know that you will have missed um, a lot. I've actually never seen you happier, really, other than when you're with your family, than when you are watching uh, football and shouting at the screen. It reminded me very much of my father-in-law's response when he's watching the Eagles not do very well. Um, so thank you for all the work that you have committed. I've also got a very personal thank you when I, I'm trying to say this without tearing up, um, when I, and you know what I'm talking about, when I um, uh, got some very terrible news, you walked up to me and you just hugged me. And it made so much, it, it helped me so much. But it also, when I was sitting here thinking about that, reminded me about the fact that we can't hug our loved ones as much as we want to at the moment. And it, it, the power of that, is actually really important and I'd like us all to remember that in terms of what that means in these circumstances and it also means that I can't hug you now as I would do if we were all together and celebrating the amazing, amazing work that you have done in this place, which so many people have already articulated. So thank you for your years of commitment. Thank you for the decade, decade commitment you have made. I've watched you go greyer. I can hide mine. Um, but I've watched you go greyer. Um, I've, I've witnessed your love and support for your family, and I'm so glad you'll be able to spend more time with them. And I also thank them for the sacrifice they made in letting us have you here in this place. I'm going to take the rare opportunity to make a brief observation myself, if I can, from the chair. Um, when any senator is here for a time, they all make their mark. But Party leaders make more of a mark because of the consent of their colleagues that uh, elect them uh, and the role that they play in this place. I, I must confess, I had first met Richard a long time ago. I had the um, privilege of him well, running in the seat that I was a voter in for many, many times in the state seat of Melbourne. Um, and I must confess I didn't vote for Richard, but that won't surprise him. But um, when um, Senator Hanson Young mentioned that he missed out by a whisper in 2007, indeed he did, there was 0.78% separating myself, David Feeney and Richard Di Natale, and he just missed out on that last spot. What I will say I noticed at that time, living in that area, um, is that I don't have to share someone's political views to um, admire the fact that he played, a, in what my view as an outsider, was a strong role in building the Greens um, as a political movement in the inner suburbs of Melbourne as they were growing. He was there in the early days. I remember when they won their first mayoralty. Um, I think it was the city of Yarra and he was one of the people involved in building a political party. Now, civic involvement is something that I think we can all say is something we wish more people would undertake. So that in itself, building a political movement, um, is something that strengthens our body politic uh, and it strengthens democracy in this country. Um, 
I don't mean to sound trite, but I want to be brief. In many, this, way we, this place we all share a similar aspiration in so many ways. We want to see a society that provides opportunity. We want to see a society that allows people to be healthy um, in a better lived environment. We, we disagree on the means very strongly. We disagree sometimes on the priorities. Um, but importantly, Richard's represented a shared commitment to this place as the way to resolve those. Um, this place as a parliament, a national parliament, and as I've said before, this place is a Senate that represents a much more diverse set of views than the other place and plays a unique legislative role in that important aspect of compromise on which all democracy has to be based. Um, so we don't have to share views, we don't have to share a starting point, but sharing a process and a commitment to civic involvement, citizen engagement and this parliament is something very, very important. Um, I might also say that um, I can't really apologise, but if I had to pick someone I was going to have to ask to leave the chamber, it wasn't going to be Senator Dinatale at any point. Um, and he was very good natured about a very difficult time, um, because I know that that was a moment of very strong feelings in the Senate. Uh, and I do know he genuinely meant the views that he expressed, and I understand why he did. Um, but sometimes being in the chair is not easy. Um, I'll conclude by saying um, when I had an illness, Richard contacted me a few times. I've always found him a profoundly decent person who cares for his colleagues, as those closest to him have, have said. Um, and I'm not quite 50, but I've obviously made the same decision. Um, and I would just say to him, very best wishes for yourself, Lucy, and your boys um, after leading a political party, which is an extraordinary commitment uh, in our national parliament with the kilometres travelled and the time away from home. Um, I hope that they uh, have so much more opportunity to share the time that your colleagues have benefited from over the last decade. Senator, oh, sorry, I've got, oh, sorry, Senator Rice, I didn't see you there waving earlier. I would have let you go first. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. And I will also be brief. Look, I really did want to take the opportunity to thank Richard as a friend, as a colleague, as a leader, and not just over his decade in this place, but for the decade in the party beforehand. And sort of as a fellow Victorian senator and a fellow Victorian long standing member of the Greens to have worked side by side with Richard for all that time, it's been really special because of Richard's collaborative approach. Richard, your integrity, your respect, your humanity, and basically your love for people and the planet and your willingness to just work together with people and to have retained all this through a decade in this place, which is a massive achievement. And Senator Seawitt talking about Richard's hugs brought to me too, just remembering when I got my tragic news last September, um, within minutes of Richard being in my office and just enveloping me in a, in a massive bear hug. Um, I want to thank you, Richard, for all of your achievements in this place, which we have, you know, you've talked through and other people have talked through. One that hasn't been mentioned is your love for our forests and your love and your passion for the future of the critically endangered Leadbeater's possum. I've had the great privilege of being the forest spokesperson for the Greens in my time in this place. But I knew Richard was just as much with me there in the forests and making sure that actions were happening to be protecting our precious wildlife. And then I want to finish by just thanking you for all of your unseen work. You know, having been side by side with you, seeing it um, to some extent going on. I mean, our party went through some tough times in your years as leader. Um, things like you know the, our troubles in Victoria, and so being there and seeing all the massive work that you did, and how you handled those crises with your your trademark fairness and respect, I mean, bringing people together, and so the Greens, this Parliament, our country, our planet, is in better shape because of your contribution and bringing all of those wonderful characteristics. To this place, and so I really want to thank you for it. And good luck. It's going to be um, terrific for you and for Lucy and for Ben and for Luke to be able to spend more time together. And just good luck with everything that you do from here on. Thank, thank you, me. Senator Rice. I'm going to give the call to Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. 
the, the first time I went surfing with Richard at Bell's Beach, he, he lent me a surfboard. And I remember we paddled out and it was, it was actually a pretty big day. And surfing Bell's, is, it's a bit like a giant football field. You've got to paddle about 100, 100 metres to get out to where you catch a wave. And I remember we were about three quarters of the way out and this giant set of waves started appearing on the horizon. And I didn't know if Richard could surf. And I just remember him seeing scraping over this giant wave, like trying to get over it as, as quickly as possible. And I thought, right I'm in the right spot here. So I turned my board around and I, I paddled really hard and I remember dropping down the face of this giant wave. And just out of the corner of my eye, I spotted this blurred motion. And I thought, crikey, here goes. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kill someone because I just dropped in on someone else's wave. And it's turned out I didn't hit this person, but I don't know how I didn't. And when I popped up, I got thrown around for a couple of minutes and paddled out the back and it was Richard. He, he wasn't actually scraping over the wave. He turned around at a better spot than me and had taken off. And I nearly committed a homicide for my uh, fellow party room member. Um, but actually, that's quite symbolic for me because when Richard started as leader, the day he started as leader, I gave him my, fam my favourite picture of a surf of a wave and a surfer on a wave, and it was Bell's Beach. And I think it was one of the, one of the biggest waves ever recorded uh, at Bell's Beach. And I said to him, mate, you keep this, stick it on your desk, and every time you feel like this, this job's overwhelming you, just have a look at that wave and, and have a think about, you know, what's going through that surfer's mind. And I know there's a lot of parallels. Just stay in front of that white water and stay on the face and go really fast and make sure it doesn't catch up to you. And, mate, I know it's been a really tough a tough few years and, and I would say this has been the most turbulent probably period in our, in our nation's parliament. And you've had your hand, um, you've had your hand on the rudder for our party in some really, really big storms and you, you've got us through those rough years. And, yeah, thank you for talking about some of the things in the Senate today, mate. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. We've achieved a lot. Uh, and, you know, and, and I think um, Sarah's point is a really important one. Sometimes we do have to focus on uh, that mixture between pragmatic, pra pragmatism and, uh, and politics and, and get outcomes. And, yeah, mate, um, I'm looking forward to surfing a lot more with you at Bells Beach and spending more time with you on the farm. And I hope you bring your kids and Lucy down to Tassie, mate. And um, I'm sure our friendship's going to endure for some time to come. All the best, mate. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson and Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, I'll say something very, very briefly. Uh, uh, Richard uh, was, a, was a good bloke, is a good bloke. And uh, yeah, no, but he's, he's leaving this place. So uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't always like uh, Richard's ideas, but I did really like the precision and the passion with which he delivered those ideas in this chamber. Uh, life in here is a blur. It's hard to remember all the things that, 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 uh, that go on. And uh, People talked about the Senate sleepover. Um, I was in the back rooms. Uh, people may well in this place remember uh, Nick Xenophon wearing his pyjamas into the chamber, and, uh, and that might strike as, a, as one of those things that you remember. Um, I wasn't here, but I was the person that did the very, very late night run to, uh, to Kmart to get the, uh, the pyjamas from Bell Conan. Um, uh, it was about two o'clock in the morning or something. So you do, there are things that you remember in this place. And uh, uh, one of the things I'm going to remember is the day uh, that Richard uh, was asked to leave the chamber. And um, I say that noting that it's been mentioned by a few other people. And I say that very respectfully. I like a bit of public interest trouble being caused. And, uh, and I will remember that. Uh, good luck, and I wish you the best. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Is this on the valedictory, Senator O'Sullivan? I think that concludes the uh, valedictory. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution. We're going to go back to the urgency motion, and I'm going to call uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this matter of public urgency brought before the chamber uh, by Senator Lyons, yourself. Uh, 
Look, frankly, all this motion does is play politics with the issue. There is absolutely no substance behind it, none whatsoever. What we saw in this chamber uh, today in question time and also yesterday was nothing but a disgrace, a disgrace by those opposite. And that same attitude is reflecting in the wording of this motion. You're playing politics with people's lives. There is nothing that you will not seek to do to gain mileage out of. So let's look at the facts. When Labor left office, total aged care spending was $13.3 billion. This year it's $22.6 billion, increasing to $25.4 billion by 2022-23. This is an increase of $1 billion a year. I repeat, an increase of $1 billion a year. And even your mates over at the ABC have fact-checked these claims and have, in fact, disproven them. But in addition to this, there is something quite amazing about your claims. When we went to the election last year, you took a suite of measures to the Australian pe people which would have resulted in $387 billion in new taxes. Yet, you had, even though you had a plan to increase taxes, you had no plan for aged care. $387 billion in new taxes, yet nothing for the aged care system in this nation, which you continue to deride. You had no plan for home care places, no plan for aged care workforce, no plan for residential aged care, and yet you come into this chamber and pretend to claim the high ground. You have suddenly realised that we have an aged care system in this country. And what you have done since the election, what have you done since the election? You have kept quiet on aged care and you still have no plan and you still have no commitment. It is this government that has increased funding for aged care. It is this government who has come to the table with a plan for aged care. And it is this government who have admitted that we can and should do better. And this is why that this government, the Morrison government, has initiated the Royal Commission into Aged Care. And that is why we have responded to the findings as soon as issues have been identified. We haven't waited. We've responded as soon as those issues have been identified. And each and every year under this government, home care packages have increased. Residential care places have increased. The total funding is up. When you left office, there were 60,308 home, uh, 60, home care packages, but this will increase by 170 per cent to 164,135 places by 2022-23. Corresponding funding will also increase by 258 per cent <coughs> over the same period. The number of people in home care national prioritisation system has also decreased by 20 per cent over the previous 12-month reporting period. You also speak about the aged care workforce. Well, our commitment to this area has been clear. Work continues to progress through Aged Care Industry Workforce Council and will continue to progress reforms and invest in the critical skills our aged care sector needs. Where is the commitment? Where is the commitment of, this, of those opposite? In every area, in every portfolio, you have dithered you have dithered. You have failed. Your record is equally dismal across each and every area. The Royal Commission to Aged Care Quality and Safety Interim Report was highly critical about the inaction of successive governments, of successive governments, of all towards the aged care industry. And we acknowledge that. And we are actioning as quickly as we can the recommendations that have been made already. Labor has remained silent on any commitment to aged care since the election, providing no additional funding and showing that it's a total hypocrisy. Our commitment is unwavering, and it's time that you actually came to the table with a plan. It's time that you actually worked with us for the benefit of all older Australians. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. And I believe we're going now to Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
I also rise today to speak on the urgency motion moved by yourself, Madam Deputy President, regarding the Morrison government's failure to protect older Australians in residential aged care from COVID-19, from this pandemic. But before I do so, I want to do something which has been a bit missed in this debate already by some senators, and that's acknowledge the more than 300 Australians living in residential aged care who have lost their lives. Because ultimately it is them we are talking about here today. More than 300 Australians who have passed away. Our thoughts are with them and with their families because it never should have been this way. Many of these Australians have died alone, unable to say goodbye in the dignified manner they had the right to expect. Just imagine not being able to say goodbye to your spouse, to your parent, to your child, whoever it is in there, your friend, not being able to say goodbye, not being able to hold their hand, not being able to look them in the eye, not being able to comfort them in those last moments of grief. It's devastating. It's devastating to even think about. These are some of our most vulnerable Australians. And this government failed in delivering a plan to keep them safe during this pandemic. And it's not just a failure of these times. It's a failure built on years and years of successive failures. Reports sitting on shelves, gathering dust year after year. Cuts after cuts in federal budgets, packaged up and designed to look like something else, but the budget papers do not lie. Australia's aged care system was in crisis under this government long before the pandemic. And let's be clear, this is their responsibility. It is the Prime Minister's responsibility. The government regulates the aged care sector. It funds the aged care sector. And whilst the government is not responsible for the pandemic, it's not responsible for a global economic downturn, sure, but it is responsible for our aged care system. And it is responsible for the failures and the failure of preparation to prepare that sector for what we've just seen. We don't have genuine taking of responsibility from this Prime Minister. We have passing the buck, which we see with him all the time. But his hands are all over these failures as well. He was the Treasurer who cut $1.7 million from the aged care budget. He's been there as funding has been slashed and safeguards removed. He's been there with changes to workforce. And the fact is you can't spin your way out of this one. You can't spin your way out of the things we've heard at the hearings of the Royal Commission. The recent three-day hearing in August revealed some terrible truths. Some terrible truths that the Morrison government and the Prime Minister needs to own up to. Truths which show that they weren't prepared to handle the pandemic. Truths that show that they did not have a plan, the plan they needed. Truths that show that face marks should have been made compulsory earlier, that basic issues around PPE should have been addressed. These are the facts outlined. But we don't see responsibility from our Prime Minister. We don't see responsibility, we see him stepping away from that responsibility, seeking to blame anyone but himself. It's not enough. It's not enough for those families. It shouldn't be enough for any of us. The Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for the failings of his government, for the failings of the sector he funds and regulates, the failures to protect older Australians during these pandemics. Because the saddest thing about these tragedies is perhaps with better planning, they could have been avoided. We saw what happened at Newmarch House. We saw what happened at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge. And yet the Prime Minister has told us that the outbreak in Victoria couldn't have been anticipated or foreshadowed. But it was. It was. It was for the government. It was for the Prime Minister. And there was an opportunity at that point to step in with a better plan. 
They should have been better prepared. They should have been better prepared in an area which is their responsibility, but they weren't. And we've heard today, during this debate and others, members from the government side saying that by Labor asking questions about this issue, questions about these successive tragedies, that we are politicising the issue. Well, what kind of joke is that? What kind of an accusation is that? Because what is the point of this place and of this chamber if not to scrutinise the government for the things they are responsible for? What is the point of this place if we are not here to ask questions of the executive, if we are not here to get to the bottom of government failings? Do government senators honestly believe it is not our place to hold the government to account, to ask questions about failures for our most vulnerable Australians? How dare these senators say we can't ask these questions? That is disrespectful of the role of this chamber and is disrespectful of the role of senators. I've also heard senators on the other side look back further into the past, but the reality is you guys got the keys to the lodge. You've had them for seven years. This is your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Seven years of failures. You're on that side of the chamber, so step up to it. And when you can't step up to it, take responsibility for it. Australians are scared. They're terrified that what they're seeing, even if they don't live in Victoria, is coming to their state, to their homes, to their loved ones in aged care. So you have an opportunity now to fix it for them. But you also have to take responsibility to stop deflecting. Thank to you, just Senator fix it. Smith. Your time has expired. We're going to Senator Griff. I assume you're seeking the call. Uh, thank yes, you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of this motion. However, the point needs to be made that the aged care crisis we're facing hasn't just been seven years in the making. Whilst the systemic issues facing the aged care sector have been compounded under the coalition government, the well-known issues plaguing the sector find their genesis in the Aged Care Act itself that was enacted 23 years ago under the Howard government. The alarm bells were ringing loudly even then, raised particularly by the nursing community but ignored by the government of the day. The chronic underfunding, underskilling and underpayment of staff with no mandatory minimum staffing requirements, no minimum training qualifications and no financial transparency of how $21 billion paid to the sector is spent has been allowed to occur under successive Liberal and Labor governments. For example, the incentive to de-skill the staffing mix in residential aged care was identified way back in 2011 by the Productivity Commission in its report Caring for Older Australians. This was whilst Labor was in government. The Productivity Commission reported then, and I quote, under current arrangements, providers in seeking to minimise costs have an incentive to employ a high proportion of lower qualified and therefore less expensive care workers. A high proportion of lower qualified workers means that nurses working in aged care facilities can experience excessive workloads where they spend a large proportion of their time on administrative tasks as they are effectively managers rather than on caring. This in turn can drive nurses away from aged care." End of quote. Nothing has changed since 2011. There have been successive reports, reviews and inquiries into the broken aged care sector, and still nothing substantive has changed. Vague terms in the Act around residential aged care maintaining an adequate number of appropriately skilled staff to ensure the needs of care recipients are met have resulted in nursing staff numbers, skills and the level of experience and expertise being systematically reduced. Personal care workers are run off their feet, carrying on the role of nurses. And the care for residents has very much suffered. The Aged Care Act, as it currently sits, is not fit for purpose. It never was, and urgent amendments are needed to be legislated. 
Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. And I, uh, I thank the Labor Party for presenting this urgency motion today um, and allowing me to uh, present a few facts rather than headlines and shallow speculation. Because it is a fact that spending in aged care under the coalition government has increased since Labor left government and will have almost doubled by the financial year 2022-23. Even ABC Fact Check has recognised that there has been an increase in spending. It is a fact that Labor took no policy to the last election to provide additional funding for home care places, for aged care quality or for workforce in mainstream residential aged care. It is a fact that under our coalition government, home care packages, residential care places and funding have gone up. Home care packages are up from, over, from just over 60,000 when Labor was in government in 2012-13 to over 164,000 by 2022-23. By the same time, funding will have gone up 258 per cent due to the growth in high-level packages. 98.5 per cent of Australians waiting for a home care package at their assessed level had been offered support as at the end of March this year. And there has been a significant reduction in wait times for people in urgent need of care. It is a fact that our government <coughs> recognises that packages for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those living in regional, <coughs> rural and remote communities need targeted and unique care. We have targeted $10 million for the Aged Care Regional Rural Remote Infrastructure Grants. We have committed funding to the forward estimates to 2022-23 of over $238 million for the Rural, Regional and Other Special Needs Building Fund. And we have provided $258 million specifically for the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flexible Aged Care Program. It is a fact that the industry-led Aged Care Workforce Industry Council was formed under our watch in May last year, and we are working to develop and support career pathways for aged care. It's a fact that our government is investing an initial $23 million to introduce a serious incident response scheme for residential aged care, which will commence from July next year. It is also a fact that on the back of multiple reports into aged care over successive years and under successive governments, we established the Royal Commission into Aged Care. And the interim report that Labor is so keen to focus on criticises successive governments of all persuasions over many years. At least our government is taking action. I didn't see Labor set up a serious incident response scheme, and I haven't seen Labor increase home care packages. And in fact, until the devastating COVID crisis, Labor had been silent on the issue altogether. It is a fact that now our immediate focus must be on assisting those in aged care facilities that have been struck with COVID. This is our priority in the immediate stage. We have made an unlimited surge workforce available to, to affected facilities. Commonwealth-funded surge staff have been deployed to all infected Victorian facilities, and ADF personnel are assisting our response. It is a fact that where you have community transmission, you're highly likely to see COVID in aged care. We saw that at Newmarch House. We saw it in Tasmania. And now we see where you have widespread community transmission that has been caused by poor quarantine management. You tragically have large numbers in the facilities we are seeing in Victoria, largely Melbourne and surrounds. In regional areas and in states where community transmission is low, outbreaks in facilities are being contained and managed if they're there at all. In states where we have no community transmissions, there are no outbreaks at all. 
So it is a fact that our government will continue to work with our aged care industry to improve services and outcomes to provide the best care for senior Australians who deserve respect, dignity and compassion, not politics. Thank you, Senator Davies. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. 328 deaths from COVID in aged care, and the vast majority from my home state in Victoria. And every one of those people was someone who was loved, a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a neighbour. This is a tragedy. I help care for my elderly mother who lives alone, so I can just imagine the worry of having loved ones so vulnerable in aged care homes. And my heart just breaks for all those who have lost loved ones during this crisis. When my mother struggles living alone, and especially during the lockdown that we're currently in, but she's so glad at this time that she's not in an aged care home, and she worries so much about her friends who are. And that's such an awful situation for our elderly and their families and for our society to be in. And so many of the people who have died should not have died. They have died because of mismanagement. It is an absolute scandal that private aged care providers are making mega profits while failing to protect their residents. Privatisation has failed. It's created a casualised workforce. It's put workers at risk and it's put residents at risk, all for corporate profits. So the Greens are calling for an urgent $3 billion injection into aged care for a human rights approach to aged care with increased hours of care, increased staff, a minimum of one registered nurse rostered on 24-7 in each facility and additional home care packages so that people can stay in their own homes for longer. The government must acknowledge that it has failed when it comes to aged care and take the action that is required now so that our precious older Australians can feel loved and supported and safe. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Brockman. Madam Deputy President, thank you. And I too rise to make a contribution to this debate. This pandemic is a tragedy. It has visited tragedy upon hundreds of Australians. 525 deaths in Australia from the COVID pandemic. Over 300 deaths in aged care. This is an absolute tragedy. And the minister has been very eloquent in expressing the sympathy of all those on this side of the chamber for each and every one of those deaths, be it within an aged care facility or within a hospital environment. It is an absolute tragedy, and we understand that. And that is why the response to the pandemic, and particularly the response to the uh, current issues in Victorian aged care, are our absolute priority. In fact, the Prime Minister has said, this is my number one focus. All services uh, with an active case of COVID-19 are receiving support from the Australian government, including a single case manager, access to uh, PPE, uh, a special residential aged care testing facilities and access to surge workforce and supplementation. We are extraordinarily grateful as a government to our surge work workforce partners and other agencies who are supporting aged care services impacted by this dreadful pandemic. These workers are providing essential support in these facilities under extraordinarily difficult and challenging circumstances. Uh, it is expected that all services accessing these support services um, will provide, continue to provide the essential care that the rare residents need. And in particular, I wish to call out the uh, around 50 uh, volunteer nurses and other healthcare workers from Western Australia who volunteered to uh, fly to Victoria to act as part of that surge wo workforce in aged care facilities and within uh, other health care facilities. And that is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary self-sacrifice and goes to the heart of what it means 
to be an Australian in such times of difficulty, where we do support one another, we help one another, we provide the assistance we need across borders to provide the services that those uh, elderly Australians, particularly in care facilities within Victoria, need at the moment. In fact, over 450 Commonwealth-funded surge staff have been deployed to Vic Victorian aged care services to date. ADF personnel and I pay tribute to my colleague from Western Australia, uh, Minister Reynolds. Uh, Aged ADF personnel are on site in residential facilities. Uh, and a, an additional ADF clinical reserve staff are available for deployment. The federal and Victorian governments have worked together to establish a dedicated Victorian aged care response centre in Melbourne to coordinate support for each aged care provider experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak in Victoria. A number of staff have been embedded in Victoria to provide assistance. This includes the Australian Government Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer, who is providing infection control expertise and emergency management support. The Victorian Aged Care Response Centre has now stood up family engagement capability, including support services with inbound calls, outbound calls and messages via Services Australia, OPAN services and Zoom meetings. The Commonwealth has deployed AUSMAT to Victoria, which will act under the direction of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre to assist with the management of COVID-19. AUSMAT provides leadership in nursing, clinical care, infection prevention and control, the use of PPE for impacted aged care facilities. On 20 July, the Australian and Victorian <coughs> governments, in collaboration with representatives from the aged care sector, announced additional measures to ensure aged care providers are equipped to minimise the spread of COVID-19 and continue to provide quality care. Once again, uh, my thoughts, my prayers go to those families who have suffered a loss in this dreadful pandemic. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to give a um, contribution to this debate today because it is vitally important. And let me say first up, um, my heart. My heart and my thoughts and my prayers go out to those who have lost loved ones in the midst of this pandemic, particularly those who have lost grandparents and dear friends at the hands of what has been a tragedy in the aged care system in Victoria. The privatisation of aged care has been proven in this pandemic to be an absolute failure. And it has been a long time coming. Those who work in this sector for years have been warning that there were problems. For years, those workers, often uh, some of the most lowest paid workers in the health profession, some of the most low paid workers in the service delivery sectors, warning that the privatisation and the desperation for uh, profit over care was making aged care homes right across the country more and more dangerous. Why haven't we been able to get this system right? For too long, older Australians have not been given the care, support and health care that they deserve. And one of the key problems we have had in the midst of this pandemic is those working in the sector trying their best, themselves have not been able to have access to the appropriate supports, whether that's appropriate PPE or paid leave if indeed they too are sick. We need a clean-up in the aged care system and we need to fix our leave Thank system you, so Senator everybody Hanson who is Young, sick your time doesn't has have to expired. go to work. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Billick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye against, I believe, the ayes have it. We now proceed to the consideration of documents listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting, uh, sorry, Deputy President. I take note of document, um, uh, sorry, re um, report and government responses, number one, the Community Affairs Reference Committee um, on page four and seek leave to continue my remarks.
Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Okay, so we'll now. Uh, is there any other docs documents? Right, Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Deputy President. If I wish to take note of document um, 11, the interim report of the committee investigating into road safety. So this is, of course, an interim report, and the work of the committee has been disrupted by the pandemic, as have so many other things. But tragically, um, Senator Rice, yes. I just we're just going to yes. we need to just table documents listed for today, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. So great, thank you. My apologies. Um, so we're now looking at the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government documents. Uh, Senator McGrath. Uh, pursuant to order and at the request of the Chair of the Economics Legislation Committee, I present a report on the examination of annual reports tabled by 30 April 2020. Can I just get through mine? No, I think we're correct. Yep, yep. We've got one off page four. Yes, because because we're time limited, we're just doing today's reports to get them tabled and then we'll come back. So please continue, Senator McGrath. I present the report of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee on the future of Australia's post service delivery, together with the Hansard record, record of proceedings and documents presented to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McGrath be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McGrath. Um, I, um, I present the advisory report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters on the Electoral Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2020. Thank you. And did you move for that to be? No, you're just presenting that report. Presenting. Thank you. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, apologies for, That's for okay. all that. <laughs> um, I move on behalf of yourself, Chair, Senator Lyons, that the Senate adopt the recommendation in paragraph 1.1 of the Procedures Committee first report of 2020 that the temporary orders agreed to on 3 December 2019 be adopted on a permanent basis. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. So the question is that the motions moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So, have we got any other tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses? Senator, is that what you're responding to? Yes, Senator Henderson. Yep. And then we've we just worked down. Number eight and nine. Yes, you're moving to take note. That's right. I'm yep. pleased to speak to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights 8th and 9th Scrutiny Reports of 2020, which were presented out of session on 1 July and 18 August 2020. These reports contain a technical examination of legislation with Australia's obligations under international human rights law. The committee considered 18 new bills and 99 instruments during this period and reported on 12 bills and instruments, including legislation previously commented on in these two scrutiny reports. During this COVID pandemic, the committee has continued to meet regularly via teleconference so that it can fulfil its important role in scrutinising legislation. These reports include the committee's consideration of several COVID-19 related bills and instruments. For example, the committee corresponded with the Minister for Health in relation to the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020. In Report 8, the committee concluded that the bill, which established privacy protection for users of the COVID Safe app, constituted a proportionate limit on the right to privacy, noting in particular the number of useful safeguards to protect data associated with app users. The committee also recommended a small number of targeted amendments to further improve these privacy protections, including recommending that state and territory health authorities which have received COVID safe app data must delete it as soon as they can and, and, and as soon as it's no longer required for contact tracing. These reports also continue the committee's important scrutiny function in relation to non-COVID-19 related legislation. 
For example, the committee's report number nine of 2020 sets out the committee's extensive consideration of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020. This bill seeks to amend ASIO's compulsory questioning powers. Currently, ASIO is only able to use questioning and detention powers to investigate terrorism offences, which has limited ASIO's capacity to investigate a range of steadily worsening security challenges, such as in relation to espionage and foreign interference. The bill also repeals ASIO's current detention powers and retains a broader compulsory questioning power. The report notes that these proposed amendments which are directed towards protecting Australia's national security, raise some complex human rights law issues. The committee sought a considerable amount of information from the minister in order to inform its consideration and thanks the minister for the detailed response which he provided. The committee considers that these powers seek to achieve the vitally legitimate objective of ensuring ASIO can gather information in relation to national security to keep Australia and Australians safe. The committee notes the minister's extensive advice as to the safeguards present in relation to a number of these measures which help to protect human rights. However, in some instances, the committee considers that, as drafted, there are questions as to whether such safeguards are sufficient such that the measure would, in all instances, constitute a proportionate limit on rights. The committee's report includes a number of recommendations for potential amendments to the bill, which would assist the proportionality of specific measures with respect to human rights. In addition, Report 9 of 2020 sets out the committee's consideration of the Migration Amendment Prohibiting Items in Immigration Detention Facilities Bill 2020. This bill would amend the Migration Act to allow the minister to determine that a thing is a prohibited thing in immigration detention and amend search and seizure powers in those facilities. As the report sets out, these proposed amendments are designed to ensure that the Department of Home Affairs can provide a safe and secure environment for staff, detainees and visitors in immigration detention facilities, which likely promotes the right to security of the person. The proposed measures also appear to engage other human rights, but any limitation on rights may be permissible if demonstrated to be reasonable, necessary and proportionate. In this respect, the committee noted that the bill is intended to address the concerning issue of mobile phones and other internet-capable devices being used to coordinate and facilitate escape efforts, organised criminal activities and facilitate the movement of drugs and other contraband within detention facilities. In reference to Border Force officers not having appropriate powers, the committee noted the submission of the Department of Home Affairs to the Senate inquiry into the bill, which stated in part a convicted child sex offender who is looking at child abuse material on his phone in plain sight cannot have his phone removed. As evidenced by Senator Keneally's social media posts on the 11th of August on this issue, uh, this is clearly not a point that is properly understood yeah. by some members of the Labor Party. The committee found that measures in the bill which remedy this current position are vital to the safety and lawful operation of detention centres. The committee thanks the minister for his detailed response, which greatly assisted in the committee's consideration of these measures. The committee has suggested some targeted recommendations to assist in the proportionality of the search and seizure measures with respect to human rights. In closing, I do wish to respond to the criticisms of Senator McKim, who has criticised coalition members of the committee for handing down reports which don't always in every respect follow the legal advice. Uh, we very much value the legal advice, but in our parliamentary democracy, committee members are required to independently consider the human rights implications of bills and instruments, and the role of committee members is not simply to rubber stamp that advice, as Senator McKim appears to be suggesting in his contribution yesterday in this place. Under my chairmanship, the committee now transparently reports on the legal advice it receives 
and distinguishes the legal advice in each report from the considerations of committee members. In determining whether a measure in a bill or instrument constitutes a permissible limitation on a specific human right, committee members are required to weigh up the minister's response, the legal advice and other relevant information which may be available to the committee. Any committee member may dissent on a report and there were a number of dissenting reports before I was appointed chair, and I think that's an important point to make. I just want to draw on one example, as it's clear on the face of our scrutiny of the ASIO bill um, that coalition committee members rejected the legal advice in a number of respects, including in relation to the power to prohibit a person from using a specific legal representative um, and that the advice was that this constituted a breach of the right to a fair trial, uh, the committee considered the, and I'm talking about the, the majority of the committee, considered the minister's advice and the argument that ASIO, or more correctly, the prescribed authority, should be able to have the power to exclude a legal practitioner who may, for instance, be under investigation for serious criminal offences and whose presence may otherwise compromise the integrity of ASIO's questioning process and it was the view of the majority that the option for the person being questioned to select another lawyer did not of itself breach a right to a fair trial. That's just one of the examples that I've given in relation to the basis on which uh, the committee doesn't always follow to the letter the legal advice. I do encourage all parliamentarians to carefully consider the committee's analysis and with these comments I commend these reports to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Uh, if there are no more contributions on that particular report, I'll put the question that the, that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I uh, rise to take, to take note of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters report that was just tabled and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Ah, Senator Rice, <laughs> you have the thank call. You. Thanks. thanks, Acting Deputy President. I seek to take note of the interim report of the Joint Select Committee on Improving Road Safety. Um, this is, of course, an interim report because the work of the committee has been disrupted by the pandemic, as have so many other things. But tragically, as we are mourning the lives that have been lost to COVID-19, there are also lives that have been lost simply by travelling on our roads and people going to and from work, visiting family, coming home from a sporting event. And even in these, these pandemic times, there have been times as a bike rider when I have had cars and trucks come scarily too close to me driving past way too fast. And I know how dangerous and scary that can be. So sadly, even as the pandemic slows down so much of our daily lives, we're still seeing cycling deaths. And in the context of road safety, I want to acknowledge here the death of cyclist Carolyn Lister and offer my condolences to her family and friends. She was a nurse and a cyclist who lived in Brisbane and her life was cut tragically short in June of this year. She was a strong rider, had recently taken up racing with the Hamilton Wheelers Cycling Club. And she was excited to win her first race last year. She was on the way to work in the accident. But it's absolutely crucial that we improve our Right, Senator, Senator Rice, if you could just give us a moment. You've, you've dropped out while we get some technical assistance. I think Senator Rice, uh, do we have you, Senator Rice? I think Senator Rice may need to uh, request leave to continue her remarks on Thursday. Senator McKim. Uh, yes, I, I just seek leave 
Uh, I, I note the report that Senator Rice was speaking to and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, sorry. Is anybody else taking note on committee reports? No. Um, we are going to messages uh, from the House. <clears throat> uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Improving Assistance for Vulnerable and Disadvantaged Families, Bill 2020, for concurrence. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill be read for a first time or for the first time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. The Minister. Thank you. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the debate be adjourned, be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Do I need to put that? Um, uh, the question is that the debate be moved. Uh, all those in favour say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Norfolk Island Amendment, Supreme Court Bill 2020, Primary Industries Customs Charges Amendment, Dairy Cattle Export Charge Bill 2020, and Superannuation Amendment, PSSAP Membership Bill 2020. I call the Minister. Uh, these bills being introduced together after debate on the motion for second reading has been adjourned. I shall move a motion to have the bills listed separately. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read the first time. Uh, the question is that the uh, bills uh, may proceed without formalities, be taken together and read a first time. All those in favour say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to Norfolk Island and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Primary Industries Customs Charges Act 1999 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. I call the minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. All those in favour say aye. aye. Uh, those against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Product Stewardship Oil Amendment Bill 2020 and Excise Tariff Amendment Bill 2020. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Uh, I'll put that question. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Product Stewardship Oil Act 2000 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Excise Tariff Act 1921 and for related purposes. The Minister. 
I move that these bills be now a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. I move the debate be now adjourned. Uh, put the question. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Superannuation, Your Choice Bill 2019. Uh, the President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 22 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Billick. Uh, Senator Billick. Thank you. Um, in the short time I've got to start my speech, <laughs> I rise to speak on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019. We all know university can be a stressful time. There can be pressures both internal and external to do well. Expectations of parents, the high cost of courses and a highly competitive job market weigh on the minds of most students. In particular, there can be additional pressures on international students whose parents and extended family may have expended significant resources to get them here. However, cheating is never justified. Businesses that seek to leverage the stress and anxiety of students to provide cheating services are not just acting dishonestly, but they also do enormous damage to our university sector as a whole. University students, both domestic and international, need to know that when they make the largest investment of their young lives, they are investing in a quality product which is untainted by scandal and deliberate attempts to deceive. Because every time a student gets away with cheating, they devalue the qualifications of all those who have graduated from that institute of higher learning. They, in fact, devalue the institution itself, and they devalue Australia's higher education sector more broadly. So, In my home state of Tasmania, the University of Tasmania has leveraged their quality education with the livability of the cities of Hobart, Launceston and Burnie to bring income into our state. Education has become a real export industry in the same way that exporting our raw products and manufactured goods is. Nationally, in 2014-15, the Australian Bureau of Statistics valued exports from international education Thank at you, 18. Senate. Thank you, Senator Billick, and you'll be in continuance. And I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, the Senator, oh, oops, what am I doing? Senator, <laughs> Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. When you talk to Tasmanians and Australians about what our economy should look like as we look forward to defeating COVID-19 and getting our businesses back up and running at full speed, there is one theme that is raised more than any other. We need to get back to manufacturing things in this country. We all acknowledge that gone are the days when every part, every component and every specialist product will be Australian built. But it's clear that the pendulum has tipped too far in recent decades. Instead of thinking about how we can build something in Australia, the easy option of buying something built overseas has become the default. In the wake of COVID-19, we need to think differently. And it's great to see that in Tasmania, the Liberal government under Premier Peter Gutwin has put local jobs at the forefront of decision-making about how to build the next generation of Bass Strait Sea Transport. The government-owned TT Line, operator of the Two Spirits of Tasmania vessels, has identified that they need to increase the capacity for passengers and freight across Bass Strait in the years ahead. The plan was originally to sell the two existing ferries and commission two new, larger ships to be built in Finland at an estimated cost of up to $850 million. 
With the COVID-19 economic crisis hitting the economy, Premier Gutwin and Infrastructure Minister Michael Ferguson have quite rightly made the call to look closely at whether it's necessary to spend $850 million of public money in Europe and have instead put together a task force to assess what opportunity there is for Tasmanian and Australian boat builders to get involved. We've already seen that the new approach taken by the Tasmanian Liberal government can deliver thousands of Tasmanian jobs. Tasmania is home to one of the world's most innovative boat builders, INCAT. When the Tasmanian government announced that they were looking to get local companies involved, I spoke to people in the ferry industry and I went and met with INCAT to see if there was an opportunity for them to build a vessel in Tasmania which could fix the capacity issues on Bass Strait. And the great news is they can. To have thousands of Tasmanians working for the next two years on a new vessel built on the Derwent River with components manufactured across the strait is exactly the type of local manufacturing outcome we need right now. One option available, which I wrote about in the Mercury newspaper soon after the announcement by the Tasmanian government, is to keep the two existing spirits, which are still perfectly functional and will be until at least 2028, and add a Tasmanian-built Incat catamaran to the route. Thousands of Tasmanian jobs in the next 24 months when we need them most. Tick. Increased choice for passengers crossing Bass Strait. Tick. More capacity for both passengers and vessels. Tick. What's the better plan for local jobs? Spend $850 million in Finland or spend a fifth of that in Tasmania and directly create work for thousands of Tasmanians? Yet bizarrely, Tasmanian Labor is out in the media trashing the plan to involve Australian boat builders. Both INCAT and Western Australian-based Austal have expressed interest in being part of the build, but the headline on the front page of Tasmanian Papers on Monday was Labor Backs Finnish Builder. The spirit of Tasmania replacement vessels should be built by Finnish shipyard Rauma Marine Constructions, Labor says. What an extraordinary position for the Labor Party to take, saying to Tasmanian and Australian businesses who have put their hand up that they're not up to the job. What is the motivation for Labor MPs to cheerlead for a Finnish boat builder? I'd be fascinated to hear a Tasmanian Labor senator justify that position. This is a great case study of the new approach to local manufacturing which is needed post-COVID, demonstrated by a Liberal government. And the old approach of, well, it's easier to buy from overseas, well, that's being spruiked by the Labor Party. I look forward with hope to the new approach winning out and in the months ahead being able to go and see new Bass Strait vessels being built in Tasmania by Tasmanians. Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator McCarthy. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to just uh, share with the Senate uh, an incredible weekend in the Northern Territory with the Northern Territory election yeah, yeah, yeah. and just uh, commend uh, Chief Minister Michael Gunner on being able to take a second term for himself and his team. And I just wanted to uh, commend all the candidates of the Australian Labor Party who stood in the seats across the Northern Territory, such a vast uh, territory that it is, and just put on the Hansard uh, the hard work uh, that the Labor Party has been doing, in particular through the COVID crisis. And I do think that uh, we do need to put on the record that this was the first election uh, during the COVID pandemic. And I know that for every single candidate, uh, it was important to feel safe and to know that they were able to speak to the people across the territory. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the frontline workers, our health practitioners, the Northern Territory Police, uh, certainly on our borders, not just on the roads but also at the airports, along with the AFP and the Australian Army, and of course uh, certainly in our airports. So I'd like to just acknowledge those candidates who stood for Labor, for Ara Fura, Lawrence Costa, Ara Lewin, Jackson Ankers, Arnhem, Selena Yubo, Barclay, Sid Vashist, Blaine, Mark Turner, Brakeling, Dale Wakefield, Casuarina, Lauren Moss, Daly, Anthony Venners, Drysdale, Eva Lawler, Fong Lim, Mark Monaghan, Goida, Mick Taylor, Guadja, Chancy Paik, Johnston, Joel Bowden, 
Karama, Nari Arquette, Catherine, Kate Ganley, Molka, Lynn Walker, Namajira, Shirley Taylor, Nelson, Steve Asher, Nightcliffe, Natasha Files, Port Darwin, Paul Kirby, Sanderson, Kate Wharton, Spillett, Tristan Sloan, and Wanguri, Nicole Manison. And also thank our Labor members and volunteers across the Northern Territory, in particular our First Nations Workers' Alliance, uh, Unions NT. The unions were out supporting our candidates, the CPSU, United Workers' Union, CFMEU, MUA, ETU, ASU, SDA, AMWU, TWU, AWU. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who supported our candidates across the Northern Territory. It is indeed uh, important, Madam Acting Deputy President, to acknowledge the uh, supporters and volunteers who come together at election time, uh, the, the supporters who are in the background but who are very much at the forefront of uh, driving hundreds if not thousands of kilometres across the Territory uh, to follow the Northern Territory Electoral Commission and their teams. Uh, it was a significant task even for the Northern Territory Electoral Commission to have the staff that they had to poll at all the booths that they did in some of the remotest regions of the Northern Territory. I commend you for your efforts in those areas. As difficult and as challenging as it is uh, physically and geographically, we still have a lot of work to do in understanding why it is that First Nations voters are being disengaged in most of our remote regions of Northern Australia, not just the Northern Territory. Uh, it will also occur in Queensland and WA and also South Australia. So it's important that the Senate and the Parliament uh, make sure it resources the Australian Electoral Commission. Uh, we've seen a reduction in the uh, workforce, especially with the AEC and other uh, federal agencies, in particular in the Northern Territory, like the Bureau of Meteorology, just to name the two of those. If we had further resourcing, appropriate resourcing, we know we could have the educational and information programs out there across the regions as to why voting is significant and to make sure it is in the languages, over 100 Aboriginal languages in the Northern Territory. So if we want to make sure, whether it's local government, state or territory government, or, or federal elections, I should say, whether it's local elections, state or territory elections, or federal elections, we must make sure all Australians are enrolled. And I think that is the real challenge uh, for every single senator and every single member of federal parliament to ensure that we are getting people on the roll so that they have their say when it comes to elections. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the impact COVID has had on young people and the future they face. It's hard to overstate how rapidly and dramatically COVID-19 has changed the world for young people. But we must acknowledge that neither they or the pandemic are the cause of the greatest challenges they face. Those have been created for them by older generations. A recent Batuta Advocate headline attributes a fake quote to the Prime Minister. The sooner young people understand they are effed, the sooner they'll be happy. And it's hard to argue with. Young people's sense of resignation to a system that's stacked against them is palpable. On the facts, they could feel right to reason that whatever they do, won't make much difference anyway. While millennials are the first generation of people who will be worse off than their parents, they see billionaires like Elon Musk and Steve Ballmer who have made tens of billions of dollars during the pandemic. Jeff Bezos, the Amazon oligarch, added $13 billion to his net worth on just one Monday in July. Meanwhile, the wage growth for young people is non-existent. It has actually never been lower. The Productivity Commission reports a lost decade of income. To make matters worse for young people, youth unemployment is at a 23-year high of 16%. Young people are finding themselves amongst hundreds of applica applicants for jobs, competing with people with years of experience for entry-level positions. Right now, there's one job vacancy for every 13 people looking for one. These problems aren't new. 
and they stand to get worse as the recession bites. I worry in particular at the early reports of mental health statistics. 80% of young people in the UK said coronavirus had made their mental health worse. Victorian hospitals have seen admissions arising from self-harm rise by 33% compared to last year. While they're being battered economically, young people confront the ravages of climate change and resurgent fascism and threats to democracy are front of mind of many young people. Young people I speak with have little to no faith that our institutions as they are, are able to deal with the crises of health, climate and inequality that are playing out. On all of these issues, our government is absent. Ours is a prime minister who would embody the image of a suburban dad in every way except wanting to see kids thrive. From him all the way down to the major party backbenchers, there's still a disturbing willin willingness to side with big corporate donors and the interests of fossil fuel lobbyists ahead of the needs of the community and our future. Young people can only survive in the decades beyond this pandemic by taking the radical direct action needed to secure their future and dismantle the structures that seek to destroy the planet, rig the economy and deny them a future. Around the world, they are showing us how to survive through that kind of action. And they are brilliant at it. Look at the young American who linked up with a whole bunch of TikTok-based K-pop fans and completely, hilariously ruined a Trump rally by faking hundreds of RSVPs. Online, it's Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok where the Black Lives Matter movement was best reflected and remains long after the media have stopped reporting and the rallies and protests that continue to this day. In Australia, think of the school strikers for climate, led by young people, the largest protests in a generation. And I was so proud that so many of them were young women of color. And they sure did get it done the right way, with the voices of First Nations and an opposition to extractive capitalism at their movement's very heart. Look at the Australian Unemployed Workers' Union Mutual Obligations Strike. Um, that's right now challenging the generational corruption of Australia's income support system. In that spirit of survival, young people have stepped up for each other and our communities, leading from the front through mutual support. And we owe these young people nothing short of a revolution, a revolution on their terms, with nothing short of our full-throated support. Senator Ranty. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Politics is not for the faint of heart. We in this chamber are no strangers to criticism, be it criticism from the public or criticism from the media. There's nothing wrong with the eye of constructive scrutiny descending upon any one of us, though, I should say. And the member for Boothby and the other place is an incredibly hard-working member of parliament and a passionate advocate for her local community. She's strong-willed and not someone who shies away from constructive criticism. During last year's federal election campaign, she showed that she was strong. She was subjected to sexual harassment, stalked, and her electorate and campaign officers were vandalised with vicious slurs. She received little protection, but she forged on. When she appeared on ABC's Q&A program post-election, former journalist Mike Carlton live tweeted that another guest, singer Jimmy Barnes, showed great restraint by not leaping across his seat and strangling her. Sadly, the personal attacks didn't end there. Peter Gers, for those who haven't heard of him, which is likely to be everyone, is the host of an ABC radio show in Adelaide and Evenings. He also works as a columnist in the Sunday Mail in South Australia. And, and like many South Australians, I don't tune in to his show because I find it to be the entertainment equivalent of waiting in a transit lounge at a major airport with nothing more to do than watch the arrivals board tick over. I also rarely read his columns. However, on the 26th of June, Mr Gers wrote an appalling article in the Sunday Mail critiquing the way the member for Boothby looks when he wrote, Nicole wears pearl earrings and a pearly smile. She favours, favours a vast wardrobe of blazers, coats and tight black ankle-freezing trousers and stiletto heels. She presents herself in her own newsletter 23 times as a fashion plate. She has blazers and coats in black, blue, pink, red, beige, green, white, cream, floral and two in grey. His weekly column 
has proven to be largely a rehash of things which irritate him, a bit like Peter Griffin in Family Guy when he starred in a TV show called What Really Grinds My Gears. And while Mr Gurr's comments were published in the News Limited newspaper and didn't feature on an ABC publication, one would expect that the ABC as his employer would be extremely uncomfortable with those comments and how they reflect upon the taxpayer-funded national broadcaster. After all, the ABC touts their editorial guidelines in the form of their external work and editorial conflicts, which states that Clause 1.4, external activities of individuals undertaking work for the ABC must not undermine the independence and integrity of the ABC's editorial content. And further, the ABC editorial style guide warns employees not to make gratuitous references to a woman's physical appearance if you wouldn't do the same for a man. Furthermore, the comments offend the spirit of the ABC's code of practice, which highlights that the content should be respectful towards audiences and mindful of community standards in areas like harm and offence. So I wonder whether or not the ABC considers these comments were in keeping with community standards. After all, the ABC board is well stocked with women. Chair Ida Buttrose is a founding member and former president of Chief Executive Women. The deputy chair, Dr Kirsten Ferguson, is the ex-director of She Starts and Women's Agenda Leadership Awards and board member Donnie Walford is a member of the International Women's Forum Australia. So where was the fierce defence of a fellow female under attack from the broader sisterhood? Once again, there was none. Nothing but crickets. Nothing but a figurative tumbleweed rolling down the airwaves. Nothing more than a metaphoric wolf howling in the distance. But who's surprised? As we know, there are one set of rules for conservatives and another set of rules for the left. So on the 31st of July, I wrote to Ida Buttrose, the chair of the ABC, to express my disappointment regarding Mr Gurr's article and to ask her what action she was planning to take, and I await a response. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept, and surely our national broadcaster wouldn't ignore this behaviour. Surely this is not the standard our national broadcaster is willing to accept. So all I can say is, over to you, Ida. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the pandemic has emphasised the importance of home. As opportunities to be out and in the company of others were lost or restricted, we've retreated to our houses. We've video called our friends, we've homeschooled our children, we've exercised, eaten and entertained ourselves. And for millions of Australians, home has been a sanctuary from the fear and the threats of the outside world. But that has not been the experience for all. For too many women, the fear and the threats have come from inside the home. Family violence was a national crisis before the pandemic. Lockdowns and self-isolation have only exacerbated it. Women and children have found themselves stuck at home with their abuser. The results have been unsurprising. Kim Sattler, a domestic violence worker in my home state of New South Wales, told ABC News, we are seeing older women like we have never seen before trying to flee domestic violence, and the level of violence the women are experiencing is more extreme than we have seen before. The Australian Institute of Criminology surveyed 15,000 women. And two-thirds of those who reported violence over the last three months said it had either started or intensified during the lockdown. A survey of frontline domestic violence workers supports that assessment. Workers across the country reported that incidents spiked since the start of the pandemic, and violence is more frequent and severe with a disturbing increase in reports of first-time family violence. Providers report that the pandemic has been used to justify financial control, such as limiting access to money or making threats about a family's economic stability. When women are economically dependent, they are at greater risk of being trapped in a violent home. As Professor Cathy Humphreys wrote in an op-ed today, research shows that women are at a greater risk of domestic violence in times of disaster, and the most significant protective factor for women was employment. The cost of childcare, unequal pay and discrimination mean the odds are stacked against women at the best of times. The economic consequences of COVID-19 have only made things worse. We know that women are bearing the brunt of job losses. Women are less likely to be able to keep their jobs and they are less likely to have the financial independence to leave their violent partners. One in four women have experienced abuse at the hands of a current or former partner. 
And many Australians will know these women. They are our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, nieces, daughters, friends, neighbours and colleagues. And they all have a right to be safe in their homes. Last year, the government announced funding for the construction of much-needed housing for women and children fleeing violence. They have yet to confirm where the $60 million in funding will go. Family violence services and workers continue to call for more funding, support and communication from the federal government. The United Nations described domestic violence as the shadow pandemic. COVID-19 has shown us that as a society, we are truly capable when faced with adversity. How can we make sacrifices, adapt, care for one another, advocate for workers and the elderly? We are facing down the pandemic. What would it look like for us to mobilise and face down the shadow pandemic of domestic violence as well? 34 Australian women have been killed in a family violence incident this year. And we have attended too many vigils. It is time to act. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Everybody talks about going back to normal after this crisis. But I don't want to go back to normal on some things. I think we can do better than that. We have the opportunity to reset and transition our economy to a renewable energy one, one that creates thousands of jobs as we deal with a global recession, a pandemic and the climate crisis. But apparently the government doesn't see it that way. The makeup and the focus of the COVID Commission that is meant to be leading our recovery is a dead giveaway on exactly what the government's focusing on coming out of this crisis, what is essential and what the government wants recovered, in inverted commas. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that the Commission is focused not on the real future, but they're going back to the future. The head of our COVID-19 Recovery Commission is deeply embedded in the gas industry, and his commission is stacked with big business and the oil and gas industry. The climate crisis is still with us and will we continue to be with us. We need a real plan, a plan for a future not based on the past, not based on old fossil fuels, but on renewable energy. Gas is a fossil fuel. Burning and producing gas drives climate change and is not a transition fuel to a cleaner economy. Emissions from the extraction, processing and export of gas have been a key driver behind Australia's emissions staying so high. Just today, a group of leading Australian scientists have written to the chief scientist, Dr Alan Fingal, to, uh, saying his support for gas as an energy source is not consistent with a safe climate. In 2018, the WA government lifted the moratorium on one of the most invasive and destructive ways to get gas out of the ground, fracking. Whilst the WA government was making claims of protecting 98 per cent of WA, it has left vast areas of the Kimberley exposed to this controversial practice of fracking and this beautiful region that has long um, been in the sights of, the, of petroleum exploration companies who want to push the exploration of the Canning Basin is at deep risk. Oil and gas fracking companies have compared parts of the Kimberley's Canning Basin to places in the US and Canada, which have more than 30,000 oil and gas wells. The plan by Texan company Bennett Resources, owned by Black Mountains, is to drill and frack wells in the Fitzroy River catchment. But this would be just the beginning. They are pushing for an east, a west, sorry, west east gas pipeline that would open up the Kimberley to fracking and the COVID Commission has been talking to them about it. The Fitzroy River uh, catchment, Roebuck Plains, Lagrange Bay and the Great Sandy Desert are in the fracking firing line. There are lots of companies sniffing around the Kimberley, as I said, Black Mountain Metals, Thea Energy, Buru Energy, Goshawk Energy and Squadron Energy. Energy. These companies can see the Kimberley not for what it is, but just fracking wells all over the place. 
Black Mountain uh, Metals has plans for seismic surveys in 2021. They have had discussions, as I articulated, with the head of the COVID Commission and are pushing the east-west gas pipeline. THEA are also exploring their options. Conceptual drawings show Broome to be the oil port and gas would be piped south. Oil ports exporting this scale of resources usually have one tanker per day, loading whilst two more uh, are at anchor. This poses a great risk to Broome, its tourist economy and the fragile marine environment of Roebuck Bay. There are plans for a, for a new proposed floating jetty, which also includes oil and gas, and can be accessed 24-7, current, which current facilities up there don't allow. This has already been approved conceptually by the WA government. Onshore storage of hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil would be required to achieve this sort of output, again posing a significant risk. We envisage a much different future for this country, one based on renewable energies that do not destroy our environment and that do not destroy this planet and that actually will contribute to addressing the climate crisis that we are also facing at this time. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight as a senator for Victoria, a state that I love that is sadly now in a state of disaster. And I don't just mean those that have lost lives to COVID-19. I also give my condolences to the 438 families that have needlessly lost loved ones. I pray that the 3,600 active cases get well soon, like the 14,000 plus cases that have already recovered. I also pray for those people needlessly having their lives destroyed through the mishandling of this pandemic in my home state. Every day I receive dozens of calls from small business people. These people operate businesses in Victoria. These business people are men and women, mothers and fathers, trying to make ends meet to feed and clothe their families. More often than not, when I'm speaking to them, they're crying. They are desperate. Their businesses are about to go under. They have, to their credit, got through nearly six months of some of the strictest restrictions in the country, but now they are at the end of their tether. Their businesses survive stage three, but they do not believe they will survive stage four restrictions. Their businesses and families have been failed by their state government. That is the Andrews Labor state government. There is clear evidence that there has been a failure of governance in hotel quarantine in Victoria. There was insufficient governance regardless of who was hired to do the job, and governance is government's number one task. It has been established beyond doubt that the ADF were offered but were turned down. If you can't quarantine the virus away, you need very good contact tracing to contain the virus. Victoria's contact tracing has been described to me by one senior health official as catastrophic. If we look at Victoria versus New South Wales, how they've handled the pandemic, it is clear to see that New South Wales is the gold standard and they have shown Victoria how to do it. But I'm yet to be convinced that the Andrews government has learned this lesson. If you can't contain COVID in quarantine or by using tests uh, testing and tracing, you can only resort to draconian measures, and that is exactly what Andrews is doing. We've had three weeks of stage four so far, four weeks of wearing masks, six weeks of stage three, and there was uh, those hotspot suburbs which have been in lockdown now for over 10 weeks. And while the drop in numbers this week is very, very welcome, Victorians have the right to ask, is this working as it should? Throughout all this, Dan Andrews has blamed Victorians and he <coughs> excuse me. Throughout all this, Dan Andrews has blamed Victorians and he and his ministers have sought to avoid all accountability. He didn't even know which minister of his was in charge of quarantine, but he sure knew who to blame. Shame, Premier, shame. His followers in the media were only too happy to jump on that bandwagon. 
However, even last week, his police commissioner, or deputy commissioner, I should say, said that only 42 fines were issued from 30,000 people required to isolate. That is 0.14 per cent, hardly what anyone could call mass civil disobedience. So he can't trust his health minister or her department to contain trace or testing or quarantine. He turned to the Department of Jobs, of all things, to run quarantine. And while he doesn't seem to acknowledge this, I'm sure this fact will be established very soon. So Andrew's response to this pandemic is just, let's lock it down. He's a one-trick pony. As he has no proper process to contain COVID, he con continues to strong-arm Victorian business to death. Now Premier Andrews wants parliament, the parliament that he hasn't let sit for six months. He now wants them to sit to hand him greater emergency powers. Now, I'm not arguing that powers might not be needed, but they don't need to be 12 months' worth of powers. As opposition leader today, My, uh, Michael O'Brien said today, Victorians elect a parliament, not a premier. And so we look to parliament in Victoria to make sure that those extraordinary powers, that those unnecessary powers, are not given to Dan Andrews. Thank you. Senator Mario Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on a topic which some in this chamber will understand is quite a difficult topic to talk about at the moment, and that's the topic of lung cancer. But I do so because there's never been a more important time to talk about it, and we need to talk about it, and we especially need to talk about the stigma associated with it. Because lung cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers in Australia. According to the Lung Foundation, approximately 12,000 Australian men and women were diagnosed with lung cancer in 2019. That's approximately 35 people each day. Lung cancer is also Australia's biggest killer from cancer. It sadly takes more Australians than breast, prostate and ovarian cancers combined. We lose 25 lung cancer patients each day. There are many more statistics that I could list about lung cancer, but those touched by this horrible disease know them all too well, and I don't need to repeat them here. So instead, I'll talk about the statistics related to the stigma that surrounds lung cancer. Because the lack of empathy that we see for this disease is confronting and it is standing in the way of a better approach to this disease. We know that over a third of Australians consider those with lung cancer to be their own worst enemy. One in 10 Australians will say they got what they deserved. And this lack of empathy shown towards lung cancer is said to be associated to uh, a view within the public that lung cancer equates to tobacco smoking. 90% of Australians believe smoking is the only cause of lung cancer, which is just untrue. One in three women and one in 10 men diagnosed with lung cancer have no history of smoking which means that on average one in five people living with lung cancer are lifelong non-smokers. It's actually occupational exposure that creates a lot of lung cancer and there are other proven factors including genetics and pollution. But notwithstanding any of this, we cannot judge smokers or former smokers of the past on the standards we have today because it was only in 2006 that graphic health warnings became required on the packaging of most tobacco products and only 2011 that the first complete state or territory ban on point of sale tobacco product displays was implemented. Some Australians smoked, but that doesn't mean their suffering is deserved or justified. And many of us in this place have been touched by lung cancer in some way and have experienced the stigma firsthand. I lost both my nana Jean and my uncle Ian to lung cancer. And the first question asked of our family was, do either of them smoke? They didn't, but it should never have mattered. They were both taken from us in their 60s, two wonderful people, their lives cut way too short from this horrific disease. But not every lung cancer story ends this way. I recently had the pleasure of meeting two survivors, my constituents Lorraine and Sandy from South Australia. Both survivors, both some of the strongest people I've ever had the opportunity to meet in this job. But their experiences, especially of stigma, were heartbreaking. Lorraine, in particular, shared her story and experience. As a double cancer survivor, she had breast cancer. And when she had breast cancer, she felt this warm embrace from the community of medical and social support around her. She felt as if she had an army of support behind her. 
But when she was diagnosed with lung cancer, she couldn't even access a lung cancer nurse to answer her most basic questions. She described the journey of being diagnosed with lung cancer as an incredibly lonely one. Well, no patient, no cancer sufferer should ever have to feel that way. One of the major repercussions of this stigma is a lack of resourcing, a lack of concern and a lack of government support. And this impacts in terms of research, in terms of treatment and in terms of healthcare shortages. We see an abundance of support and funding for breast cancer, and I'm not saying that that shouldn't be there, but lung cancer is lacking, and lung cancer is a terrible and large killer in Australia. Despite its impact, it receives very little research funding. And now during this pandemic, when the spotlight is on respiratory diseases, surely now is the time that we can look at lung cancer. We can do what we can as a community to address the stigma which surrounds the disease because no one deserves it, no one deserves the suffering. No family deserves to witness that suffering. And no one deserves to feel like they go through a disease like that on their own. So I call on the government tonight to do more to address the shortfalls we know exist in lung cancer funding to help stop this suffering and stop the stigma associated with this terrible disease. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to lend my support to the Derby community in Western Australia's Kimberley region as it campaigns for urgent upgrades to Derby District High School. In early July, at the invitation of local community leaders, I visited the school to inspect the facilities available to staff and students. As I arrived, I had the pleasure of meeting the junior school student leadership group, including Harvey Alford, who presented me with a letter regarding the poor state of the buildings there, particularly the proposed upgrades to toilets. Harvey's letter to me said, Dear Senator Smith, I'm writing to you about our upper lower primary boys and schools toilets and the fact that they need to be completely redone. If you come to inspect, you will see this. This is an extremely unsanitary environment, very concerning in times like these. The floor is not level, a trip hazard. The toilets were built on a very low budget. Our cubicles are atrocious. Some of the wall is missing near the urinal and even the roof is disgusting. The fact that these toilets are decades old and absolutely nothing has been done about it means that you might as well flush the money down the toilet if you're going to just upgrade. We hope you change the government's mind and do a complete rebuild of the toilets. While the teachers and parents at the school have created a nurturing, student-focused environment, the built form of the school is an unacceptable state of dis disrepair. There's been a failure by successive governments to provide funding for building upgrades, which is now having a detrimental impact on student outcomes. An audit of hygiene arrangements at Derby District High School demonstrates it is failing to provide adequate bathroom facilities for both students and teachers. For the 93 enrolled senior students, there is only one male and one female toilet cubicle that was built to 1965 standards. This is unacceptable by any measure and is of particular negative impact to the young women of the school, with parents indicating that many refuse to attend classes during their menstruation cycle due to the lack of privacy and the poor facilities available. Across the whole school, the only showers available for students are within special needs facilities. The other showers are cold water only, with minimal privacy separation, which limits the variety of physical education options and prevents the school from hosting inter-school events. For a school in the remote north of Western Australia with a hot, humid climate, this limitation is unworkable and disrespectful to students and teachers alike. The ordinarily provision of adequate hygiene facilities is vital to provide dignity, but given the risk of COVID-19, there is a clear need to address the insufficient facilities at Derby District High School immediately. It's disappointing that despite knowing about the issue, the WA government overlooked the school in a recent announcement of infrastructure upgrades for 63 other schools. The Derby community deserves a straightforward commitment now to a holistic plan that will address the shocking state of the school's asbestos-ridden buildings within a well-defined time frame. In recent media reports on the issue, the WA Minister for Education, the WA Labor Minister for Education, advised that the department was producing 
a feasibility report to provide a secondary hygiene facility, including toilets, showers and a laundry at the school. This response does not inspire the confidence of the Derby community. The isolation and seasonal weather of the Kimberley means that construction work is difficult to schedule, and this should be recognised by ensuring that decisions to upgrade are made clearly and are made early. Any delay to a decision now has a far more pronounced impact on delivery timeframes in Derby than a delay in the Perth metropolitan area would or even other parts of Western Australia. It is also important to note that Derby District High School has an enrolment of approximately 80 per cent Aboriginal students and services a number of remote Indigenous communities around WA's far north. The lack of any urgent action leads one to assume that the WA Labor government finds it acceptable that nearly 50 female students, 80 per cent of whom are Aboriginal, must share one toilet cubicle at a very critical, potentially sensitive time in their lives. Labor's Mark McGowan may be the Premier, but local Labor is not listening to local Kimberley people. Senator Shaw. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I want to draw to the Senate's attention the state of the aviation industry, an industry that has been decimated by the global health pandemic only to be kicked in the guts by the absolute failure of the government to provide a national aviation plan. The grounding of flights was the right call, but it was not a market failure. It was a government decision. And when they made that decision, they appeared to have made one other to abandon the industry. Virgin, a full service airline, that was forced to practically bleed out while the government refused to take an equity stake, a financially viable and sensible decision that would have given certainty to thousands of Australian workers and providing a return to the taxpayer, only for the government to turn around and play favourites with the Deputy Prime Minister's mates at the foreign, majority foreign-owned Rex Airlines, a company disproportionately pumped up with untied government grants the relief money turning around and buying Virgin planes on the cheap. All the while, the missing minister, Michael McCormack, uses the excuse that Virgin is majority foreign-owned to deny it funding support. Then there's the story of the 6,000 workers at Donata, a company that the government retrospectively excluded from the JobKeeper support program. Workers, many of which worked for Qantas, who never chose who ultimately owned their company and who have paid a lifetime in tax were cruelly abandoned by a government that could have supported them with the stroke of a pen. And now Qantas. Alan Joyce has taken Morrison, Scott Morrison and the Australian taxpayers for fools. The whole point of the government taxpayer-funded JobKeeper program was to preserve links between employers and employees. The community's expectation is clear. The funding from JobKeeper should be used to keep jobs, to preserve, as far as possible, the status quo. Letting Qantas take millions and hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayers' money without any obligation to its workforce or to the country is an act of sabotage of the national interest. Today's announcement of the pending outsourcing, sacking and replacement of 2,400 ground, baggage and cleaning jobs is an evil act of corporate bastardry. I heard today the words of Jim Metropolis, a leading hand on the international ramp at Sydney Airport. He has worked for Qantas for 34 years and amongst his family they have 100 years for service. He said, we are gobsmacked. My phone has not stopped ringing since about 12 o'clock. People are ringing, worries about mortgages, kids, bills. I put in 34 years and now it's gone. It's like a piece has gone from all of us. Stacting Deputy President, Alan Joyce and the board are using COVID as an excuse not just to sack these workers, but to replace them with outsourcing companies like Swissport. Swissport, 
a company that treats its staff so poorly they were discovered to be sleeping under baggage carousels because they could not afford the fuel for a round trip home between shifts. Is this the future the shareholders and taxpayers of Australia want for the workers and families of Qantas? Well, it's not one that I want. And I join the Transport Workers Union today in calling for Alan Joyce to resign as CEO. And if that fails, then the board should be replaced. Because let's be clear, today's decision is not getting Qantas through the crisis. The work still has to be done. It's just going to be done by companies who pay starvation wages and structure their rosters in a way that force aviation workers to sleep in terminals, terminals and in their cars. The government shut down the skies. It has the responsibility to work with the, all the shareholders to build a national plan, all the stakeholders in aviation, for all Australians, not just a privileged few. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. An unfortunate truth from COVID-19 is that generous government payments like JobKeeper and JobSeeker will need to be reduced in order to increase incentive, kickstart job growth and restore the economy. These initiatives are playing a crucial role in the national recovery. However, as things improve in Victoria, it's time that all levels of government start initiating the recovery by implementing the policies that will drive jobs and economic growth. Earlier this year, I spoke in the Senate and proposed that if we are to learn anything from COVID-19, it's that our nation needs to get very serious about balancing the budget and paying down debt. In light of that, I called for the government and all governments to focus our regulatory reform agenda, to focus on cutting red and green tape that burdens so many of these hard-working mum and dad businesses. In August 2020, getting small business back into business is one of the most crucial components of our recovery. It is immensely clear that the private sector has borne the brunt of the economic shortfall arising from COVID-19. The ABS reports that over 230,000 small businesses are expected to close, which will result in approximately half a million permanent jobs removed out of the economy. Pulling out of the storm that is COVID-19 will be difficult, but not impossible. And there is no reason why our, our economy cannot recover to where we were before through targeted and responsible measures to grow the economy. None more so than in cutting inefficient, ineffective and burdensome red and green tape that is holding back thousands of Australian businesses. The first step to cutting red tape is to audit every department at a state, local or whatever level to identify the number of regulatory burdens and, most importantly, the extent of their effect on Australian businesses. From here, all governments must adopt a stewardship approach to deregulation where every minister and their departmental heads are tasked with reducing the number of regulatory impacts. The success of this plan relies on putting the responsibility on the top of the departments. By doing so, governments can begin to remove the most deep-rooted and re-emerging re-regulation and not just the low-hanging, easy-to-cut fruit. Not only will ministers be responsible for their departments cutting red tape, but their responsibility should extend to routinely updating the parliament or assembly or council on their progress. This will ensure that the deregulation agenda becomes the new business as usual. By returning and ensuring the focus to cutting red tape will not only reduce inefficient and ineffective regulation, it will ensure that government gets out of the way of Australian business. Senator Billick. Thank you. I've been contacted by the Hydrocephalus Support Association and the Neurosurgical Society of Australasia about the future of the Australasian Shunt Registry. The registry was established in 2013 with seed funding from the Department of Health and Ageing, and up until now, the Neurosurgical Society has fully funded the ongoing operation of the registry. Now, the NSA is unable to afford these ongoing recurrent costs, and without public funding, this valuable service faces imminent suspension or closure. The cost of maintaining the registry is around $100,000 a year. 
Now, while this is a lot of money for a small organisation like the NSA, for the federal budget, it's basically spare change. And for this relatively small amount of funding, there is an enormous potential for the registry to improve the quality of life for hydrocephalus patients and possibly even save lives. For those not familiar with the device, a shunt is used to treat hydrocephalus, a condition in which cerebro cerebrospinal fluid accumulates and puts pressure on the brain. Hydrocephalus can be congenital, that is, present at birth, or acquired through causes like infections, head trauma, meningitis and brain tumours, to name a few. The symptoms of the condition can be quite debilitating, including headaches, vomiting, drowsiness and even seizures. And as someone who has experienced hydrocephalus because of my brain tumours in 2008, I can tell you it's not a very pleasant experience. A shunt creates a passage through which cerebro cerebrospinal fluid can be drained to another cavity in the body. While the device itself is inexpensive, inserting a shunt requires expensive surgery. But what is particularly expensive is when the shunt fails. One hospital, the Westmead Children's Hospital, studied the cost of shunt infection, one of the most common forms of shunt failure, and found that it cost the hospital $1.5 million annually. That's a cost of a little over $80,000 per treatment. The benefit of the registry is that it collects data on shunt procedures and shunt failures. With this data, the registry can identify the factors that lead to high rates of shunt failure. For example, by recording the time between shunt insertion and failure, it can provide measurements of shunt longevity. The registry can help identify which shunt components are associated with high failure rates and also whether there are issues with particular products. It can also look at the failure rates associated with particular hospitals and provide feedback on the quality of care provided. This registry is a valuable tool for informing clinical practice and decision making when it comes to improving the outcomes of hydrocephalus patients, and it's been highly successful in terms of participation. 99 per cent of public and private hospital hospitals performing shunt procedures are participating in the registry, and only 6 per cent of patients have opted out of having their procedure listed on the registry. As a result, over 2,100 procedures have been entered into the registry. So, As I mentioned earlier, infections at Westmead Children's Hospital were found in 2013 to cost over $80,000 each to correct. If these costs are typical for shunt failure, then the registry could almost pay for itself by preventing just one failure per year. Preventing shunt failure is not only important because of the substantial costs of correcting it. As I'm sure you can imagine, any form of shunt failure can result in devastating outcomes for the patient. In some cases, it can lead to permanent disability or even death. The rate of failure for shunts listed on the registry is currently around 37 per cent. These failures don't just put a strain on our hospital resources, they have devastating health consequences for patients and their families. Given the valuable input the registry is providing into the factors leading to shunt failure, $100,000 a year is a very small price to pay to keep the registry going. When the Hydrocephalus Support Association wrote to the Minister for Health about this issue, his department sent a response suggesting the Neurological Society apply for funding under the Research Data Infrastructure Initiative. This initiative was due to have projects underway in July this year, yet the first round of funding has not even been opened for applications, so this is of little use to the Australasian Shunt Registry, which needs funding now. In their July budget update, the government announced $5.7 million funding for medical registries. And I'm curious to know why these four registries were considered worthy of funding, and I don't doubt that they are, but not the shunt registry. The Australasian shunt registry and the hydrocephalus patients who rely on it need a funding solution Thank and you, they need Senator it now. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I rise to speak about how the Tasmanian government has navigated the coronavirus pandemic firmly and compassionately over the past six months. This steady leadership has ensured my home state and its residents have remained safe. Tasmania is an island state which has afforded us a level of protection not enjoyed by our mainland cousins. However, this protection has not been taken for granted. 
Premier Peter Gutwin has put the health of the state's residents first throughout this pandemic, while also being mindful of the huge impact it has had at an economic and at a social level. Tasmania was the first to ban cruise ships and enforce strict border controls to protect the state. At the time, Premier Gutwin said if we went hard and went early, we stood a good better chance of getting on top of coronavirus and returning to our way of life sooner. During the COVID-19 outbreak in the state's northwest, which has been traced back to, to the Ruby Princess cruise ship, Tasmania was quick to ask for federal assistance. The Australian Defence Force team arrived swiftly, and within a short time, the outbreak was under control. Since that point, our COVID-19 cases have been low and we have no active cases at the moment. In addition to the extensive supports provided by the Australian government during this pandemic, the Tasmanian government has also committed significantly with a package worth more than $1 billion. Tasmanians have been buoyed by this. At more than 3 per cent of our gross state product, it is the largest state or territory support and stimulus package in the country in proportion to the size of our economy. These measures have included freezing, waiving or capping fees and charges for businesses like water and electricity bills, payroll tax waivers for the hospitality and tourism industries, $80 million in business grants and targeted loans. Key sectors like construction and tourism have been and will continue to be stimulated because these industries hold the key to the state's economic recovery. Then there was the state's vital support for temporary visa holders and those who are homeless plus extra funding for community organisations helping vulnerable Tasmanians. This funding has helped those organisations to address important social issues like child safety and wellbeing and family violence. Millions of dollars have been allocated to mental health support services and continuing the state's health preparedness and response. The local government sector has also been supported with up to $200 million in interest-free loans so our councils, in turn, can help their communities rebuild and recover. And it's working. While the state has been hit significantly in economic terms, the impact has not been as severe as first forecast. The most recent ComSec report found Tasmania had the strongest economy in the country and the census report showed our businesses are still the most confident in the nation. ABS labour force data shows job growth, growth has returned, with more than 7,000 Tasmanians returning to work in July. And at 6 per cent, the state's unemployment rate is much lower than anticipated at the beginning of this crisis. Tasmanians have a very strong community spirit. We are unashamedly Tasmanian first. We have pride in our state, and that attitude has stood us in good stead as we navigate this pandemic. When Tasmania was locked down, we shared resources with our neighbours and reaffirmed our commitment to community. We did all we could to support local. Instead of going out to our favourite restaurants, we started buying takeaway meals from those restaurants instead. Our grocers and butchers saw an uptick in trade as local produce became even more important. Once we could travel outside our immediate regions, we started moving around the state, supporting local traders, tourism operators and accommodation providers along the way, and we will continue to do this. The combination of coordinated health and economic stimulus has supported Tasmania to stay safe in its bid to, to suppress COVID-19 and weather this storm so far. However, there are still more hurdles to jump. The threat of community transmission of this deadly virus is never far away. We are now approaching spring and summer, which are traditionally busy times in Tasmania and especially for our agricultural, tourism and hospitality industries. These industries are learning to operate in a new normal, as are their customers. This is when we will rally to stay safe. We are by no means at the end of this chapter in our state's history, but we are working hard to make the best from what is an extremely difficult situation. Strong leadership by our state government in support of our health and treasury departments has put us in a good position to continue through this pandemic. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge Tasmanian Premier Peter Gutwin and the Health, Small Businesses and Hospitality Minister, the Honourable Sarah Courtney, and thank them for their outstanding leadership. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to speak about uh, those in our country, those who have gone before us, generations gone by, uh, who've laid down their life and made the ultimate sacrifice for uh, the generations to come. In this instance, I'm talking about uh, the late and recently recognised ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan, 
uh, who was on the 12th of August um, recognised uh, appropriately, uh, appropriately so, and finally uh, with the Victoria Cross for his acts of bravery, something that uh, has been a subject of a great deal of debate in Tasmania um, and the uh, subject of very, very long uh, and energetic campaigns by a great many Tasmanians, both uh, members of the public but also members of uh, both the Tasmanian and Commonwealth parliaments. And so I just wanted to reflect on that tonight and what a wonderful outcome it finally has been for uh, the late ordinary uh, seaman Teddy Sheehan and his family to finally have his bravery and gallantry recognised. Um, by way of background, uh, and I'm sure the amount of uh, coverage that's been given to the case being made for uh, Teddy Sheehan to be awarded a VC has probably outlined uh, quite extensively his act of bravery in the last moments of his life when, uh, of course, uh, the order was given for the crew of the HMAS Armadale uh, to uh, evacuate the ship um, as it was going down. Uh, Teddy Sheehan strapped himself into the gun at the stern of the ship uh, and uh, started firing uh, at the Japanese aircraft that was strafing the uh, sinking HMAS Armadale. Uh, all to protect his uh, fellow crew members who were uh, seeking to uh, make their way to safety, uh, having um, disembarked the sinking ship, uh, he sacrificed his life for them. Uh, what an ultimate act of bravery, something that's never been in question. However, uh, after years, many, many years, 17 years of campaign uh, to have Teddy Sheehan recognised in the highest way when it comes to military awards and honours. Uh, finally, we've uh, arrived at a place where that recognition has been provided. Um, the process that had been gone through was extensive uh, and sadly one that uh, became a public debate, uh, certainly in the Tasmanian media. But the one thing that we all had to remember on the way through is that this was not a political debate. The awarding of the VC, the granting of this award, this honour to those who've made sacrifices previously, it's not in the domain of politicians to grant it. It is not something that can be done with a stroke of a pen by anyone in this building, indeed anyone in this country. It's an award given by Her Majesty the Queen uh, and the Governor-General on her behalf, which is what happened on the 12th of August. But uh, the review that was undertaken, headed up by uh, the Honourable Dr Brendan Nelson, uh, the former director of the War Memorial, found the right outcome, and that was that it was right to recognise uh, former uh, ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan uh, for the acts of bravery he committed that I've outlined earlier on. I do want to pay tribute to the Tasmanians who have contributed to this outcome, those who have tirelessly campaigned uh, over the long period of time and even more recently for this outcome. Uh, I do want to start by paying tribute to a good friend and uh, colleague in the Tasmanian parliament of mine, um, Guy Barnett, a former member of this place, uh, for his tireless advocacy for the outcome that has been achieved today, and I think it's important to put that on record. But also my colleagues, uh, Gavin Pearce, Bridget Archer, uh, Senator Askew, who uh, was the, uh, has just concluded her adjournment contribution tonight, and all the members of the Tasmanian uh, federal Liberal team have advocated behind the scenes um, uh, for this outcome. Uh, it is the right outcome. And also, indeed, it is a Team Tassie approach. As I said, this is not a political outcome. This is not a political issue. It was not a political decision. And so I do have to acknowledge also um, Jackie Lambie for her work in advocating for this outcome as well as a, uh, a strong representative of the, nor the northwest coast of Tasmania. She made her views clear. Uh, all Tasmanians wanted to recognise this uh, very, very proud Tasmanian son, uh, someone who has done so much for our country, uh, made the ultimate sacrifice. And so all of us in Tasmania, we are pleased with that, this outcome. Uh, we wish Teddy's family well and we hope that uh, his descendants uh, cherish um, and relish uh, the honour that's been bestowed upon him and his family for the sacrifice that's been made. Senator Green. Thank you. I want to begin my contribution tonight by acknowledging the very real economic impact that COVID-19 has had on regional Queensland, particularly on far north Queensland, where tourism is a major direct and indirect employer. 
A crisis of this sort isn't actually new for Cairns, but it will certainly be the worst. And that's what I said in February when I stood up in Cairns and called for support from the Morrison government. I said that this crisis would hit Cairns first and it would hit Cairns worst. Many locals uh, share stories about the pilot strike in 1989 and the impact that that had on the economy. After the GFC, Cairns was one of the last places to recover. And today, we have learned that Qantas will cut jobs in Cairns, deciding to outsource baggage handlers at Jetstar and possibly Qantas as well. And while luckily, because we have kept Queensland safe and open, we do have tourists coming from all over Queensland, and the flights between Brisbane and Cairns remain one of the busiest routes. The impact of this outbreak, though, has been devastating. The crisis has renewed calls for far north Queensland to diversify its economy by building on the, our inherent strengths. And it also raises questions about the lack of federal leadership over the last seven years to implement a plan to do just this, to crisis-proof far north Queensland. COVID has also taught Queenslanders the very hard lesson that we need to build and make more things at home. We can't rely on traditional supply chains anymore, and products that are built cheaply overseas become even more costly during a crisis because they don't support local jobs. I know that manufacturing matters to regional Queensland, and that's why I launched a campaign to bring manufacturing back home and to call on the Morrison government to invest in manufacturing and deliver a local jobs plan. And I thank each and every single Queenslander who has supported this campaign so far. This is what our regions are crying out for right now. We already build trains and maintain ships in Queensland. We are uniquely geographically placed to do this and even more. We make pallets, fabricate steel, and we can even turn our world-class famous gin into hand sanitizer or produce PPE. We can manufacture more advanced technologies as well and meet our medical needs of the future in regional Queensland. Throughout this campaign, I've been speaking to manufacturing businesses across North Queensland, and they say this to me. They say, we can do this. We can manufacture what we need right here, but we haven't had the support. We haven't had the investment in skills, and we need certainty from this government about energy policy so we can plan for the future and bring energy costs down. For seven years, this Liberal national government has turned its back on regional manufacturers. Under Scott Morrison's watch, Australia ranks last on the manufacturing self-sufficiency ratings compared to developed economies. For the LNP, manufacturing is just a buzzword. They talk about it, but they never support it. They challenged Australia's car manufacturers to leave Australia, and they let the industry die on their watch. The LNP cut $3 billion from TAFE and haven't invested in the skills that manufacturers need to survive. Recent reports show the Prime Minister himself had to tell his own MPs to get out of their comfort zone to support manufacturing. Well, we know that they can't and we know that they won't because the Liberal National Party slashes and they cut and they wreck and they spend more time fighting for their own jobs than fighting for yours. This week, when jobs are being lost in regional Queensland, our so-called regional representatives in the National Party are fighting each other again, jockeying for leadership positions again, when people are losing their jobs in regional Queensland. Labor builds and Labor fights for jobs. Queenslanders will never forget that it was the LNP that sent trains to be built in India when it was Anastasia Palaszczuk and the Queensland Labor government that brought them back to Maribara. We need to bring manufacturing back home. Senator Brockman. Deputy President, uh, I'll I rise tonight uh, to talk about an issue that's very close to my heart. As, as many in this place would know, I'm a passionate advocate for agriculture, 
particularly for agriculture in my home state of Western Australia, and particularly uh, due to my own uh, personal experiences on a family farm with the livestock industry and the live export trade, a trade that is vitally important to communities across regional WA. Now, as, as those interested in this issue would know, a number of months ago there was a COVID outbreak, uh, outbreak amongst the crew members of a, a sheep carrier, the LQ8. Uh, it was meant to, uh, to depart ahead of the northern export moratorium, but unfortunately, due to that outbreak of COVID, the ship was delayed. Now, the exporter, to its credit, understood the importance of continuing the trade and worked very hard to ensure that this voyage could be completed safely. It was granted, eventually, an exemption that had allowed the vessel to depart Fremantle on the 19th of June. Tonight, I am absolutely pleased to report to the Senate that despite the voyage taking place during the Northern, summer, Northern Hemisphere summer moratorium period, the animal welfare outcomes reported from this journey were exceptional. And that is contrary to some of the nonsense we have heard about this particular voyage from activists. Uh, and in fact, I have the independent observer's summary report here in front of me, and I will, uh, if I have time, read a, a small part of that uh, later. To give you the details of the journey, out of the 33,341 sheep aboard, there were just 28 mortalities recorded on the voyage, a rate of 0.08%, a 99.9% .9 delivery success rate. And, and importantly, and I think this is the key point, uh, none of those 28 deaths, one of, none of those 28 mortalities were attributable to heat stress. Now, while some have campaigned relentlessly against this important industry to regional Western Australia, this voyage is evidence that the trade can continue, it can continue to be carried out humanely and in accordance with our world-leading animal welfare standards. I've said it in this place many times and I'm going to say it again. We do not export just animals. We do not export just livestock. We export animal welfare standards. And this trade, and this government understands that this trade, is the lifeblood of regional families, particularly in my home state of Western Australia. And it's absolutely vital, and we must always remember this, across the chamber we must remember that this trade is vital to the food security of many of our friends and trading partners, particularly in the Middle East, but elsewhere as well. Last week, I was lucky enough to join my good friends, uh, Rick Wilson, the member for O'Connor, and Steve Martin, who is a, a Liberal candidate for the agricultural region in the upcoming state election, on a live export road show across Western Australian wheat belt, uh, visiting such places as Darkin, Darkin Kojanup, Katani, to update local farmers. And uh, we were joined on that by Holly Ludeman, a, a young vet who has uh, been an absolute champion of the industry. and She has been instrumental in forming what is called uh, the Sheep Collective and what has uh, broadened out to be the Livestock Collective. And one of the things that Holly showed us on that road show was a time-lapse uh, video aboard the actual ship involved. Uh, during the period when the heat uh, aboard the ship did rise above a, a, a wet bulb of 28. In fact, I think it got to 32 at one point during the voyage. And I think, and I would encourage everyone out there who is listening to this, who is interested in this trade, whether you are for this trade or if you are against this trade, to go and have a look at that video. Because that video very clearly demonstrates the humane way in which those animals were transported even during this summer moratorium period. Senator Polly. Thank you. I rise tonight to speak about COVID-19 pandemic 
and its effect on our way of life across the country and in my home state of Tasmania. Specifically, I want to reflect on the last four months that has changed my perspective on our country and my home state. This pandemic has changed our country and the world more than we currently know, and its effects will last for not days, weeks or months, but for years and possibly decades. Our way of life has been shaken and the lives of Tasmanians have been changed dramatically, with 230 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Tasmania. Sadly, 13 Tasmanians lost their lives to this virus. Over the last few months, these families have had to mourn their loved ones in solitary confinement without being able to say a proper goodbye. It's tragic, extremely sad for our community and for the Australian community more broadly. Senators in this place come from their respective states and territories across the country to meet here and we all have a certain respect for one another because of our belief in our communities and we believe in representative democracy. We are all linked by this bond and know that we are extremely privileged that we are able to come into this place and contribute to national debate. We know that we are lucky as a country that we have been able to navigate this pandemic in a way that has made me proud to be an Australian. Were there mistakes made? Yes. Should we learn from these mistakes? Of course we must. But we pull together as a nation in the most trying of circumstances. This is what we do. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge all the Tasmanians that have worked tirelessly on the front line in health care, our AMBOs, those in aged care, their workforces, whether they're in a caring role, whether they're cleaners, whether they're in admin, whether they're doctors, whether they're nurses or ground staff. I would like to express my personal gratitude for your tireless work in protecting our fellow Tasmanians. Despite the uncertainty present, these workers have risked their lives and their bravery to be commended as it has been instrumental in keeping our society functioning. To the Tasmanian nurses who have willingly travelled to Victoria to support aged care facilities working under immense pressure and having to undergo hotel quarantine upon return, I say thank you. To all our supermarket and essential retail workers, I acknowledge your contribution and say thank you. Despite the panic buying that ensured, there was always faith that shops would be restocked and that we could rely on them being able to access these essential goods and services. To all our truckies who kept Tasmania moving and transported medical supplies and food to Tasmanians who needed it in the most desperate of times, I say thank you. To all our teachers who had to quickly evolve and adapt and provide online learning for their students, for those who risked their health to make sure that children had a safe place to go and study throughout the peak of the COVID restrictions, I say thank you. And to Australia Post workers who had to deal with increased workloads and pressure, I say thank you. I feel particularly fortunate to represent the people of Tasmania. I always have. But this pandemic has provided a unique perspective. Many view Bass Strait as something of a disadvantage, that 500 kilometres stretch of beautiful but treacherous water separating Tasmania to the mainland Australia has been the rock that Tasmania needed during this crisis. Many people have expressed its likeness to a moat protecting us from mainland counterparts which experience COVID-19 infections in far greater numbers. I am Tasmanian and I know I'm lucky. I believe many Tasmanians feel the same way and a true sense of admiration and love for their state post-COVID-19. The health and economic circumstances of this pandemic will be felt for years in my home state and has already experienced economic effects. We are a small island of 500,000 people, a destination that the world loves and wants to visit. They have not been able to visit and they will not for some time. Our industries have been decimated by the effects of social isolation and in particular retail, restaurants, cafes, pubs and clubs, small businesses across many industries are still hurting. 
Small business in Tasmania is a backbone of the Tasmanian economy. There are over 40,000 businesses in our community, and 95 per cent of those are small businesses employing on average 1 to 19 employees. These businesses are made up of local people which deserve our support because we are a close-knit community which supports one another. As we emerge from this crisis, it is crucial we support local small businesses in our cities, our suburbs and regions. I ask you to do your bit wherever you can. There are many ways we can support local businesses, including buying goods in person or online, like sharing or commenting on their business social media, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about a small business. Lastly, if you can buy from a local small business, do just that. No excuses. Be vocal and shop local. We must also provide further support for the nearly 30,000 Tasmanians who have lost their jobs now or are underemployed as a result of this pandemic. Now is the time to invest in our people by providing free TAFE so that when we emerge from this pandemic we have a skilled workforce who are equipped to face the challenges and to have the skills to help build our economy. We must not forget that our agriculture industry in this pandemic. As we have become increasingly reliant on China as a destination for our exports and amidst the growing uncertainty of their punitive trade punishments, we need to diversify our export markets to help protect our world-class produce. We also need to reskill local Tasmanians to set them up for a career in agriculture as without domestic and international travel, they are currently facing severe labour shortages. We certainly have the supply of labour. However, there are barriers. We need, to be, we need to be removed in order to encourage Tasmanians to work throughout the harvest. Australia has outperformed most countries in the response to COVID-19, and it is a true indicative of our robust, robust society. However, as we emerge in a different world, a COVID-19 world, the government must adapt its policy approach and institute significant structural change that will serve the interest of all Australians. And as we've spoken about in this chamber yesterday and today, there is no greater tragedy of the COVID-19 than the effect on small business and our economy. But we also must ensure the health and welfare of all Australians. And we have seen this government let down some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Okay. That's those that who are in them. residential aged care, those that receive home care help. This government has failed older Australians and their families. We have acknowledged the tragedy of the in excess of now 335 older Australians who have died from COVID-19. We have spoken about the heartache of their families not being able to be there to hold their hands as they pass from this world. That is something those families will never, ever forget, and our heart goes out to them. But we can do better. This government must do better. It is unacceptable to say that we are doing better than other countries. One more death that could be avoided in residential aged care due to COVID-19, the lack of preparedness, the lack of a plan, the lack of resources and the lack of training is not going to be acceptable to the Australian people. This is a wake-up call to this government. They called a royal commission into their own failings. Every bit of evidence justifies our concerns, the concerns that has been expressed by senator after senator after senator on this side. We are the ones that are out in the community. We're getting the calls from family, desperate families who just want to know that their loved ones are going to be supported and cared for and given the best possible care that they can have in residential aged care. There is nothing that is going to be acceptable other than a 100 per cent improvement by this government. 
Um, Senator Lambie and Senator Scar, with your agreement, if you're all right with that, I might give the call to Senator Walsh for five minutes. Um, she missed her uh, spot because a couple of people didn't turn up. Thank you. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, well, these are really tough times. This extraordinary health crisis has created an extraordinary jobs crisis with our first recession in almost 30 years. People are doing it tough. People are losing their jobs and businesses. And what they need from the Morrison government is a plan, a plan to protect jobs and a plan to rebuild jobs in our country. These are times that call for strong leadership. People need their government to step up and take action. They need substance, not spin, delivery, not doorstops, and details, not photo ops. Australians need to know, they deserve to know, exactly how Scott Morrison and his government will rebuild jobs in this country. Today, over one million Australians are unemployed for the first time in history. One and a half million Australians can't find enough work, and the government expects another 400,000 Australians to lose their jobs before Christmas. But all we're getting right now is slogans that grab a headline for a day and then weeks of waiting, weeks of waiting for details that never come. And for those almost three million Australians who could be unemployed or underemployed by the end of the year, this is just not good enough. Take Home Builder. This was a scheme to help keep tradies in jobs. But since it was announced, there's been zero approvals and zero payments made. Take Job JobKeeper, a plan that specifically excluded the very workers whose jobs were shut down by COVID, casuals in hospitality, contractors in the arts and entertainment, and anyone working in a university. Job Trainer, a scheme apparently designed to boost vocational training. But with the $3 billion of cuts the government have made over the past seven years to our TAFEs, the government needs more than a slogan to get people trained up and back to work. And Jobmaker, great name, still no detail. I understand that the government wants to sell their policies to the public, but that can't be all there is. There needs to be detail. And these policies need to give hope to Australians who are doing it really tough because when there isn't detail, there isn't a plan. Workers lose their jobs and businesses go under, and that is happening right now. What is the plan for the early childhood educators who were kicked off JobKeeper and are now being stood down across Victoria? What is the plan for hospi hospitality workers and small businesses who are struggling to survive in our major cities? What is the plan for the rural uh, tourism industry with our international borders closed? What is the plan for our universities who are laying off staff right now? What is the plan for our manufacturing sector, which has been decimated under this government and needs to rebuild? What is the plan for the arts, where support was announced in June and not a single dollar has been spent? What is the government's plan to rebuild jobs in this country? The million people who are unemployed, the one and a half million people who don't have enough work, the 400,000 people the government expects to lose jobs in coming months, all these people, they need a plan. They don't need slogans, they don't need spin, they don't need photo ops, they don't need doorstops. They need a plan with details, a plan to rebuild jobs, to rebuild industries, to rebuild lives, and it's time the Morrison government delivered it. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Ms. Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, 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 here we go again. Once again, we have shocking evidence of the corruption that goes to the heart of both the major parties. Now, we know that both of them have been engaging in industrial scale branch stacking. More shocking, although it no longer shocks me what goes on up here, I'll be honest, is the allegation that electoral staff were being used to recruit more members and that senior Liberals knew all about it. It is absolutely shocking behaviour, but once again, it doesn't shock me. As you can see, I'm just no longer shocked with the behaviour that happens in politics. It's beyond disgusting, but it's not surprising, because let's face it, it happens, it continues to happen. And once again, there's no ICAC, and I wonder why. I wonder why. 
The latest scandal has had its fair share of faceless men too. This one was just like the other ones. Young guy comes in, probably because his mother didn't put a boot fair enough up his clucker enough, which is, I'll tell you what, he's lucky he's not my son, because that's exactly what he would have got. Focused on fighting factional fights instead of actually achieving anything for the public interest. Never putting the country first, not putting the country first or its people, all about self. He spends every waking minute trying to roll the, medal, the moderate members of his own Liberal Party. He targeted, he targeted religious people and others who had little or no interest in joining the Liberal Party. And once he had all these signatures, he looked like he had lots of members and lots of power. Well, didn't you come unstuck, little boy? Didn't you come unstuck? And tell you that's how branch stacking works. It's that easy, and it will continue because we do absolutely nothing about it. That's what I refer to as that's branch stacking 101. These faceless men do it because they want to overrule genuine members of the party. They do it to suit their own political purposes, and they, all they care about is their own self-interest. It is really past the point of absolutely disgusting, and I wish you people up here would finally wake up to it that we need NICAP. Because this will continue until people start going to jail for this sort of thing, and you start leading by example. Genuine recruiters are necessary in any party, but signing people up so it looks like you have lots of members is not democracy. It's rigging the system. Actually, it's absolutely political, co political corruption at its very best. And yet it just seems to be the norm up here. That's how bad it's got. Oh, oh that's all right. It's just the norm. It's all right. It'll be all right. And the ministers right at the top of this government have benefited from it. The housing minister benefited from it. The former minister from the defence, which doesn't surprise me with him, benefited from it. And nothing will be done. Nothing will be done about it. The Liberal Party will not discipline their own, just like the Labor Party won't do much for theirs either. And this behaviour will continue. Because guess what? There's very little disciplinary action for when you misbehave. And this is called leadership. People are supposed to look up to us in this House. You call this leadership. I don't know what planet you're on, but it's not leadership. I can tell you that right now. What's even worse is that these schemes are reported to have been operating out, out of the electoral offices, once again, doesn't surprise me, of senior members of the Liberal government. Senior members. Senior members. Electoral staffers and their officers are paid for by the Australian taxpayer. That's the right taxpayers out there. They're paying to win their seats to branch stack on your cash. Isn't it great? And that's taking those dirty, filthy political donations on top. That's where we're at. They're there to assist the public and give them help and guidance where they can. That's what they're supposed to be. That is their purpose of your electoral office. I can tell you, in my electoral office, it's too busy to be playing up because that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're on call 24-7. My staff field calls not just from Tasmania but all over the country. And then let's say we have an overkill of veterans and defence personnel on top because nobody else seems to understand the system and scenes certainly cannot help them. Last month, for example, we had a blind 90-year-old pensioner, God bless him. He lives alone and had his funeral cash stashed under his bed. I do love some of these stories because you can't help but at least see a bit of the funny side. He'd recently been robbed, and although he was fine, he was fine, he was not at home, and he was afraid the thieves were coming back. He was so terrified that they would steal the $9,000 he had saved to bury himself that at one stage he had buried it under his, under, he'd buried under, his, under his bed and forgot where he put it. So that was our first dilemma. After several calls over a couple of days, my staff finally found out who his carers were because we couldn't work that out either to the point where we were about to go out and see him and, and go through his house. But anyway, his, we found his, money, his funeral money was found safe and sound. His carers finally helped him get, back into the, get the money back into the bank. And that's what we're there for. We're there to help. And that's a, that's a lovely story, and we have plenty of them. And like I said, some of them are, are quite uh, You've got to see the funny side. But anyway, the whole thing is we're there to help. Then we have the veterans. They call us from all over the country and some from outside. And I can't count the number of times they call my office talking about taking their lives. I've lost count. I can't tell you the amount of times I've been up at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to talk them down from the ledge or from trying to put a rope around their necks. Or the girl that is employed, I don't get extra staffing, but does this 24-7 as well, one of the electoral staff. That's what we do. You know, she's so appreciated. In the last two weeks, she's had three lots of flowers because she's got these claims through. She's fabulous. God love you, Karen. One of these guys have been waiting 18 months just to get one part of his claim assessed. 
and he comes in for help and two weeks later he's receiving the help he needs and we're getting him back on his feet. I tell you what, you feel a lot more proud of knowing you're doing that stuff than branch stacking. It's a lot more hardier in here than what those political donations of branch stacking will ever give you. I'll tell you that now. And I'm pretty sure My staff are amazing and they are always happy to help. That is what Australian public pays for and it's what they expect and from my office that's what they get. My staff are not there to spruik Jackie Lambie. We have to raise our own money for that and that's the way it is and that's the way it should be. And during elections we have to stand at traffic lights with signs. You won't see any other senator in Australia doing that, I doubt. You won't see another senator borrowing someone else's van and putting Jackie Lambie all over it. And, you know, and trying to, and having little ladies, grannies come up and give her two and three dollars so she can get a coffee. You know, that, that's what it's all about because we earn it, we don't buy it, and we don't branch stack. That's the way it is. And yet senior members of the Liberal Party think it's fine to use their electorate staff for their own polit party political purposes because they'd rather buy or branch stack than earn. These people don't get into politics to make people's lives better, they get into politics to make their own lives better for their own egos, their own self-indulgence. Apparently anything goes right. The worst thing about the latest branch stacking scandal is that almost exactly the same story came out a few months ago, except this time the party behaving badly was the Labor Party. Once again, it was branch stacking on an industrial scale. And in this case, it was a senior Labor Victorian government minister using taxpayers' money and his own cash. He was creating fake branch members to, create, to build his own profile in the Labor Party. He resigned from the Victorian government the next day. And I have to say that uh, the Labor Party moved on that fairly quickly. At least they showed some leadership. Still waiting for you guys over there. Any time you want to switch on to what's going on, get up with the program, that'd be great. Show some leadership, maybe. But I'll tell you what, a minister resigning and a branch stacker being fired is not going to fix the de-corruption in our political parties. We've had the usual finger pointing from both sides of politics. The truth is, most of the time you're as bad as each other. Whether it's branch stacking, Audi bags full of cash or helicopters being used as glorified taxi service. And, it's ex it, and it is not acceptable. It is totally unacceptable. The Australians have had a gut full of the corrupt behaviour of the major parties. Politicians are elected and funded by the people of Australia to make the best decisions for our country, not themselves. They don't seem to care about the Australian people these days, and it's all about feathering, the, uh, feathering their own, own, own careers, building their own power networks, getting themselves re-elected. And while these stories pop up all the time, the politicians bicker between themselves, the public rolls their eyes, and Australia's faith in our political system has hit rock bottom. The good, the good news is that, unlike coronavirus, there is a cure for political corruption, and it's called a Federal Anti-Corruption Commission. And we need one now. We needed one yesterday, and we're going to need it tomorrow because there's always a, another faceless man waiting in the lines to break the rules of his own political bet for his own political benefit. And there's one thing the major parties have no shortage of. It's ambitious young pups with no idea how to help the country and plenty of ideas how to rip the ta taxpayer off and help themselves and their mates. It's why I've called for an ICAC with sharp teeth, bigger, sheep than, bigger, sharp, bigger teeth than jaws, because it's got to have a bite. And by hell of Christ, it's got to have one hell of a bite. We need to see who is putting in the cash in the brown paper bags and who is being promised a golden job opportunity because the faceless men must be unmasked and there must be real consequences for bad behaviour and the Anti-Corruption Commission can do that. And we need to do serious donation reform while we're at it. Let's just hit it all. Just a few months ago, the Labor and Liberal parties tried to push a bill through this place that would have overridden state donation laws. So if we don't get the money out of politics, nothing will change. It will just get worse. Both the parties say they have the bills ready to go on the national ICAC. But where are they? Come on! What are you scared of? Not good enough? Not strong enough? Bring it on. I think it's about time the major parties woke up to the fact that the bodies are done with this crap. There's nothing left to say. Thank you very much, Senator Lambie. Can I just remind people that it is difficult in the chair to hear if we have continual side conversations? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Tonight I want to put on the record the experience of an heroic young Australian, a young woman who deserves a medal for bravery and for resilience. AMP tried to silence her. Tonight I use my platform as a female Labor senator to give her words public voice. I'm a former employee of AMP and I'm a sexual harassment survivor. Through the last eight weeks I've relived my experience and it is with utter dismay that I see the AMP system remains as it ever was. As a junior female employee, I endured consistent and systemic, systematic harassment at AMP 
from men at the peer level to executive level. After speaking up, I was bullied, victimised and ultimately silenced. My time at AMP destroyed my life, and it's taken everything that I have to rebuild parts of it. Yet my life, will my life will never be the same again. The perpetrators, including those who swept me under the rug, have gone on to thrive. During my tenure, I raised formal complaints with the company, including via external legal representatives, but none of these were resolved safely, let alone satisfactorily. Two of these cases were escalated, but in one instance the perpetrator was given a warning and allowed to remain. He also harassed another colleague who left the industry as a result of this and sustained sexual harassment by two, ma two managers, while the other, my manager, was repeatedly promoted. The harassment I suffered ranged from receiving sexually explicit photos and emails expressing a desire to have sex with me, constant and public propositioning, including in front of some of the company's largest clients, physical harassment, including being touched repeatedly by a leadership team member at the office, a senior colleague groping me at an off-site, and another forcing himself on me by rubbing his genitals against me at a work function. Finally, and in my experience most egregiously, my direct manager threatened to end my career if I did not follow his sexual wishes while alone with him on a work trip. In this last experience, I felt in fear of my physical safety. I knew, as a woman does by a certain age, that I was at his mercy, physical mercy. My saving grace was that he was blind drunk, and as he went to pour himself another drink, I ran. I immediately called a friend. Distraught and terrified, I could not stop shaking. I'd been down the path previously of raising a harassment complaint, so I knew I needed help to be taken seriously. I engaged legal representatives who helped me draft a letter. They told me these cases were very difficult as they required me to lodge in court in order for organisations to take them seriously, which would mean public disclosure of my name and likely difficulty in future career endeavours. They told me that organisations often took their chances, knowing that women would be unable, unwilling to risk ruining their lives and unable to afford hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees. I therefore felt I had no choice but to seek internal resolution, cautiously. I requested an apology and a removal from his area, coverage of my legal and medical costs and sexual harassment training for the organisation. I did not ask for more. As I was petrified, inexperienced and in a financially perilous position as a young employee. Like Julia Slikowski, my experience warranted an independent investigation, except that in my case an internal lawyer undertook this so-called independent work. Over the next several months I was placed on medical leave and was directly discouraged from lodging a workers' compensation request by a member of the executive leadership team. I was ultimately bewildered and suffered from trauma-induced anxiety, depression and insomnia. I did not understand what was happening. I was explicitly and repeatedly told that I was not allowed to speak to anyone about the matter. The friend and colleague that I asked to accompany me to the first meeting was told they would be terminated if they spoke a word about the matter and were told not they were not allowed to accompany me again. The man on the leadership team, who was well known for his uninvited, uninvited caressing of younger female employees, suddenly stepped in to manage the investigation and subsequent communication with me. I was treated like a criminal. I was called in for cross-examination, where I was asked accusing questions as though I was making it up or taking it too seriously. I was asked whether I truly believed the, entailed sexual, the act actually entailed sexual harassment. Throughout this process, I was systematically broken down, isolated and bullied. After two months of dragged-out proceedings, I was a shadow of my former self. I was given an unsigned report that declared my manager had made a serious transgression against me. Despite the report finding that I was a victim and not the guilty party that had been made to feel that I had been made to feel, I was then told I would be given a role in the same division as my manager, reporting into that same handsy leader who had run the investigation. No other reparations would be made. I was given five days to sign an NDA or lose my job. I'm almost certain this was illegal. I had run out of funds to pay my lawyers, was physically and psychologically destroyed, so I signed. It's difficult to explain how vulnerable I felt during this period. I've never felt more powerless and worthless. I was actively put under extreme pressure to make a decision while completely alone. I felt desperate and cornered. Prior to this, I was forthright, outgoing and well-spoken, but now I was at the mercy of higher-ups. I knew I was just one small person who would be crushed by the force of one of Australia's largest companies. Nonetheless, I thought it was 
I thought it was obvious that they would do the right thing because my harassment was unequivocal. I hoped that by agreeing I would salvage my career, retain my unblemished reputation and keep my livelihood. I was wrong. My new job was a clear demotion. I was photocopying documents after having had a significant and technical client-facing role. I was also told by my new manager that he wasn't interested in what happened to me and that I was required to attend meetings with my harasser. I discovered that my harasser had told others I was dismissed from his area due to performance issues which were untrue. My mental health deteriorated further. Instead of having a new beginning, I paid penance for speaking up. In the meetings with my former manager, I would physically cower. I stopped speaking almost altogether to anyone at or outside work. This became untenable, but I could not afford to leave. I did not have the capacity to find another job. I was too broken. On my final day at AMP, my former manager entered the elevator in which I was standing alone. He came up to me, stood inches away, then growled at me, bursting into laughter as he did. By the time the lift doors opened on the ground floor, I was on the floor sobbing. My time at AMP changed me from an optimistic, ambitious professional to a shadow. It ended my career in finance, it resulted in an irrevocable long-term damage to me that I carry every day. I was a promising and highly skilled individual with tenacity and self-assuredness. I'd been earmarked by the firm as a high potential and was on a peer level with men who were a decade ahead of me in their careers. I worked my heart out to get where I was. I carried the men I worked for. My experience of being harassed and the subsequent victimisation I suffered has deeply wounded me and resulted in several false starts in finding a new career. In pure financial terms, it's reduced my earnings so far by many hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. I've also invested tens of thousands of dollars to reskill and continue receiving psychological su support. This is a hidden cost. When this happens to women in the prime period of potential of their careers, it snatches away a lifetime. I was driven out of my career, in which I'd invested over a decade of study and experience. I was thrown out of the industry and hung out to dry, while the perpetrators not only remained but thrived. The cost was immeasurable to me, yet they were rewarded. The, me the message is clear to victims. You will lose everything if you speak up. There are many good people at AMP, including some of my closest friends. Some are wonderful leaders who have focused on a strong, inclusive culture. This was certainly the case in one part of the business where such behaviour has been systematically eradicated over recent years. However, it only takes a handful of rotten apples to spoil the barrel, and in this case, it's obvious who those rotten apples are. Not only are they the direct perpetrators, but it is the people who enable them. They are equally, if not more, culpable. They are the ones who hold the power to change, but they do not. They only see what matters to themselves, and that is too often their power, their money, and their public reputations for which they're willing to risk everything but themselves. They are inherently self-serving and, in being so, are unable to govern an organisation with the responsibility that leadership brings. Leadership in its truest form requires doing that which is difficult. Leadership is not self-service, cronyism, nor the perpetuation of a corrupt system that crushes the vulnerable. At AMP, the gatekeepers have until now continued to enable a system where women and the most vulnerable, as I once was, are abused. This sends a clear message not only to the good people at AMP but to our broader communities about what is acceptable. For past, present and future victims, what hope do we have? This particular story is like so many stories. That is the end of her testimony. But this particular story is like so many stories that are shared with me by men and women who are in the financial services sector. It has to stop. Bo Bahari was fined half a million dollars for doing something a lot like what I have just recorded for Australians to understand what's happening in the biggest companies in this country. Mr Bahari still got promoted. Well, yes, then he got demoted, but he still has a job with AMP. The woman, subjected to his harassment, lost her job and a career. This cannot continue. Australia is better than this. Come on, corporate Australia. Surely you can Thank you. To destroy this cultural Thank stain you, on our nation. Neil. Your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the issue of urgent aged care reform. Last week, the Prime Minister said in response to questions asked on ABC Breakfast that the Commonwealth regulates aged care, but when there is a public health pandemic, 
then public health is a state matter. These comments are akin to those he made during the bushfire crisis when he told a radio broadcaster, I don't hold a hose, mate. The vulnerability in aged care should have been obvious following the devastating outbreak at Newmarch House. Instead, devastating mistakes were repeated, this time on a massive scale. The government's handling of the pandemic crisis in aged care has been atrocious. And to describe the government's regulation of the aged care sector as lax is very much an understatement. It has been neglectful. I am deeply concerned that the government's rejection of Commissioner Tony Vigoni's recommendation to establish an aged care specific national coordinating body may set a precedent for other recommendations that the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety will make when it reports next February. Worse yet, I am worried the government's defensive attitude means we won't even see legislation in response to recommendations before the next election. Prime Minister Morrison has also said that on the days the system falls short, he is sorry. The reality is the aged care system is persistently falling short. It's falling short because of the systemic issues which have beset the sector since the inception of the Aged Care Act 23 years ago. The system was already broken before the pandemic crisis made aged care failures front page news. It's why we have a Royal Commission into the problems plaguing the sector, including chronic underfunding, underskilling and underpayment of staff, the lack of mandatory minimum staffing requirements, no minimum training qualifications and no transparency over how the over $20 billion of taxpayer money is paid to the sector every year. The word decanting has also entered our lexicon over the past week. Decanting is a dehumanising term used to describe the transfer of residents to hospital, and it is symptomatic of a symptom that system that increasingly treats our senior Australians living in aged care homes as commodities. It is not a system that treats them with the dignity and respect they deserve. This is not a blanket criticism of aged care workers. I know many of them wish that they could do more for the people in their care, but they are hamstrung by their working conditions and a lack of support or training. Staff in our aged care homes do incredible work in challenging circumstances, in a system that very much works against them and works against those they care for. We owe staff a debt of gratitude. We owe it to them and especially our senior Australians in aged care to make these things right. Staff in our aged care homes aren't paid well and there isn't enough of them to provide the care that is needed. They run off their feet because staffing levels are so low that they struggle to perform basic duties, let alone have the time to sit and have a meaningful conversation with a resident to show that they matter and that they are valued. If we are to deliver excellent relationship-centred care, aged care workers need to be supported. Quality of care is lacking Australia's aged care sector, and it has been lacking for decades. The evidence before the Royal Commission is clear that there is a link between substandard care and staffing levels. People are coming into residential aged care older and sicker. They are frail with comorbidities requiring more care, not less care, and certainly not cut price care. The type of care requiring has or the type of care required has changed markedly, but it has unfortunately coincided with lower staffing levels and the de-skilling of the aged care workforce. The result is that the care for our elderly in residential aged care that was once being performed by qualified nurses and physiotherapists is now often being performed by unqualified, unregistered and, in a lot of cases, untrained personal care workers. The damning evidence of geriatric medicine expert Professor Cathy Eager at the Royal Commission 
is that some aged care providers have deliberately reduced their ability to cater for the clinical and health needs of residents in their care by replacing qualified nurses with, with minimally qualified personal care workers at the very time that the clinical and health needs of residents is increasing. The evidence before the Royal Commission is that the reduction in health care professionals within the residential aged care area is largely an economic one. The government has allowed this to happen to the detriment of our senior Australians in care. The vital role of nurses, especially registered nurses, has been downplayed and diminished for too long, and this gross error must be corrected. The lack of regulatory control over staffing and training, for which responsibility falls exclusively with the federal government, coupled with a profit model for many operators has failed elderly Australians and very much needs urgent fixing. Here is what needs to change, and I quote from Peter Rosen, QC. Firstly, an approved provider should have to meet mandatory minimum staffing requirements. Registered nurses, including nurse practitioners, should make up a greater proportion of the care workforce. All aged care workers should receive better training Unregulated care workers should be subject to a registration process with a minimum mandatory qualification as an entry requirement. The care workforce should be better remunerated and should work in safe workplaces. The organisations for which they work should be better managed and better governed. And finally, the Australian government should provide practical leadership in relation to all of these things. End of quote. Government needs to listen. It needs to act on this advice and not continue to kick the can down the road. Peter Rosen QC also said that the time for real action on staffing numbers and mix, skill levels, remuneration, conditions of work and registration of the unregulated portion of the aged care workforce is now. The time is well and truly now, and this government needs to act effectively. Thank you, Senator. Senator Scar. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise this evening to reflect on recent developments in the case of James Cook University and Professor Peter Ridd. It gives me no pleasure to do so especially because James Cook University is an extremely important institution in my home state of Queensland. As my friend Senator James McGrath will be well aware, over many years JCU has educated thousands of students and has been a focal point for research connected with the tropics, including tropical diseases in the Great Barrier Reef. Professor Peter Ridd was employed by JCU for 27 years. From 2009 to 2016, Professor Reid was head of physics. He also managed JCU's marine geophysical laboratory for 15 years. Professor Reid has an interest in claims relating to the health of the Great Barrier Reef and, more generally, the quality of scientific research. These are matters of great concern to many Australians. Professor Reid's employment with JCU was terminated on 2 May 2018 for alleged serious misconduct. The university found that Professor Ridd had expressed a professional opinion in a manner inconsistent with the obligations contained in JCU's Code of Conduct. This included by failing to act in a, and I quote, collegial and academic spirit, close quote. JCU also claimed that Professor Ridd had denigrated the university also in a manner inconsistent with his obligations under the Code of Conduct. These findings arose out of an email Professor Ridd sent to a journalist in relation to reports produced by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and the ARC Centre of Excellence in Coral Reef Studies. Professor Ridd suggested a line of questioning for the journalist to use with the authors of the reports. Unfortunately for Professor Ridd, the journalist simply forwarded Professor Ridd's email to the relevant authors of the reports. This was extremely unfortunate. 
Subsequently, Professor Reid did an interview on Sky with Mr Alan Jones and Ms Peter Credlin in relation to an article he wrote on the Great Barrier Reef. Professor, Professor Reid brought a claim that actions taken by JCU were unlawful because they were in breach of a clause in the Enterprise Agreement which provided that JCU is committed to act in a manner consistent with the protection and promotion of intellectual freedom. Professor Reid was successful at trial. JCU appealed, and then on 22 July 2020, barely a month ago, the federal court by a majority of two to one upheld the appeal and found in favour of James Cook University. It appears that there may now be an appeal by Professor Ridd to the High Court. Prior to making my comments, Acting Deputy President, I'd like to make a number of preliminary uh, notes. First, I respect the judgments of both levels of the federal court. The judgments are limited to the interpretation of the enterprise agreement and the code of conduct. They should not be interpreted any wider. My concern does not lie with the legal interpretation, but with the culture of our universities. Second, I do not wish my comments to be a general reflection on JCU, on its staff, on its history, on its heritage and of much of the great work it does. The great irony of this case, in my view, is that JCU accused Professor Peter Ridd of denigrating the university, but JCU's management of this specific case has caused great damage to the university's own reputation. Not to understate the matter, I was quite shocked when I read sections of the appeal judgment. Let me give you three examples. What are we to make of a university which prohibits an employee from telling his wife that he has been the subject of disciplinary proceedings? prohibits him from telling his wife that the university has brought disciplinary proceedings against him. Can you believe such a thing occurred? That is what JCU did in an email to Peter Reid on 27 August 2017. Subsequently, he was given permission to do so on 19 September 2017. How gracious of JCU that their employee of 27 years standing should have the right to tell his own wife that disciplinary proceedings had been brought against him. What are we to make of a university which trawls through an employee's emails looking for material to bring further claims against an employee and then uses against the employee private emails where the employee is communicating with those sympathetic to his cause? Let me give you an example. A student, a fan of Professor Peter Ridd, said, Hi Peter, hope this isn't too personal, but there are more than a few of us seriously upset about this. And the email goes on. Are they really going to fire you for this? It's absolutely outrageous. Dr Peter Reid responds to the student. I greatly appreciate your concern. Needless to say, I've certainly offended some sensitive but powerful and ruthless egos. The student responds. We are angered because, one, we are always told to always think critically, but when a professor does it, all hell breaks loose. And so the email goes on. This email was actually used by JCU in its disciplinary proceedings against Professor Reid. A private email between the professor and one of his students who was seeking to give him comfort with respect to the disciplinary proceedings. An absolute outrage. And perhaps the best example of all. The best example of all is the direction which the university gave with respect to how Professor Reid should characterise the proceedings. What are we to make, Madam Acting Deputy President, of a university that issues a direction to an employee subject to disciplinary proceedings that the employee is not to do anything that parodies, parodies the university taking action against him? This is referred to by the judges as the no satire direction. When Professor Reid forwards an article to a student in the Australian newspaper simply titled For Amusement, again a private email, the university raises this against him as a breach of the so-called no satire direction. You could not make this stuff up. It is the perfect satire. Not even my 
My great hero, the great French satirist Voltaire, could come up with a better parody. And JCU brought this claim to avoid its reputation being damaged? The irony. It is little wonder that in their judgment on appeal, the majority said, and I quote from the appeal judgment, JCU's maintenance of disciplinary action in several instances of what can only be regarded as trivial breaches of the code of conduct did not reflect the highest standards of ethical conduct, nor did JCU's conduct in searching Professor Ridd's email account. The unethical approach to the matter was compounded by the direction of Professor Reid that he was not to speak to his wife about the disciplinary matter, albeit that direction was revoked. JCU did not exhibit contrition. Its attitude and that of senior management was quite to the contrary." End quote. I say to the leadership of JCU involved in these matters, is your code of conduct so draconian that a distinguished academic of the university cannot express his views when he sees something that he honestly believes is wrong? Are your disciplinary standards so weak that they cannot withstand public scrutiny or satire? Do you not recognise how outrageous it is to prohibit an employee from speaking to their spouse about disciplinary proceedings being brought against them? Was there no other way you could have dealt with this situation other than terminating the employment of an employee of 27 years standing at a cost of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees? Do you not realise it was wrong, wrong, to trawl through an employee's private emails on a fishing expedition to find ways to buttress your case, and then to use the content of private emails between the employee and his supporters against him? Do you not see the senior leadership of JCU? Do you not see how, through your own actions in relation to this case involving Professor Reid, that you have denigrated the reputation of JCU to a far greater extent than Professor Reid ever could have? And that, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the great irony of this case. Thank you, Senator. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Tonight I rise to speak about an issue at the very centre of the governance of our country, Prime Minister Morrison's so-called National Cabinet. National Cabinet has been widely regarded as a success in bringing together Commonwealth, state and territory governments in a national response to COVID-19. Some of the gloss of that success may have come off with differences over state border closures and blame games over quarantine breakdowns and the mismanagement of the COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care facilities. The cohesion of National Cabinet is likely to be further tested in the months to come as the discussion increasingly focuses on very challenging financial problems. The issue I want to address tonight, however, is not the performance of the National Cabinet but rather its corruption of a well-established cabinet convention, its lack of legal foundation and threat to transparency and accountability. National cabinet is indeed a legal sham. It rides roughshod over long-established cabinet practices and conventions and potentially creates a precedence for future governments to sub subvert the foundations of responsible government. For those reasons, I have initiated what is a first-of-a-kind legal challenge to the PM's authority to unilaterally determine cabinet practice and processes as he wishes. This is not the first time a crisis has generated changes in federal-state relationships and interaction. The, the National Cabinet is not uh, in the, uh, its innovation is not in bringing together the Prime Minister and Premiers and Chief Ministers in streamlined meetings free from the bu bureaucracy that had built up around the COAG processes. That could have been achieved simply by removing the crowds of bureaucrats cluttering COAG meetings. Rather, the novelty of the National Cabinet is the PM's deeming that this new body is part of the Federal Cabinet, protected by absolute Cabinet confidentiality and Commonwealth secrecy laws. And that secrecy has been extended to other bodies and organisations that are reportedly directed by and report to National Cabinet, including the HPCC, the Australian Health Protection Principles uh, Committee, the National COVID Advisory Commission 
and following the abolition of COAG, a host of new, uh, old and new intergovernmental bodies, ministerial councils and other advisory bodies. At the stroke of the PM's pen and with the com complicity of state and territory leaders, federal cabinet secrecy has been massively expanded within the Commonwealth Government and across the great expanse of intergovernmental activity. This has serious consequences for accountable uh, ministerial government at all levels of, of the Federation. This new structure is already being used to obstruct examination of the federal government's co uh, COVID response by parliamentary committees and through freedom of information. It is likely to be used by state governments to avoid accountability as well. This is a serious threat to responsible government and will not go unchallenged. As I have mentioned, I have uh, commenced a legal test case to expose the arbitrary nature of National Cabinet and its lack of sound foundations. The Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has rejected my FOI application for the minutes of National Cabinet's first meeting and other information relating to its rules and procedures. The Department has claimed that the records of National Cabinet are exempt from FOI because they are, quote, official records of Cabinet. I have appealed that decision to the Information Commissioner. Now, Cabinet is not mentioned in the Constitution. Its legislative recognition is limited to the FOI Act and the National Archives Act. Cabinet exists and operates in accordance with political uh, precedence and practice. Some of that precedence and practice is laid out in the Cabinet Handbook, a book that came into, exi into existence in 1926, held as secret, declassified in 1982 and published by the government in 1984. However, while cabinet practices have evolved over decades, some things are clear. And this goes to the heart of my legal cha challenge. The National Cabinet is constituted as a Cabinet Office Policy Committee of the Commonwealth Cabinet, of which the PM is the only permanent member. A cabinet, or even a subcommittee of cabinet, is properly a single cabinet of ministers exercising collective responsibility, not a single minister, not even a prime minister. The PM alone is not a cabinet. Federal cabinet is a collective gathering of ministers of state who, according to our constitution, must be members of the federal parliament. If it were accepted that the National Cabinet is part of the Federal Cabinet, then any meeting between the PM and other persons, including his gardener, could be designated as a Cabinet meeting and subject to Cabinet secrecy. The National Cabinet is not a Cabinet also because it is not constituted by members of government responsible to one parliament. Rather, it is character better characterised as an intergovernmental body. Cabinet is not a meeting of prime ministers and premiers, and cabinet is certainly not a meeting of doctors. A meeting of the AHPPC is not a meeting of cabinet, as has been claimed in answers to questions on notice. Furthermore, the decisions by the executive to establish a national cabinet, which will ultimately replace COAG, creates a confidentiality span so broad that it intrudes on the rights created by statute, including in the FOI Act, and additionally interferes with the accountability of government that is the very essence of responsible government. Commands by the executive cannot interfere with commands of this parliament, and that will be tested. One might ask, why did the Prime Minister establish national ca uh, the Cabinet as he has? After all, COAG discussions have long been conducted in the, uh, uh, in the basis of intergovernmental uh, confidentiality that is effectively recognised in FOI and at the federal, uh, state and territory levels. The answer lies in the fact that the federal FOI allows for the application of what's called a public interest test for claims. Uh, to claims of exemptions on grounds of potential damage to Commonwealth state relations. So you can overcome exemptions by arguing public interest.
but no such public interest test applies to cabinet in confidence, confidence secrecy claims. The core purpose of the way in which the PM constructed National Cabinet, cabinet is to extend cabinet secrecy. It is a wholly artificial construct, a most serious corruption of cabinet government designed with the intention of reducing transparency and accountability across a huge swath of public policy and administration. We'll have to see where my legal challenge goes. Meanwhile, it would be timely for the parliament to consider whether it's necessary to enact legislation to define the basic elements of cabinet structures and processes. This is, after all, the, se the central part of responsible government in Australia, and yet for 120 years it has no statutory foundation. The PM is effect now effectively claiming that Cabinet is whatever he wants it to be. We, the Parliament, need to ask ourselves whether that is a credible or responsible claim. And to that end, I will shortly introduce a private senator's bill, a Ministers of State, Cabinet membership and other arrangements bill that will seek for the first time to establish a statutory basis for Cabinet. The Prime Minister's role as the chairperson of the body, its membership, uh, subcommittee and other matter, matters including the basis and the extent of Cabinet confidentiality. This is really important. We cannot have a Prime Minister expanding the conventions of Cabinet to interfere with the commands of the parliament, with the rights given to citizens by the parliament. That is not acceptable. So I invite senators to carefully watch this space. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I wonder whether people know that Liberal, Labor, Nationals, Greens, climate policies and renewable subsidies are costing households $13 billion per year. That's $1,300 per household every year. 39% of electricity bills, household bills, are due to climate policies that have driven $8 billion in private sector malinvestment that is now destroying and destabilizing baseload power. These costs are the work of respected economist, Dr. Alan Moran, who used the government's data and, they, and thus they cannot be sensibly refuted. Energy intensive industries and value adding food processing and minerals processing are moving to countries with cheap energy. China, India and Asia use our high quality clean coal to generate cheap power, while the same power from our clean coal under Australian climate policies has a price three times as high. In China, India, eight cents per, kil per kilowatt hour in Australia, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Australia once had the world's cheapest electricity, yet now prices are among the world's highest. As a result, manufacturing has dropped from 17% of our national economy in the 1980s to now be just 6% and many hundreds of thousands of blue collar jobs have been packed off overseas. As a kid, I went to school in Curry Curry High School. I lived in the bush and cycled to school every day. Every morning we rode past and every afternoon we rode past the Curry Curry aluminium smelter. That was built because of cheap, reliable, stable, secure, environmentally responsible coal-fired power in the Hunter Valley. It's now shut due to climate policies driving power prices to double what they were just 10 years ago. Kaput, gone, and with it hundreds of jobs, thousands of jobs in the community. Climate policies are ravaging agriculture after stealing farmers' rights to use their own land in compliance with the Kyoto Protocol. This is destroying food security and increasing food prices for every Australian. High electricity prices are gutting manufacturing, gutting agriculture, gutting small and large businesses. Our nation's productive capacity, economic sovereignty, economic resilience are being decimated and turning our country from being independent to dependence on other nations. Climate alarmists are pushing policies aimed at fundamentally decarbonising the economy from 2050 onwards. 
Such a radical change with severe consequences on lifestyle and livelihoods and lives should be based on extraordinary evidence. Empirical data from solid measurement and with specified, quantified impacts must first justify such fundamental change. High cost policies, such as the climate policies and renewable subsidies, need solid scientific evidence as justification for the policies whose impacts must be specified before implementation and measured during implementation. Now I'll discuss this next week, but for now I'll discuss the Moran's reports into insights into electricity prices. As I said, the cost of climate policies and renewable subsidies cost Australian households via their electricity bills $13 billion every year. That's $1,300 per household. The government claims it's just $90 per year. Dr. Moran, using the government's own data, calculates the direct costs are $536 per household per year. The total costs are $1,300 per year per household. The additional cost of climate policies on our power bills is a staggering 39%, not the 6.5% as the government claims. The 6.5% covers cost of federal and state mandatory requirements, such as the renewable energy target, and excludes the cost of additional transmission lines, SNOWY2, which is going for about $14 billion now, direct support from federal and state budgets, and the cost of climate policies on coal generation price. The true cost of electricity, Madam Acting Deputy President, would be $13 billion per year less if cheap, affordable, reliable coal production was not lumbered with policies that distort the market toward expensive and unreliable wind and solar. Those wind and solar jobs, wind and solar power destroy jobs, kill productive capacity and wasted investment, as I'll show in a minute. Now I commissioned this report from the respected economist, Dr. Alan Moran, his is the first comprehensive independent analysis of full costs of climate policies on energy. And it's difficult for the layman to find the costs because the government no longer puts this, these costs, this data out in a consolidated form. But Moran uses the government's own data and thus his report cannot be sensibly refuted. He's also been conservative to ensure credibility. And the government has stopped releasing it in comprehensive form because it's hiding what the policy is doing to everyday Australians and our nation, high costs and future unreliability, incrementally and deceitfully deliberately hiding these rising costs. Artificial high co electricity and energy prices savage our, high our living standards and undermine our economic resilience and competitiveness. And this is particularly na important now with COVID recovery. Humans in the civilized world, the Western world, the developed world have become independent of climate, independent of wind, independent of the sun. We now don't have the famines we used to have. And all of a sudden now we're going back to being dependent on climate, dependent on weather, dependent on wind and solar, at a cost to taxpayers of $8 billion per year in private investment. And that's still going on after two, year, two decades, they're still continuing to receive subsidies. These parasitic infants will never develop. It's impossible, and I'll explain why in a minute. But the renewables distort the low-cost coal-based power and more than double, more than double the wholesale electricity price from $45.50 to $92.50, and we're all paying for it. And after 20 years, renewables remain unviable without subsidies and are a parasitic investment, a malinvestment on our energy systems. For every subsidized green energy job, so-called green energy job, there are 2.2 to three jobs that could have been created elsewhere in the economy with the same subsidy or investment. And they're lost in the economy. Intermittent energies like wind and solar are parasitic and they're killing their host just like parasites do. And their host is the people of Australia and Australia itself. The issue beyond that though, is integrity, the lack of integrity, and governance that has stopped serving the people and is milking the people for its mates, investing in so-called renewable energy. There's been a study in Australia called the Fisher Study, and it estimated the costs and the impacts of Labor's 50% renewable energy target policy. 
They estimate it will lose Australian income of $1.2 trillion in the 10 years to 2030. That's more than half this year's gross domestic product. We're working for half the year to blow it all in the next 10 years. It will require, Labor's policy will drive and require an electricity price of $157 per megawatt hour. That's more than double what it was in 2016 before COVID hit and reduced prices. COVID reduced prices. So this will double what it was before COVID. Plus, and this is something very important for Labor to understand, its policies will cut wages 23% below what they would have been and there will be 568,000 fewer jobs. The biggest falls in employment will be in coal, oil and gas, and in energy intensive industries. And as for the Liberals, they would increase intermittence 40% above the current intermittent level to about 28%. That would be devastating. One Nation alone says zero intermittence, no subsidies, get back to basics. So green energy, is no more likely to create additional employment and income levels than it would be if workers with shovels and wheelbarrows replaced workers with heavy machinery and trucks and road building. Productivity is what enables higher wages and more jobs. It's easy to understand. It takes 39 solar workers in the United States to produce the same electricity as one natural gas worker. Choosing to employ 39 people to do what one person can do means 38 people cannot help elsewhere in the economy, providing elderly care, education, better infrastructure, and thousands of other jobs and services. It cuts solar and wind, cut investment in real economy because their investments in wind and solar are wasted in tax and reduced spending. It destroys our competitiveness in the future. And it's not happening in China, India, Indonesia, and growing economies which account for the vast majority of the carbon dioxide production. What we need to do then, Madam Acting Deputy President, is end all regulations and policies, including subsidies that uniquely reward renewable energy. Remove weather dependency, a key achievement for the last 170 years that is now reversed. We need to get back to being independent of wind and solar, weather. And above all, we need to be honest and to make policies based on facts and to share the data. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise in this adjournment debate to raise concerns about the scope of the restrictions being imposed on Victorians under the state of emergency declared in March. Victorians understand that we need to be in this together, that to get through this pandemic, we need to work together and care for each other and do everything possible to combat this second wave and suppress the alarmingly high rates of community transmission that we have seen in recent weeks. We have seen the number of new daily active cases drop, and that is encouraging. But I think it's well understood that the Victorian government's management of hotel quarantine has been nothing short of a disaster. The evidence is that almost every active case in this second wave has emanated from the breakdown in hotel quarantine. I remain bitterly disappointed that Premier Daniel Andrews told a parliamentary inquiry that the ADF never offered to support Victoria with hotel quarantine, which of course we learned was simply not true. There's never been an adequate explanation as to why Victoria accepted and then rejected help from the ADF, which could have made the difference in stopping this second wave. But just as big an issue, and perhaps even more serious, is the failure of contact tracing. Unlike New South Wales, where the contacts of every active case are vigorously pursued and required to self-isolate so as to suppress community transmission, in Victoria we have seen thousands of mystery cases where there is no known source and which means the source of the virus can't be identified and isolated to stop further spread. People who should have self-isolated were told they could go into the community. There's been no publication of COVID-19 hotspots which has now just been remedied, and people in isolation, including those who were positive, were told for many weeks they could leave home to exercise. That too has been remedied. I spent 27 days in quarantine all up as a result of coming into close contact with a positive case and then needing to quarantine to come to Canberra. I saw firsthand the, confusion, the confusing messaging, the muck up with the IT systems, and the failure to alert a local community where the positive where the person who was positive had visited. 
Our government has proudly demonstrated we have your back, the back of Australians, with our unprecedented health response and more than $300 billion we have delivered in economic support. The states and territories have also pulled their weight, but as the Governor of the Reserve Bank said last week, states and territories need to invest at least another $40 billion in infrastructure in order to reinvigorate their economies. I am deeply saddened by the loss of life in aged care in Victoria, and despite the Labor Party's best efforts to improperly attribute blame to our government, these are deaths of the most vulnerable in our community, which have been caused principally because of the very high rates of community transmission, mainly across metropolitan Melbourne. Today, I have spoken out about another issue that is causing deep concern, the Victorian government's use of emergency powers and whether they have been exercised properly in every respect. We have seen the outrage which has erupted in Victoria over plans to extend the state of emergency powers by another 12 months. The Public Health and Wellbeing Act provides that the maximum period for which a state of emergency can be declared is six months. The Victorian Premier is now proposing to extend that period, which runs out on the 13th of September, for another 12 months. The notion that the Premier can place the state in a state of emergency for a total of 18 months, during which time he can essentially impose any restrictions, is extremely concerning, particularly when you consider the draconian nature of some of the directions, the 8 p.m. curfew, the prohibitions on travelling more than five kilometres from home, the shutdown of businesses and work sites, which in this second wave will cost the Australian economy another $10 to $12 billion and up to another 400 lost jobs in Victoria. I am deeply concerned that many Victorian residents and businesses have suffered loss as a result of, of unreasonable restrictions, that is, the improper exercise of emergency powers. Section 204 of the Public Health and Wellbeing Act provides that any person who suffers loss as a result of a decision by the Chief Health Officer under his emergency powers can apply for compensation if a person considers there were insufficient grounds for a particular decision. Restrictions should only be imposed insofar as they are absolutely necessary. It's so important to open up the economy in Victoria as much as is possible. Many important questions remain unanswered. Why is a private contractor prohibited from mowing lawns but such work is permitted by a council worker? Why can building and construction workers move freely between places of work but not people working in other occupations? What is the public health rationale for imposing an 8pm curfew across Melbourne or harsh restrictions in regional communities where no active cases exist? Section 204 provides an incredibly powerful remedy. It gives every Victorian who has suffered loss the right to hold the chief health officer to account. All that is required is an application to the Secretary of the Department of Health, not court action. If the Secretary agrees there are insufficient grounds for a particular restriction, she must pay just and reasonable compensation and has 28 days to reach a decision. Importantly, her decision can be appealed, can be appealed in the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, which is a relatively inexpensive legal avenue of redress. As broadcast on the Nine Network earlier tonight, Jim's Mowing has vowed to rely on this section of the Act to seek compensation, not just for his franchisees but for other, other contractors. That's because his private gardeners in Melbourne are prohibited from working and yet council gardeners are permitted to work. The question the Secretary of the Health Department needs to consider is whether there are insufficient grounds for this decision. Jim Penman, who owns uh, Jim's Mowing, says these laws are arbitrary and have no legitimacy. This provision of the Act is, I understand, yet to be tested, and this is a very important test of the accountability of this government. Madam Acting Deputy President, just hours after I raised my concerns on Nine News, I received messages from a number of business owners which are suffering, who are suffering badly despite the economic support our government is providing, uh, including this message from Georgie. 
She writes, it has been extraordinarily difficult to have our arboriculture business closed by the Victorian Premier, whilst we have many of our clients in four councils calling us, stating that council contractors are happily pruning and maintaining council parks, trees and gardens, whilst ratepayers suffer and their trees desperately requiring routine pruning, which can only be done at this time of year and, of course, which cannot be done. We just hope and pray we can reopen our doors and stay in business after this catastrophe is finally over. Thank you again for being our voice. For people living in regional Victoria, including in border communities who have been hit hard, for families who can't cross the border and get their children to school, for people with cancer who can't travel to medical appointments, for farmers who can't travel freely, including to move machinery or feed their stock, uh, despite the work we have done to introduce a code of practice for the agricultural sector. This provision of the Victorian Public Health and Wellbeing Act may provide additional support. It may also provide a much needed fetter on the exercise of arbitrary powers by reinforcing the requirement on the Victorian Chief Health Officer that he must properly impose restrictions and only those which are necessary to combat this pandemic and nothing more. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.